Всем доброе утро. Доброе утро, уважаемые участники. Сегодня у нас... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's October the 9th, the third day of our international conference devoted to brain-computer interface, uh, scientific and practical features. And we have an extensive program this morning for you. We, at our conference, uh, will have a day of practical uh sessions and we are going to start this practical day with a presentation by olga bazanova she's going to give us a review uh of international consensus on the reporting and experimental design of neural feedback studies after that presentation we will continue with uh, maria nazarova uh, talking about navigated and non-navigated TMS diagnostics and therapeutic capabilities in stroke. Again, uh, this is going to be Maria Nazaro from High School of Economics, and we will have an, another workshop later on on IT DSC therapy, possibilities, methodology, limitations of the method uh, presented by Stanislav Fazabedar from Computer May Systema. And at the end of the day, we will have the most interesting panel discussion on neural implants, uh, Neuralink, but not only. To start today's uh, scientific uh, program, let me give you the floor to the representative of uh, Institute of Physiology and Basic Medicine from the city of Novosibirsk. Uh, Olga Bazanova. Olga, uh, you may have the floor. All right, thank you for being with us. I'd like to thank the organizers for this excellent uh, conference. Uh, I'm glad we are able to use uh, internet, internet capabilities and maybe next year we won't have to get uh, together in the offline setting and we'll, it will be enough to turn on our computers and we'll be communicating. And uh, I, I'd like to say that this conference is very well organized and I'd like to thank uh, everyone for inviting me to this highly efficient and informative uh, conference. We uh, had uh, really useful lectures and presentations from real uh, outstanding scientists and researchers, and uh, it will be just as great in the future. And let me start my workshop by introducing its title. To use simple words, it's uh, using neural feedback. If you have any questions about my slides, uh, use uh, uh, your chat or uh, our Q&A link here, or you can ask your questions in both Russian and English. And you can also turn on your mic and ask a question directly. I'm from the city of Novosibirsk. So far, our city has been mentioned only once, even though Academy member Kirchhoff, uh, one of the founders of internet, uh, is uh, from Novosibirsk. Uh, Ms. Dr. Guger uh, did mention that we will have this hackathon in Novosibirsk. Uh, tomorrow, most of our IT uh, experts uh, graduated the same Novosibirsk uh, State University. I'm an expert in physiology by my background. I'm going to talk about physiological and neuro uh, physiological aspects of uh, neuro control or BCI. There are many synonyms. Uh, meaning the same thing, neurofeedback is to change different functions, but BCI is how you control uh, those functions. Uh, I represent this specific institute, which is uh, called State Research Institute of Physiology and Fundamental Medicine, one of the leading uh, 
institutions like that, not just in the country, but all over the world, we study that uh, gap in uh, psychology. It's not so much uh, cognitive uh, psychology, but it's more about emotions and uh, psychological well-being. We uh, look at the problems of depression, and I heard uh, one of the presentations yesterday, and there were questions about 2030, uh, when uh, depression will be the most uh, common disease of the century. And Novosibirsk is actually the only city in Russia which is part of this Enigma uh, project. Again, the official title of my presentation is shown in the slide. Uh, um, and I'm not really talking about requirements, but more of uh, factors that impact the efficiency of uh, BCI and neuro control and neuro feedback. And based on these uh, publications, a consensus was reached on how you're supposed to report the results and publish your articles and it contains recommendations to increase your efficiency because the efficiency of your neuro feedback is uh, hardly reaching 70% uh, in only uh, some types of this feedback you get 100% efficiency but it's basically MEG biocontrol it's not neural feedback per se. The main goal here is to focus on the unique aspects of neural feedback to get to this consensus and what we really need to pay attention to. And I like to recommend certain designs and requirements for your feedback that would eventually improve the efficiency of your outcomes. This is the uh, overall uh, design offered in that article that I co-authored with uh, Drs. Lebedev and Asachi. Um, it, it, there's a total of 52 co-authors of that article uh, so we did play uh, our small role in uh, putting it together. And these are the factors of the total effect of uh, BCI. Except uh, for one word, voluntary. All these uh, maps are similar. This is something, uh, the, there are specific, non-specific, uh, uh, factors for neural feedback, and here you need a reference group. You have uh, general non-specific factors, those that have to do with repetition, and natural factors. What do we mean by natural here? These are the factors that originally, in the natural way, impact the efficiency of our neural feedback. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on these uh, factors, personal features, and our EEG patterns. It's obvious that any impact can be assessed uh, whether they happened or not. When we have a pre-registration of a certain status that uh, that you have before your neurofeedback, NFT stands for neurofeedback training when you register the initial and the end status of your process, that's uh, obviously necessary. There's an uh, overview of uh, Kadesh from London devoted to the so-called medium predictors or moderate predictors of, of NFT success. And of course, it's like everywhere, it's attention, motivation, and your mood. Even though the same 
Dr. Kadosh says that some participants never learn to control their brain. And I would, of course, argue with that, but it's well known almost all psychological features are reflected in a number of uh, physiological properties. And sometimes your physiological properties, since I'm a physiology expert, are the foundation of some of our psychological uh, traits. And this is how biocontrol is organized using these um, voluntary modifications of those physiological properties. Let me uh, speak in greater details about alpha neurofeedback. And here is one of the properties that can be successfully trained. This is so-called individual uh, EEG power in the alpha band. When I talk about endophenotype, it, it is something related to genes and something that impacts our behavior in the final analysis. Our lab used to be called Cognitive Efficient Translational Neuroscience. The, this is the individual frequency of your alpha peak, gives you the value which is, uh, can be determined genetically, the reduction of the uh, frequency, uh, you get the decrease in tension, and then you get the increase of uh, the power in such states as negative emotions, tension, trance, and you get the increase of the uh, frequency when it moves to the right, it's linked to its motivation, positive emotions, and self-control. And there's this special uh, training type, SMR training, which was mentioned by some of the previous speakers. Uh, why do I say that your individual alpha peak uh, uh, purity can be called uh, phenotype? You, in thalamic neurons, you generate alpha waves that are unique compared to, to all other neurons because the uh, purity of uh, currents there is self-regulating. That's why they're called peacemakers and their composition is based on building neural ensembles or uh, cores and would uh, give us the frequency that would be dominating in the EEG and also in our brain. This is the feedback control mechanism and it was uh, noted by Konstantin Anokhin yesterday that there is this Russian idea that would, would be promoting our Russian neuroscience and would give us some um, uh, push forward. And this feedback idea uh, originated in the research institute uh, named after Dr. Anokhin and, and Mikhail Ivanov also mentioned the same. When we have this thalamic neurons, they consist of two membranes. And there's this feedback mechanism allowing us to control this calcium uh, current in some of the calcium channels. That's why we have this uh, specific oscillations uh, but alpha uh, waves uh, is not the main topic of my presentation, uh, but how could they check that it was genetically determined? They took some uh, mice with uh, modified DNA. Uh, you get DNA from one mice, and it was uh, embedded into the pronucleus of a male. Uh, organism and you get a new DNA with new genes and this gene engineering uh, works so that got their authors the Nobel Prize uh, uh, first started by Academy member Knorr. So basically this is you know, modification when we use 
scissors or to cut out a piece of the DNA, then to introduce a new piece of the DNA into a new organism to see what's going to happen. And as you can see on the right, there is a monument uh, to an experimental mouse in Novosibirsk, and the mouse is knitting recombinant DNA. So let's go back to our electric oscillations. It turned out that if we remove one subunit in these calcium channels, then the refraction, which used to be 100 milliseconds, will disappear and uh, a mouse will die from overexcitation. So the frequency of alpha peak of alpha peaks depends on metabolic processes, but it is also a structural, genetically determined characteristic, uh, uh, which is intrinsically a part of the uh, and uh, of in the time. And you know when we use calcium channel. But since we can even treat Alzheimer, of course, not 100%, but again, we can do that. So the more active calcium channels are, the higher is uh, the frequency of the current, the more spindles we get, and so uh, we get more bursting and so we will have a shorter refractory period and therefore we will have the higher frequency of alpha peaks so people can be split into two large groups when it comes to our um, to their alpha peak frequencies and when we do that we can see that people who demonstrate lower alpha peak frequency will also have will also be less successful academically and if the alpha peak frequency higher they will achieve more in academia. This is the research that was carried out before back in 1994. The research has shown that nonverbal creativity, let's say in people with all low alpha peak frequency, will use a different uh, strategy, they will perform tasks slower and so on. So again, um, cognitive strategies and um, the speed of uh, thinking are directly correlated with alpha peak frequency. And we can see that subjects with different alpha peak frequency in while well, resting were also different when it came to musical training. Again, higher alpha peak frequency demonstrated faster learning abilities. But when it comes to self reliance, then we can see that it is higher in people with low alpha peak frequency. So the cognitive abilities increase with age, but after 40 years of age, it starts decreasing in men. A lot of this is, of course, related so, to a hormonal scale. When progesterone is high, you know, when progesterone levels are on the rise and uh, estrogen is on the rise, so then we also know the rise in the alpha peak frequency. So the higher is the estrogen level, the lower is the alpha peak frequency. The, uh, and if you look at women as compared to men, so the alpha peak frequency is lower in women at certain phases, therefore the IQ will be lower because it is directly related to estro estrogen levels. But if you look at the lutein phase, then the alpha peak frequency increases and therefore the IQ goes up as well. So it is a bit of a funny correlation, but it still remains a fact. The alpha peak frequency determines how teachable someone is, also determines somebody's learning ability. Therefore, this is sham biofeedback. And sham biofeedback 
shows us that if we do not have feedback, then the efficiency of training goes up compared to two different phases during menstrual phase, premenstrual phase, the efficiency is at the lowest, and during the lutein phase, the efficiency is at the highest. But if we look at the effectiveness of biofeedback training, then of course it will also vary depending on the hormonal state. So we tried to start the training during the effective hormonal phase. And then again, we see that so the effectiveness goes down in the placebo control group and it remains low in the menstrual and premenstrual phase. But women who started uh, receiving training during the luteal phase using a bio feedback, the effectiveness goes low, uh, goes down initially and then it starts increasing again. So the alpha peak frequency is a predictor of um, learning aptitude, but it is also a predictor of uh, psychiatric conditions. So here we look at uh, neurogenic pain and as you can see, alpha peak frequency is decreased. But the amplitude of alpha waves is on the rise when compared is on the rise when compared to healthy population. So if we administer training to children with ADHD, then the frequency of our individual alpha peaks will be lower compared to a healthy cohort. And again, if we look at individual frequency in standard uh, ranges, then again we would encounter quite a lot of difficulties. If we have low alpha peak frequency, let's say nine, then beta will start at 11 Hertz. But if we have high alpha peak frequency, then we will see beta waves at 13 uh, Hertz. And theta, depending on uh, the uh, width of the range, will also shift to the right. So if we do not account for this frequency, then it would lead to a, a certain effect which had been discovered by uh, Berger. So what is an alpha rhythm according to Berger? Well, he says uh, that he said that the highest Amplitudes of our posterior regions in waves uh, with a frequency of either 8 or 12 uh, hertz range will be higher. So basically, the spindle like oscillations in electric potential will show us a larger peak when performing an open ice test. So if the waves change in alpha one range, then we witness certain psychological effects. But if it happens in the alpha two range, then that will be something related to training and consciousness. So here on the left, we will have some drug induced um, effects or maybe hypnosis induced effects. And on the right, we will have uh, cognitive activation, let's say after a music lesson. So if we look at it a bit closer, and if we try to analyze, uh, let's say, children with ADHD using this methodology, then we will see that they have quite a wide alpha range, which is also quite lower compared to their theta. But here on the bottom, we see that also uh, becomes a larger range when it is lower. So in Novosibirsk, we've been making a software which allows us to administer theta beta training. So we are trying to decrease theta waves and increase beta waves. We do these training sessions with children. So if we decrease theta wage, we go down to four to eight hertz. Uh, but what does it mean uh, going down from four to eight 
hurt. We are not just going to decrease individual alpha peak frequency, but we will force a decrease in alpha peak frequency and we will create forced tension conditions. Kaiser, David Kaiser wrote about it in, back well, 10 years back. Basically, we will create a worsening of conditions and not an improvement. So basically, all of the characteristics will suffer. The alpha peak frequency will go down, the width of the range will go down. And if you look at all of the standard ranges, so what I'm trying to say here is that if you look at the standard ranges, we have to think really long and hard before we provide a biofeedback. So once we have adjusted it in, uh, for this boy, and once we used individual ranges, you see that everything happened the way it was supposed to. And so the, uh, we managed to produce uh, wider ranges, higher peaks, and so on. What else can be done? As you look at this, these are so-called ergonomic issues or general non-specific issues. What are these issues? So there are compression or contact stress, awkward postures, forceful exertions, insufficient rest breaks. So you see the list of these factors on the screen and let me um, go into them one by one. So let's uh, talk about compression or contact stress or forceful exertions. What is uh, excessive uh, stress? Well, we'll say a musician is nervous before the performance. What happens? A person would clench their fist. So the minute the fists are clenched, a person won't be able to control finer finger movements. So the alpha peaks will go down and a person will become very anxious about their performance. This is a fact that is widely, widely known. So the amplitude of the alpha waves decreases when MG muscle tone of the scalp increases. So, uh, Scalp EMG measurement itself could reflect the muscle activity involved in psychomotional tension or mental stress. So if we control the frontal lobe activity, we will be able to decrease uh, psychological and emotional tension. There are even um, certain training sessions that address tension, headaches, and... Uh, they decrease excessive muscle tension. Again, here you have uh, high tonicity, and high tonicity means low alpha waves and increased EMG readings. Well, it turned out that EMG reading was obtained from the areas that are responsible for cognitive abilities, F1P, F2P, and F3 and then uh, F4 pl placed on the forehead. So this is the area of uh, the mimetic muscles of the forehead. And it turned out that it was coherent to the muscles which tense up during stress. And it is also a coherence with the muscles of the forearm which move the finger. But what's even more interesting is that is also coherent to ranges below 10 hertz and over 10 hertz. And that is something that I used to be very skeptical about, especially if we look at beta results or if we consider beta training. So if I talk about our children with ADHD, it shows us that if uh, people, if our kids strain their uh, forehead, they increase beta waves and they get the uh, biofeedback. What well, do you think this training would be effective? Well, to put it in other words, um, alpha EG registered every 100 uh, milliseconds you is directly shows 
inverse proportion to the EMG reading, both on the foreheads and in the forearm. So put it differently, if we want to train alpha waves, we need to disregard the locations which also train EMG. Usually we look at uh, raw EMG or integral EMG, according to Mrs. Asache and Lebedev. So what do we do in this regard? We set a certain mean threshold, which is usually equal to the mean alpha wave power, and we also set a certain EMG threshold for the forehead. Then, during a training session, we register alpha peaks above or below the thresholds, and if it is above the thresholds, uh, a sound alarm or a feedback alarm hmm, comes online, and once both thresholds are exceeded, like I said, the sound feedback occurs, but if EMG goes up, the sound feedback does not occur. And only when both thresholds are exceeded, then the sound feedback occurs. So it turned out that when we do this uh, uh, training session that increases alpha, but decreases EMG, we have, uh, we play the sound of applause for musicians and we compare it to the group of uh, pulse uh, biofeedback and that means that we can quantify these successful periods. It turned out that the low frequency bands, you see the white columns on the screen, they are less effective during the first uh, bio control session, um, especially when compared to high frequency bands. But if uh, we do bio control with some um, feedback, then you see that nothing changes here, but on the right, you can see that the low frequency bands increase their uh, efficiency in direct proportion to the number of training sessions performed. So what it tells us is that uh, different EEG factors uh, should be accounted for or taken into account rather before the training. And so uh, we need to correlate them with the frequency of alpha peaks. For those people with a low frequency, uh, self-control or voluntary control training sessions are especially needed. But people with uh, higher peak frequencies, these uh, training could also be useful for them, but they don't really need more than five to seven training sessions. What I'm trying to say is that we always need to be aware of the initial neurophysiological status. So 70% of children with ADHD have increased muscle tension in their forehead, so they have uh, no control over their forehead muscles. When we compare it to different groups of children, some of them received standard pro uh, training protocol, some of them received individual uh, training protocol, and the third group uh, received individual training uh, protocol for theta, beta, but also um, EMG readings, and the fourth group was the uh, control group. So we looked pre-test, during test, a six months post-test. And it turned out that you see the red line. The red line is the parallel by model control that increases uh, theta and beta, and you can see that the reaction time goes down it can only be compared to individual biocontrol. But if you look at individual biocontrol and we see that it can bounce back, well, at least partially. But those children who receive training together with cell training, their control, together with training their forehead muscles, so they show the same reaction time as um, 
they had after buyer control. The same is true about withheld reward. Uh, you remember the famous marshmallow test and uh, children who are able to control their impulse and not take a second candy. Well, we see that their impulse control improved, especially compared to, to the groups with standard by control and mock by control. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have to take into account low amplitude EMG waves when we are talking about bio control and uh, brain computer interface, especially if you're trying uh, to create patterns using scalp EEG uh, readings. Well, cortical EEG readings uh, are quite different in this regard. Yesterday, I was listening to Professor Zasachi and uh, Lebedev. They were talking about inserting a small plates to acquire. Uh, ECOG readings. It was very interesting when they said that they were also registering the gamma waves. In, in other words, there's low amplitude and low frequency uh, manifestations that are even cut uh, in the analysis. They reflect the psycho-emotional tension level. And basically, we need to consider them at all times. When we uh, do the EEG training, we have to consider them to control them, not just uh, to cut the major artifacts, uh, but these really mean uh, low amplitude artifacts that are the expressions of tonic tension of the muscles. As for the posture control, there are a number of uh, articles in, even under Soviet Union, started by Kozlovska. If we uh, bring our body weight onto uh, the front of the feet, uh, we increase alpha to power. These are uh, really interesting articles. We got the confirmation with two groups of uh, aged uh, women. Uh, they needed to train their balance. They used fitness, uh, non-specific exercises, and uh, the other group was using Aikido when you move the body weight onto the front of their feet and the alpha would increase only, alpha got up only with women who got trained in Aikido and the EMG went down for them. And then in the other group, alpha was going down when they got up and the tonic uh, tension would go up. In other words, these women for these women, it's easier to stand and keep their balance. Recently, we got some uh, fresh data that if you train this balance using the specific exercises, the frequency of alpha uh, went up only with those people who were successful during that training, who got more points than those who were unsuccessful. The red line is for uh, the unsuccessful people, I, I'm not showing you the uh, average because I didn't have that many subjects, but you can see when they were unsuccessful, the frequency of alpha peak goes down, and when they were successful in training of postural control, the uh, frequency goes up. In other words, uh, it's better for, human, for humans when they get... Uh, effective during training. Uh, should eyes be open or closed? Uh, in most, this, uh, there are many different opinions here. Uh, mostly, they do training uh, with open eyes. But what do we mean by open eyes? Uh, it's the so-called Berger effect, uh, neuron, neuronal activation, non-specific neuronal activation. We immediately turn it on as a distracting factor when we train some EEG value with open eyes. Berger has shown that uh, with closed eyes, the amplitude of some waves uh, that he called alpha goes down when you open your eyes and then it goes up again as soon as you shut your eyes and you get the time marks of 100 milliseconds at the bottom. It not only goes down, but when you open your eyes, if you imagine opening your eyes, which is actually the basis of, of our entire ideology of BCI and neurofeedback, 
when you imagine opening your eyes, you are almost doing it, but, but kids with attention deficit have poor imagination in that sense. And when you we talk about closed or open eyes, I looked through a lot of articles and I found out that that Tamir is uh, the founder of alpha stimulating biocontrol is, is against or was against open eyes. And if we train alpha increase, we train the decrease of activation. Maybe in some cases it's helpful, but in most cases, this is anti-natural. Uh, the, there's another economic issue is the presence of uh, breaks between the sessions. We used to make this mistake, uh, 20 minutes of uh, uh, neural control session. The person goes to sleep, wakes up in that amount of time, and but David Vernon and uh, his team suggested to run them no longer than three minutes or even two minutes. Immediately, as soon as you get a feedback, and then you ask this person, how did this person reach it? What they were thinking about during that short break? And it turned out that if we, as we move on to non-specific factors, if we give instructions, don't think about anything, it, we end up in a deadlock. Try to think about nothing right now. First of all, you will have this idea in your head. Don't think about anything, don't think about anything. But, but, but there are other uh, techniques here. For example, imagine something nice or pleasant. This is what we usually ask our uh, subjects. But still, uh, point number one is postural control. You move your weight to the front of your, of your feet. And this is a poorly uh, studied area, and this is what we have in our uh, training sessions to try to understand how it's connected with the brain mechanism. Of course, breathing control is also here. We all remember very well how you, uh, when you deliver babies, you give this advice to women, uh, to have this extended expiration and abdominal breathing. And in a non-specific way, it in increases the alpha-2 power. But it doesn't matter much for training. Most importantly is for the person to know that in this state of increased alpha-2 power, they will only get it if they move their weight to the front of their sole or feet or to uh, follow a certain breathing technique uh, or trying to reduce uh, frontal forehead uh, muscle tension and so on. And then we asked our subjects to uh, ask them what kind of strategy they used during training. And in 60%, of cases, they used imagining nice things. You can understand them. It's easy. You go into the chair and imagine you are with a, a plate of soup or bowl of soup or you're doing skiing. Some of them used breathing. A few used uh, relaxation of forehead muscles and, and only a few moved their body weight uh, to the uh, front of their uh, souls and but most efficient one turned out to be the postural one. The number two in terms of efficiency was breathing, and the least efficient was our imagination. Of course, when we imagine something, uh, when, because when we imagine uh, skiing or mountain skiing, uh, immediately after that, you imagine that you fall and it spoils everything. We talk about not just 
biofeedback, you talk about operant conditioning or biofeedback. But in biofeedback, we have this subject uh, students get trained to voluntarily change their functions using or positive strengthening. They are not punished by uh, high current for doing something wrong. In operant conditioning, it's involuntary. So they use both carrots and sticks. And here we get a mouse that would be pressing the liver for food. And in this case, you get a human being who knows how to get his state of optimal functioning, the so-called learners. Here you get manipulation and bad marks, and here you have training and self-regulation. And this is the most important part, how we are different, how biofeedback is different from operant conditioning. BCI cannot be used as uh, something to train uh, voluntary uh, abilities. Everything is involuntary there. And signal processing is the favorite topic of uh, today's uh, conference. And so, but I'll be brief here. The higher discretization, the quicker you're going to be with your feedback signal. And if uh, naturally this, it takes the signal a long time to change. For example, there's uh, CO2 concentration or RR interval. Uh, with a list of uh, what kind of tachycardia you need to have of so many milliseconds. You need to use those signals for the training that uh, uh, are delivered immediately. For your successful biocontrol, you need to be able to change it. We chose EEG, EMG, and st uh, stability-metric uh, parameters, but how quickly a human being needs to be able to receive that signal. I'm, I really enjoyed this uh, uh, article by Leib Defenosachi from High School of Economics, who showed where the latency is minimum, the efficiency goes up much uh, better than an FB mock. And of course, you need to also mention those thresholds that are not considered in some protocols at all. It just says you need to increase it compared with the previous signal. It goes up, and here's your feedback. Uh, not to mention considering it with EMG, but there's a certain uh, threshold. The human being came to you with this particular state, and their threshold is from 15 to 19, and the next day they come and with very low uh, threshold and to uh, build your training program according to the same factors would be wrong. You need to set it before every session. But what should you choose? The average value or below the average or above the average one hundred percent, hundred thirty percent or seventy percent? And when we compared low and high, uh, low and high IIPFs uh, with low frequency, it's uh, more convenient when it's lower than the average because you don't need to learn. But for high frequencies, they always have the efficiency uh, in the beginning. In the beginning, it was higher than for low frequencies and. And uh, we talk about the follow-up group a month after the sessions. There's this variable threshold. The first part of the session of uh, six periods, you run the first period with low threshold, then we increase it, then it goes to the average, and then to 130%. And that would be the most efficient approach. The montage is uh, ama an amazing uh, thing. Some choose bipolar montage. And the amplitude would be lower here than with uh, referential montage or monopolar montage. And 
I, I used to like this uh, American picture. Uh, frequency of waves or amplitude would, of course, be lower than in this uh, top case. But technically, it's more convenient to use uh, monopolar montage like this on the left side than two uh, electrodes. For alpha bio control, it doesn't matter whether you have your reference. But for other low frequency bands, it turns out that it loads depending on the location. We need to understand that very well. This is not MEG low frequency artifacts, not the tonic uh, tension of uh, scalp uh, muscles. It, it can be in the front, uh, in the uh, parietal or occipital areas and so on. And you should always remember the fact the focus is uh, always in the back. And what about the topology? Where do you put this? To the left, to the right. It, but no matter where you put your electrode, if you train alpha increase then after the training, even if you get your F3 electrode, you will get increase of amplitude in P4. So take it easy on the one hand, and you need to remember that we are training not a specific area of uh, the brain or scalp, but we train a function, a function that largely depends on the frequency, not on the amplitude. The, the amplitude is a situational state, frequency is a personal state. Uh, at this, I would like to uh, bring my presentation to, the, to a close and uh, uh, and I invite you to our hackathon. This is our techno park in uh, Novosibirsk. And at the top level here, we are going to, and Christopher Google already invited all of you to take part in that. I will, I will be glad to take your questions. Are you there? Microphone. Distinguished participants, thank you, Olga Mikhailovna, for uh, this really interesting workshops. Dear guests, you can uh, send us your questions in the Q&A section, or you can raise your hand. There's a special button in Zoom, and uh, our presenter will gladly take your question. I don't seem to have any question, but actually I do have a couple of questions, if you allow me. Would you make a kind of a summary, uh, listing all specific and non-specific factors that we need to consider when we register EEG, depending on the tasks that the research has to register the alpha reason to make another summary on what we need to consider as we register EEGs. Let me put my slides back on and I will show you that slide again. Remember, we're talking about specific, non-specific. Yeah. From this consensus, I really enjoyed this work, which I took part in. Specific factors, you are asking about EEG registration about EEG registration. I got a really good advice from Artur uh, Lebedev, a student of Mikhail Ivanov, 
who was my teacher in the EEG area, he said, the more you record, the, the more uh, questionnaires you run, the more psychological features you record, the better. And was something else. Look at the situation and you register your EEG. So when you start EEG acquisition, you need to make sure that you ask your subject to blink, to close their eyes so that you can see alpha band suppression. Once you see the suppression, that means that you are acquiring an EEG signal. Uh, signal. After that, you can use all of the available mechanism, mechanisms such as uh, MATLAB. What's the name of um, the other one? I forgot. Um, so you can use things like MATLAB to remove artifacts. Then you'll be able to remove components that are not related to EEG, such as uh, muscle components, other components, opening or blinking components. The, the most important thing is that you have EEG and not just EMG. That is the most important thing. The rest can be achieved using analysis, and using psychological characteristics prediction. That is why a, num a large number of uh, technical problems during AG acquisition can be addressed just by pressing a button. We are no longer dealing with paper AG acquisition, so it is truly wonderful. But you have to remember that you need video control of your subjects. It is absolutely mandatory for biofeedback. So you need to talk to your subjects throughout the training session, but even during acquisition, you shouldn't leave your subjects alone with the machine. Well, especially because you have dimmed lights, if you leave your subjects alone, they might fall asleep. So when EG acquisition is taking a long time, we can make a lot of discoveries just looking at frequencies, but we have to make sure that our subjects do not take a nap. So you have to be vigilant about that and you have to make sure that you have video control. Of course, there are also general non-specific factors, but here you just have to remember your physiology. So you should make sure that your subjects are not tired, not underslept, they haven't had something funky to eat, and so on and so forth. But again, there are not a lot of publications globally which take into account hormonal influences. So you cannot take men and women and put them in the same group. There are a lot of uh, hormonal influences depending on the menstrual phase. During the follicular phase, the alpha peak peaks goes to nine and during luteal phase, alpha peaks reach 11. So you have to make sure what kind of women you're dealing with. And if uh, a woman is taking oral contraceptives, then that will also 
influence alpha peak frequencies and you have a significant shift. So you have to account for, you know, a natural state of a human being that is your subject. But again, I'm not trying to reinvent the bicycle here. You know that back when we were at university, we were told that we are first and foremost treating a human being. So it also holds true for our area of research. And of course, when we're talking about BMIs, we do have to work with um, mean averages, but in our case, we're talking about individual approach, customized approach. We have to remember that we're dealing with the different people and let's say an elderly woman is different from a young woman. And the same is true for an elderly man who is very different from a young boy. Thank you very much for answering my question in such detail. We have a couple of questions. Natalia, thanks to you for your workshop. And she says, are the training sessions effective when we're dealing with uh, co uh, cognitive impairments? Well, it depends on the type of impairment you're dealing with. If uh, you have a person with uh, dementia, well, that is not an absolute counterindication, but I've never had experience with such subjects, so I cannot share my personal experience with you in this regard. But if you look at literature, they say that there's only one con counterindication for buyer controlled, and that is a lack of cognitive abilities. If the cognitive abilities are weakened, then they can be strengthened. There was um, a presentation from the memory clinic, um, if you remember, where they are dancing with elderly women, singing, drawing, but of course, by control is more effective than just, let's say, drawing or painting. What is your opinion about introducing neurofeedback methodology as part of an educational process, let's say in uh, schools, how will it be effective to increase professional efficiency, focus, concentration, and uh, uh, does it have uh, any sort of prospects if we are looking with consumer grade EEG headsets? It is a very interesting question. I used to work with biofeedback with evoked potentials like peace. 300. What does it mean? It means that the potential has changed in 300 milliseconds. If we take this 300 milliseconds and multiply them by the number of repetitions, then the evoked potentials of training or EP training will need a larger delay for biofeedback as opposed to EMG or alpha band training, because alpha band training can be done in less than one with less than 100 milliseconds delay. Then, of course, P300 is a great modality. I know that Alexander Kaplan uses it in his work as well. So, P300 training shows us good results, but again, it all depends on the state of your subject. What is the initial alpha peak frequency of your subject? A couple of years ago, we witnessed a female subject um, to perform wonderfully and another one was showing very poor performance. And I think it all came down to the fact that initially one subject had higher alpha band frequency, another one lower. You probably remember Yuplinska and Asachi's work that tells us is uh, the longer is the signal delay, the less efficient your training session will be. Well, we have a couple more questions. 
Ruslan asks, is a neurofeedback efficient to treat insomnia? Do you know of work performed by Shabas et al, which showed that neurofeedback is not better than placebo? What do you think about it? Well, you know, there are quite a lot of publications and I do, I am aware of uh, Shabbos and Al, but there was also a publication or research that back in 1975. So it is not effective for the treatment of insomnia. And the reason is because we have been using a standard range. That is the first reason. The second reason is that it is believed that when it comes uh, to alpha peaks, yes, of course, we can shift them to the uh, left. But once we shifted alpha peaks to the left, uh, by mistake, we wanted to shift it to the left. We wanted to train soft control, but we forgot to set an individual range, which is usually set manually. And we shifted alpha peaks to the left and induced a massive headache in our subject, which had shown 17% efficiency before that. But one, but then in this case, we managed to provoke a massive headache. So if we want to train our subject in decreasing alpha peak frequency, which usually happens naturally, then we would run into a huge risk of creating a tension headache in our subject. Thank you very much. There is a question from Alex. Alex is asking, which opportunities uh, do we have to introduce by uh, control for patients in persistent vegetative state or in minimum conscious state. Well, I think the only opportunity we have here is the BCI because these people cannot uh, perform any voluntary functions, so they have um, working E factors, but non working F factors. So here we can only do involuntary training using BCI. That is what Niels Berbaum has been working on. And he managed to bring these patients out of a coma and they were even able to spell notes or messages. There's another question for you, Olga. Has the correlation between synchronization and desynchronization reaction been studied during uh, opening and closing of the uh, eyes, uh, together with effectiveness of uh, alpha band training. Well, thank you very much. All of the questions are very interesting, but this question is extremely pertinent. So should our subjects have their eyes open or closed? So when we train our subjects, so we have desynchronization. So we have a decrease in alpha peaks. So basically what we have is neural activation according to research done by our Australian colleagues. So basically this is neural activation when desynchronization magnitude is very pronounced, when a decrease is sharp. So on the one hand, it is good activation and it is good for initial training sessions. But on the other hand, once we move into automatic actions, then activation reaction becomes weaker, and it doesn't matter if our subjects has their eyes open or closed, they can enter these states instantaneously. So it is a very interesting question to look into. Thank you very much, Olga. 
We have one more question. What do you think we should, uh, let's say, if I'm only starting to work in neurotechnology, BCI, which area I should look at as the most promising and how do you think will biofeedback, biofeedback develop? Well, I advise everybody to first uh, get a grip on their theory before you start working with subjects. So make sure that you know your theory well. Read uh, Bajenov's review, for instance. Bajenov's review tells us which neurons are working, what are the neuron ensembles. So first you need to understand neuronal origin of EG. If you look at EMG, then please uh, pay attention to your neurophysiology before you move to devices and subjects. Because your knowledge really needs to be up to date when it comes to physiology and neurophysiology in particular. Thank you very much. We have one more question from the same. User. Do you work with businesses when it comes uh, to cooperation between research and business? You know, I would be very happy to work with businesses, but I do. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you really well. So I do work with um, Mitsar, um, which is um, a company from St. Petersburg. They're now represented in uh, Europe. They have a wonderful EEG program. They have developed, they are developing a really interesting device for biocontrol, so I do work with them. I also work with Nexus. And let's say 10 years ago, Nexus was considered as one of the leading device manufacturers or equipment manufacturers. I work with Vatlad in Novosibirsk, of course, it's a must. So when it comes to all types of biocontrol bus lab, they were very responsive to my feedback when I said that so it has to be customized, that we always need to look at the human first, and only then we have to look at the disease. So you have to consider your subjects, uh, what sort of capabilities they have, uh, what can you work on. You have to know who's in the front of you, a musician, an athlete, a healthy or subjects, or uh, uh, stick subjects. Well, I, I think that you even Managed to answer the next question. What do you think students or young researchers should uh, study these uh, technologies in Russia? Well, I always welcome everybody to come and study in Novosibirsk. But on a serious note, I have to say that apart from St. Petersburg, we have a really good MBN team. There is also a very good team of researchers in Taganrog, Zhitomir, Ivanovo. So we have a lot of interesting teams that are very perceptive to life's challenges. But again, I have to emphasize that you have to start from knowing you neurophysiology when it comes to mathematics. I give them lectures on uh, cognitive neuroscience about so neurons, anatomy and, neuro and the functions of neurons. So if you do not know biofeedback mechanisms, so then you cannot really begin to approach uh, IT technologies. Feedback is everything. 
feedback is something that spurred the development of the internet. And it is something that was developed in Russia. Do read the works of Anohin, Bernstein. These would be extremely useful for IT specialists. First of all, you'll be very proud of uh, Russian achievements but also you'll understand how important it is uh, for the integration of uh, biology and technology. Olga, thank you very much uh, for a fascinating workshop. So, um, we just heard from Olga Bazanova from the Institute of Physiology and Basic Medicine. But right now, let us uh, watch a video to remember our previous conferences. We'll continue our practical workshops in 10 minutes, and we will have Maria Nadarova, who will tell us about navigated and non-navigated TMS, diagnostic and therapeutic capabilities in stroke. So we'll see you uh, in 10 minutes. And now let's look at the video. Самое главное – это коммуникативная площадка. Площадка для общения ученых со всего мира, потому что вот именно во время общения возникают какие-то новые идеи. Эта конференция сейчас в стране, она ведущая по этой теме, что тоже важно для Самарского государственного медицинского университета и в целом региона и практического здравоохранения. Это одна из топовых конференций, можно сказать, в мире. Мы имеем топовых лекторов прямо в одном городе. Пожалуйста, наши коллеги могут приезжать в Самару, а не разъезжаться по всем странам мира, по конференциям и ловить эти лекторов где-то как-то. Действительно, вы собрали фантастическим образом, в Москву людей не задавать. Здесь вы собрали абсолютно топовых докладчиков со всего мира. To be perfectly honest, I've never been to Russia before, and I thought it sounded like a very good opportunity. And I think the development of, of brain-computer interfaces is a very exciting new field, and I'm glad to see that, that Russia is becoming more significantly involved in the process, and so I'm happy to come to this conference and offer my own research. So the brain research in Russia is very strong, so I really, really want to collaborate a lot more. And basically, during my lecture today, I will talk about the brain-computer interface. It's a very good forum for exchange, um, also between the different countries. So we have people from the US and from Japan and from Europe. And it's a very good opportunity to talk with the Russian community, obviously. Это продукт Revivor, достаточно известный, которому мы ставим в своем медицинском учреждении, посвященный реабилитации больных после инсульта, и продукт Revimotion, для, в первую очередь, для реабилитации больных ДЦП.
All right, um, distinguished uh, audience, we need to continue our session of practical workshops. Maria Nazarova from High School of Economics is going to get connected to our broadcast to our Zoom. And while we are working on the technical uh, connections, let's recall our program for today. After Maria, we will have a representative of medical computer systems. Uh, he will talk about T DSC therapy, possibilities, methodology, and limitations of the method. And at 4.30 p.m. Samara time, we'll have an interesting discussion on neural implants, neural link, but not only with Sliman Bensmeyer from the University of Chicago, Mikhail Lebedev from uh, High School of Economics, Russia, Jonathan Wolpel from the USA, uh, Sing Cheng from the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, moderated by Yannick Roy from the University of Montreal, Canada. Uh, we're still waiting for Maria to join us, but we can uh, look at some videos. It's the same video that you will see during workshop, and I will ask our technician to turn on the one of the videos. It's video number two. Let's see if we have any sound. We're going to show you an example of how transcranial stimulation is used for the motor navigation in the screen. You see I will put this camera.
Для того, чтобы картировать двигательную пару, мы должны будем поставить электронеограмму на мышцы. В данной ситуации мы хотим исследовать двигательную пару руки, поэтому мы поставим электронеограмму на мышцы руки. Будем использовать мышцы, мышцы отводящие большой палец. Абдуктор Кольцис Бревис и мышцы, отводящие низинку. Мы делаем вот этот большой палец к низинку. И расслабляем. Мы находим этот палец на низинку. Это видео номер два, вообще. Там видно, как мы uh -huh. ставим, ставим электроды, это, мы поставим поверхностные биполярные электроды на мышцы кисти. Можно делать о, картирование, в принципе, любых мышц. Картируется даже диафрагма, мышцы гортани. Ну, в данной ситуации мы посмотрим на кисти. Мы поставили электроды. У нас один электрод о, земля и о, есть э, биполярные электроды на мышцы отводящий мизинец и о, на мышцы абдуктор кольцевый пресс. Все, теперь мы готовы к проведению тмс картирования Перед началом стимуляции с помощью транспорнеальной а, магнитной стимуляции стимуляции мы обязаны о, дать нашему испытуемому беруше на умеете с ними обращаться а, мы должны а, одеть наушники или беруши так же сами так мы дали нашему испытуемому беруше надели сами беруши или наушники я надела беруши а, проверили еще раз что у нас у а, испытуемого нет никаких монет кредитных карточек, золотых литков в карманах. Настя, нет. Никакого металла нет. У меня, что я тоже не обвешена ключами чем-то другим магнитным на всякий случай. Теперь мы готовы начинать. Начало картирования – это всегда так называемое грубое картирование. То есть сейчас мы сориенти... попробуем сориентироваться на двигательный коре. Вот это конвекситальная поверхность полушарий. Вот центральная борозда. Вот, Прецентральные извили у нас, вот постцентральные извили. Мы будем э, начинать картирование с вот этой области э, прецентральной извили, которая называется о, моторная кнопка руки. Это область э, представленности репрезентации кисти. Где-то отсюда мы и будем начинать. Вот о, здесь визуализируется текущая электромиограмма. У нас сейчас развертка. Э, 200 микровольт, ну, значит, шум у нас здесь где-то меньше 20 микровольт, нам это достаточно. Хорошо, можем начинать. Мы показали, Анастасия уже знает это ощущение ТМС, если бы Настя не знала, мы бы еще раз показали, как выглядит стимул, О, какой он может быть громкий, сейчас я нажму, и вы услышите звук. Вот такой звук будет во время стимуляции и может двигаться о, рука. Непроизвольно не пугайтесь. Если вдруг какое-то неприятное ощущение, обязательно говорите. У нас сразу, видите, большие ответы, больше двух тысяч милливольт. Значит, мы сразу уменьшаем интенсивность стимуляции. Давайте где-то в 30 лет. Нам надо получить такую интенсивность, при которой э, вызванные моторные ответы с руки будут где-то 500-800 микробов. Давайте попробуем так. Вот эти я 
старались держаться перпендикулярно в ближайшем городе. Заметили, я громко говорила, и в момент э, моей громкой речи у нас ответы увеличились. У нас в Акиму во время исследований, но вспомните, должно быть обязательно тихо, испытуемый должен быть расслаблен. Расставьте, пожалуйста, комендинчик. Все равно у нас ответы, наверное, великоваты. Я сейчас начну еще одну сейчас. Чуть-чуть пониже диапазона. Так, мы сориентировались по интенсивности, и сейчас у нас ответы где-то больше 200, но меньше 800. Сейчас на такой интенсивности мы будем делать грубое портирование для того, чтобы найти горячую точку. Заметьте, насколько вариативные ответы. Не было ответа совсем, и вдруг ответ выше 5000. У нас очень высокая вариативность ответа, oh, причем заметьте разницу между мизинцем и большим пальцем. In the response, no. and we are registering quite a significant difference between the pinky and the thumb. Сейчас выбираем самое, мы сделали грубое картирование, и теперь выбираем самые а, большие ответы для того, чтобы выбрать точку, которую Вот, это первый канал, это у нас была мышца АПБ. So this is the R channel. Видите, он меняет, он сейчас будет менять интенсивность. Вот снизил, да? Было 42, 38. Intensity will change. позволяет мне стимулировать чаще, чем раз в полторы секунды, потому что это может повлиять на ответ. На самом деле я не рекомендую стимулировать чаще, чем раз в полторы секунды. Все, нам выдали пароль. 34. Давайте ему верить. 
And we are done. We see a threshold 34. Будем стимулировать интенсивностью 110 процентов от 34. Это значит 34. Да? Вот, с интенсивностью 37 процентов. Давайте посмотрим, что у нас получится. Мы будем выполнять смс-кортирование двигательной коры. Смотреть на две мышцы. Мы будем делать маппинг мотор кортекс. Заметьте, я стараюсь держать катушку на конвекситальной голове. Мне здесь помогает навигационная система, когда стрелка яркая, значит я стою в конвекситальной голове. И я стараюсь подставить ориентацию перпендикулярно лежащему Видно, как меняются ответы за их предположения. So we are almost done with the mapping. Our subject is fantastic. We see that on the right side there are red areas. These are the areas where there were large discriminatory answers. Желтый поменьше, красный еще поменьше, а серый и ответы Заметьте, когда маленькие ответы, движение руки не видно, ответ все еще есть. То есть ответы, конечно, 50 микровольт, но вот удивительно не видно. So the response is 50 microvolts. Посмотрим на карту, которая у нас получилась. Конечно, потом более подробно ее можно анализировать. Then, course, но здесь можно done, map, о, спроксориентировать, что у нас uh, Мы мерили ответы двух пластов, и uh, мы Давайте посмотрим so вообще, the, где у нас были ответы больше в одном мышце, где у нас ответы больше в другом вот смотрите, коричневым цветом здесь у нас обозначается мышца, входящая мизинец. То есть тут ответы были где коричневые, ответы были больше в мышце мизинца. Зеленым обозначены те мишени на коре, где были больше ответы с Действительно, мы можем видеть такой небольшой градиент самототопики, то есть большой палец у нас более латерально, Давайте посмотрим теперь только, например, для большого пальца, где у нас максимум, где минимум. Вот удивительно, смотрите, у нас максимум ответа на большом пальце даже не на предцентральное измерение, а на пальцем. И давайте проделаем то же самое с Мизинцем. Здесь мы видим тоже, что у нас максимум сдвинуты на идеальный поверхность. И тоже у нас есть самые большие ответы и на области S1, не только на M1. Конечно, дальше, чтобы исследовать, мы должны приглашать другую программу для анализа, что мы обсуждали на лекции. We can use whatever software is preferable. One, 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 two, three. Can everybody hear me? Really just... So we just had an opportunity to watch 
uh, video which showed us the use of TMS. Maria Nazarova has joined our workshop. She represents the two organizations, uh, High School of um, Economics and Federal Center for Brain and Neurotechnology of the Federal Medical and Biological Agency. Over to you, Maria. We cannot hear you, Maria. So let's check the screen sharing function. Yes, everything seems to be in order. Over to you, Maria. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Nazarova. I am a neurologist and a neuroscientist. I'm a researcher. So I do a lot of research of the into the human locomotion and some I pay special intention, attention to rehabilitating patients after stroke. Uh, today, I will talk about the opportunities um, that are offered by TMS. And today, we will talk about cerebral stroke, which sort of um, opportunities we have diagnostically, therapeutically, if we have access to TMS. So what is transcranial magnetic stimulation? Well, there are two parts of the first word, uh, word trans and cranial. So something goes through the skull. This is a non-invasive method for brain stimulation together with a transcranial electric stimulation, which is called micropolarization in Russian literature. But uh, what does TMS give us? It can give us online effects. That's why TMS is used for research of the nervous system, both healthy nervous system and impaired nervous system. It is also used for neuromodulation, which gives us an opportunity to use TMS therapeutically. Let me give you a little bit uh, of a background. So, well, you know, the electric rays were used back in ancient Rome to treat migraines. And up until now, TMS is one of the possible treatments for persistent migraines. When people started looking into electromagnetism back in the 19th century, Giovanni Aldini came up with the notion of living electricity and then the physicists were testing magnetic electricity. TMS, or TMS as we um, know it today, became widespread back in the 1980s. Here on this picture, you see the first uh, commercial TMS machine. And those of you who worked uh, with a TMS machine, you can see that the TMS machine that was invented back in 1980s uh, looks pretty much like the TMS machines we have today. Well, the only thing that is different is here, the uh, transducer is round, but now we have differently shaped transducers. So these two methods appear back in the 80s to stimulate the motor cortex, but now it has much wider applications. So we look into motor systems, we apply it in cognitive research and psychiatry and so on. 
So what is the difference between the TMS that was used back in the 1980s and the TMS that is used today? As you can see, the machine can be quite similar, but today we can combine TMS with other research modalities. We can combine TMS and EEG. Uh, for this, we need special EEG amplifiers, but it is uh, possible. It can even be used in clinical practice, and it is used in clinical practice. And we also have MRI um, navigation or MRI-assisted TMS. I am very sorry that the video, which uh, you saw previously, didn't really have an audio sound, but I'll show you another video how we use MRI navigation and TMS uh, to map everything with the precision of several millimeters. If something in my talk is unclear or you need some more explanation or you have a question, please do use the raise a hand function so you can ask me any questions, give me any feedback using your microphone online. If there are no questions, let me continue. We use uh, MRI with or without navigation and also in combination with other methods. We can see that the number of uh, publications on TMS and we're interested in uh, strokes and uh, TMS. It keeps going up in uh, 2018. We had over 4,000 of them. And uh, we have even more of them today. What is the recommended approach when we use uh, TMS for therapy? In 2020, new recommendations were issued at the level of, at the A level. We have uh, three uh, reasons to use it: the neuropathic pain. It had some issues, but anyway. Uh, Anyway, we have a neuropathic pain, depression, and uh, motor uh, disorders in uh, hands with uh, patients under six months. This is what we're going to focus on, what is recommended for strokes. Even there, there are some issues in terms of improving rehabilitation of uh, post-stroke patients. But let's get back to what we mean by TMS once again. TMS is uh, a method that allows us to use the invasive method to stimulate the surface uh, structures. We cannot go all the way to basal ganglia or, or to the medium part of the brain. We cannot get there, but we can uh, stimulate the upper layers and the cerebellum. Transcranial means where we put our coil. If we put it on the head, it will be transcranial, or we could put it on the hand, it would be peripheral magnetic stimulation. If you put it on the spinal cord, it would be transspinal stimulation, but we are talking about transcranial stimulation here. And the depth where we are supposed to it is uh, around 20 centimeters under uh, the cortex where we there's a switch between gray and white matter. This is the general principle of how it works. In this coil, there are pop, or there's a copper wire and it's under current. You induce the magnetic field and with it in the painless way, it goes through the scalp and induces an electric field. This methodology is painless as opposed to some of the early methods that were used of transcranial electric stimulation when it used very high intensity and it, and it is used for healthy individuals for patients and for uh, children this is what can be used in a variety of areas all right what happens after uh, tms impulse you get this current in the coil is some devices show you um, the current values in amperes then a magnetic field is induced and eventually you get this induced 
current in the tissue and it, it's not just neurons but all other structures around but when we talk about the target cells we mean neurons these are model works and of course we believe that we uh, impact layer three of cortex and then transsynoptically we activate the pyramid cells of l5 depending on the position of the coil depending on how we stimulate we are going to excite different pools of neurons and this is the basis of different approaches when they use the tms to assess different pools of neurons uh, in the same area. Is everything clear at the moment? Are there any questions at this point? If you do have them, you can write them in the chat. Uh, about positive effect, uh, we're going to talk uh, later. This is not a recommended approach at the moment it does mean that it doesn't work there was a large randomized study i'll tell you why it has been uh, removed from the recommendations as i mentioned the cells for tms it's level three and tends optically level five the key idea here is that uh, tms uh, excites uh, pyramidal uh, cells in the transsynaptic way. As for the way or whether we hit it accurately, we stimulate a rather broad area, but the maximum of the induced electric field will be located at the level of the cortex, which is a few cubic millimeters large. We use this method to get some local effects. The most obvious use of TMS to get local effect is, of course, mapping of the cortex, which is used for scientific purposes, uh, which is a routine during some surgeries as pre-surgery functional mapping of the brain. It's, uh, it's information for the neurosurgeon before the operation. Uh, what does this uh, totality of the induced uh, will depend on? Oh, it's because uh, it depends on the shape of the coil and how far we do it. Uh, the simplest placebo is to remove the coil from further from the head and you won't get anything on the brain and the orientation of the coil form, where it is, distance from the head and how you move it. It's about the shape and the distance and location of the coil. What can we do using TMS and the global in the broad sense? We can guess, get that line effect that I was talking about using it for neuromodulation and and we can get online effects. There's supposed to be an animation in this part of the slide about online effects to study the state of the brain at, at the moment. These are subdivided into online, offline uh, TMS approaches. For online, we can quantify something mm -hmm measure some property of the brain. The simplest thing that we can do, we stimulate the motor cortex, we get response with uh, muscles and we can measure how big it was and uh, look at cortical spinal um, excitement and we can interfere it with the current process and this is the foundation of the methods that are called this really nasty words, virtual damage. If we have 
current neuronal process, for example, image recognition, we understand more or less where it's going on. how it's uh, going on in the visual cortex and the data about evoked potentials we can apply uh, TMS stimulus as powerful impact on the cortex which interrupts what's going on there at the moment that's why we can use it for interference with the ongoing task to understand whether this part of the cortex really is part of a certain task and we can get offline effects so we can activate the facilitating effect and inhibit some of the other areas of the cortex which is used for therapeutic uh, impact before we talk about the actual use of it, of it let me tell you a few words about safety of this approach i already mentioned it a bit earlier uh, tms is a safe method it's used for healthy individuals uh, for epilepsy uh, patients and even though there are some limitations in also it's used with children but Uh, this is the latest safety recommendation uh, issued 10 years ago. They are going to be revised soon, but the worst case that uh, but about some doubts, if it's really powerful, you can, it can lead to an epi epileptic uh, seizure. But uh, if we follow the guidelines of no more than so many pulses or so much intensity, then the risk is estimated at 1.4 percent. For patients with epilepsy, it's a relatively small risk. And in 2012 uh, through 2016, there was a, a survey of uh, different labs they had a survey of different labs including clinical labs that used tms and the key point is that the risk there, there were only four seizures out of the total number of uh, sessions and the key point was that uh, uh, and the high frequency stimulation was no more likely to cause seizures than low frequency and single paired pulse TMS. If we follow main uh, safety recommendations, it doesn't matter whether you use low frequency or high frequency uh, option in terms of safety. Uh, now about strokes, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to get them. If, if something is uh, not clear, raise your hand and then your mic will be on. What can we do in terms of stroke? There are some diagnostics capabilities. This is an illustration of what I was talking about. If we stimulate the motor cortex, we get to the pyramid of L5 there where we get our main pathway of uh, voluntary movements and then we can activate neurons that give us axons for this uh, pathway and we get the situation that if you have a sort of mass even in that video even without sound you could see that the volunteer had some involuntary subconscious movements that were stimulated by TMS. When we measure it using the surface myography signal, it's evoked motor uh, feedback, and we measure it from peak to peak. There are other parameters that we can estimate the number of phases and so on. 
these are the, the details and with the presence of this evoked motor feedback, it means that functionally your corticospinal uh, pathway is uh, intact. What can we do using TMS? What else? We, if we can stimulate with two stimuli, depending on how these stimuli are different from one another in terms of their intensity in the time gap between them, we can get either the reduction of evoked uh, responses or the increase of uh, evoked uh, motor uh, responses, and we will show you how it looks like. It's uh, inhibition or facilitation phenomena, for example, for this phenomenon, short interval cortical inhibition when two stimuli follow one another with uh, very little break of uh, or gap of two milliseconds. And one is uh, below, another one is above the threshold and we get the reduction of response. Let me say immediately about this threshold. TMS of the motor cortex uh, there, we use the notion of calm or active threshold. It's such intensity of stimulation when we talk about calm threshold where you begin to see the evoked motor response from the muscle when you begin to register something in your myogram. If we stimulate with uh, less intensity, it does not mean that we do, uh, we do nothing. It simply means that we lack intensity to activate pyramid cells. If we uh, ride stimul stimulus uh, under the threshold and then above the threshold, it still gives us effect. That's why most therapeutic uh, protocols use uh, uh, values below the threshold. It does not mean that these uh, thresholds are, it doesn't mean that we have no impact on the brain. It simply means that it's under uh, what, what is necessary to activate pyramid cells. All right, I hope colleagues, this part is clear. If you get any questions, use chat for that. Because sometimes I might miss something in the chat. This was the stimulation with two stimuli in the same spot. We can also use TMS to stimulate several locations with two different coils. We can uh, apply one stimulus one place location and another one at another. It's used in a clinical uh, practice. They, this is widely used for research. We have one conditioning uh, stimulus and another testing stimulus. And this is probably the best way to uh, look at the connectivity between regions, not just uh, through the correlation that we can see using uh, EEG or functional MRI, or we can look at causal relations between these areas. And, and also we can use uh, with stroke, which is widely used for functional mapping of the brain before surgery. This is TMS mapping of your cortex. This is a a homunculus uh, illustration from Penfold, and, and it's been discussed many times before. It's a, more or less a metaphor. It's not uh, all that realistic, but this is what was available for invasive approach in the past. But now with TMS, it's also available. We can, this is our brain here. This is our median. Uh, and some of the gyri shown here, and we see the responses when we inst when inst install our electrode, and when we did the mapping, 
which was uh, also in the original video in the beginning. And here, the, this is the part for another muscle that is uh, dealing with the pinky. And so this is a map of one muscle. It's really large. There's a significant overlap for different muscles here and a map for another uh, muscle. And these are also different days. We can assess the plasticity of the cortex during the rehabilitation or, or training. All right, are there any questions at the moment? If there are any questions, so do ask them, of course. Well, let's go on. That is something which I mentioned before. We can assess a cortical reorganization following a stroke using the TMS modality. So let's talk a little bit about neuromodulation. What can we do if we want to change something using TMS? We can use different protocols. For instance, we supply not one or two stimuli, but rather a lot of stimuli using a rhythmic sequence. This approach is called the rhythmic TMS or RTMS. And there are a lot of approaches like this. There are two classic RTMS approaches. One is low frequency stimulation from low frequency stimulation is from 1.5 to 2 or 3 hertz and high frequency stimulation. When we're talking about high frequency, we're usually talking about stimulation from 5 to 20 hertz. There are uh, also a lot of burst uh, TMS, for instance, uh, C, uh, TBS, constant theta burst stimulation, or ITBS, which is intermittent theta burst stimulation. These uh, protocols have been adapted from annual studies. We used to think, we used to think uh, quite uh, for a long time that they're activating protocols and inhibiting protocols. We used to believe that so when we apply one hertz uh, to the visual cortex, we diminish the activity of the visual cortex. If we apply, let's say, 10 hertz to the visual cortex, we increase the activity of the visual uh, uh, cortex. But right now we know this uh, to be not entirely true. These results are different between different subjects, even between healthy subjects, let alone patients after stroke. I already mentioned so the new guidelines which were published this year. These are evidence-based guidelines. You see a huge list of experts here who took part in the development of the guidelines. But these are guidelines issued by European experts. What's important about these guidelines is that evidence level A is, or it rather incorporates a lot of studies, but it doesn't really mean that it will directly translate into giving us a substantial clinical effect. Oh, I got a question. And somebody is asking, why have you selected theta? Well, you know, when we're talking about theta bursts, That is something that we learned from Taiwanese researchers who took one of the animal protocols, which used theta burst stimulation. So we took the animal model stimulation 
and adapted it to humans. It turned out that so for some human subjects, theater bursts do work, but for others, they do not. There are certain advantages to the theater burst uh, protocol. If we talk about these uh, standard protocols of one hertz or 10 hertz, these are very time consuming protocols uh, that uh, require from 20 to 30 minutes. Therefore, everybody was looking for faster uh, pro uh, protocols and that's why we ended up using theta bursts because they only take up, let's say about four minutes. If I haven't managed to answer your question, please let me know. What about the angle of uh, tilting? Yes. It is very important. That's why we do use MRI assisted navigation because the area where an electrical field will be reduced is of course regulated by the angle. The next question is that, so do we only stimulate the motor cortex? Well, of course not. We stimulate different cortical areas. I was just uh, talking about the motor cortex because I was talking about post-stroke rehabilit rehabilitation, but of course we can stimulate different cortical areas. So how, what is the influence of the one hertz uh, protocol on the medulla oblongata, on the vegetative functions of the medulla oblongata. Well, you know, if we talk about the cerebellum, there are quite a lot of muscles that are located close to the location of the cerebellum, there's also the spinal cord, but when we are stimulating using the TMS modality, we also stimulate the areas that are located more superficially. So we are trying to stimulate the brain, but of course we also stimulate a peripheral nerve. So if you are trying to stimulate speech areas, then you're not only trying to reach the Broca or Verenke areas, but uh, you're also stimulating some scalp areas. So you can stimulate uh, the facial nerve, which will create the tension. So um, you asked about medulla oblongata. Well, you know, I don't think TMS is not the right modality to stimulate medulla oblongata, but we are studying vegetative functions, but we cannot directly influence the medulla oblongata. Well, if I didn't manage to answer your questions, then we can talk uh, over the microphone. Okay, let's talk about rhythmic stimulation. Let me just uh, give you, oh, I've already given you a brief overview of uh, the recommendations of the guidelines. The guidelines specify neuropathic pain. So neuro, neuropathic pain is one of the indications which has gathered a lot of evidence. Migraines, of course, so we can have a lot of approaches here as well. Uh, stroke, that's what I've been talking about. So patients after stroke, especially if the stroke happened less than six months ago, then we're 
using and patients who have the primary motor cortex inhibition in the unaffected hemisphere. So rhythmic TMS, well, researchers try to use this protocol for all of the patients, but there was a research that had been published in 2018, research looking into stroke patients, six months or longer after the stroke. It was a multi-center randomized shame control trial. And this trial was said that there is no effect of the transcarbonic stimulation of for these uh, patients. So we'll talk about why we need to suppress unaffected hemisphere. That is something that so we've been looking into. What, what are the factors that determine member CMS or non-invasive brain stimulation following a stroke would be helpful? Of course, if you look at it from, from a global point of view, then we have to see what is the prognosis for the patient. The second part is um, motor system reorganization model. So what it is that we're looking for, we, if, what do we want to make the unaffected hemisphere more active? Do you want to suppress it? How are we going to reprogram interaction between the different parts of the cortex or non-cortical areas? And the third factor is um, the effectiveness of our TMS for individuals, because even in healthy subjects, um, the effects of our TMS could be quite different. And all of these come down to the effectiveness of uh, neuromodeling TMS in patients after stroke. So let's talk about uh, potential recovery of these patients. The most important thing here is the factor that hasn't really been studied in depth. And this factor is the intactness of the corticospinal tracts. There was a publication that we published in the stroke journal. And in this publication, we analyzed patients in the chronic period with different degrees of paresis if we look at the corticospinal tract in the internal capsule, then we can say that uh, most severely affected patients, patients in the group three, are very different from moderately severe and mildly severe patients. Basically patients for whom the hope of recovery is higher. So it all comes down to the intactness of the spinal cortical connection. We have to look at the intactness of the inner capsule. You see this fractional anisotropy profiles in the corticospinal tract so that I'm pointing to. You see the numbers for patients for whom the prognosis is good intermediate and poor. And you see for these patients, uh, everything comes down to the level of the inner capsule. Oh, I see that I have questions, maybe not. No, there are no questions. So if we're talking about uh, fractional anisotropy, it is the role of this fractional anisotropy is a bit uh, less in uh, the uh, 
area. of the cerebrum peduncle. What famous indications exist in the clinical practice? Well, first of all, we're talking about acute stroke. So usually after an acute stroke, during days three to seven, we can use TMS, a new paper has been published recently that says that TMS can be used during surgery. For instance, if an artery bursts during the acute period, we can look at the corticospinal tract and the presence of response responses is an important criteria for us to establish whether we've managed to recover this brain function. So we were talking about the first uh, point evoked uh, motor responses and corticospinal tract on MRI. We were talking about it in more general terms, whether the brain function can or cannot be recovered. But there is another important consideration. We cannot, of course, influence the intactness of the corticospinal tract, but we can do something about the rare um, organization model. There are two models. Two models of recovery. The first model is the interhemispherical competition. They just quite simple. The unaffected hemisphere starts to suppress the affected hemisphere, and that plays a very negative role in patient recovery. That's what all of the stroke neuromodulation has been based on. So you see the model that we use in patient recovery today, and it is based on this interhemispherical competition. But there is another model which has been extensively looked into by Russian scientists and other international scientists, and this is the so-called replacement model, which says that the unaffected hemisphere compensates for the lost function in the affected hemisphere, and therefore the unaffected hemisphere and its function contributes a lot to patient recovery. The replacement model used to be very popular, but so when it comes to neuromodulation, the interhemisphere you know, hemispherical model became more popular. But we do see that maybe it is not the right approach at this time, and maybe we do need another model. Well, the, this model very promptly appeared, and this is the bi-model reorganization model. So if we have a good structural reserve here, then we do not really need to reorganize the interhemispherical equilibrium. But if the intrinsic reserve is rather diminished, then we need the input from the unaffected hemisphere. So a lot of the physical therapy approach are, are based on this principle. For instance, uh, there is an approach to physical therapy when we take, let's say, the unaffected limb and remove it from the experiment and we concentrate on working with the affected limb. This is uh, the so-called limit-based uh, therapy. There is also a bilateral approach, but it still remains unclear which approach uh, is the most beneficial. So we are looking into using 
TMS, and we believe that bilateral training sessions are more preferable for severe patients. So we are trying to combine sufficient neuromodulation and the activation of the unaffected hemisphere. So, so what's, how do you administer TMS when you have bilateral damage to the corticospinal tract? Well, if we're talking about the interhemispherical um, competition, well, that is not something that we can do when we have bilateral damage to the corticospinal tract. But um, there have been a lot of papers and we're all looking forward to seeing the results of a large randomized clinical trial that is currently underway. But it, all these papers say that CMS can be beneficial to diminish spasticity in patients with multiple sclerosis. If we're talking about stroke, especially about bilateral damage, we, I have to say that we do not have one preferred modality. What we can use a TMS for now is to decrease the activity of one area and uh, to increase the activity in another. If we're talking about balance between inhibition and excitement, this is from our work. The threshold of getting the response, uh, TMS response in the intact uh, hemisphere from mild, uh, medium, and severe cases is pretty much the same. There's no significant change in the uh, cortical spinal excitement level it is not there. And, uh, and when there's this lesion uh, damage to the hemisphere, there's this uh, Correlation and the threshold is about pre morbid level. If we do it on us, uh, we will all have uh, different thresholds depending on the peculiar features of our brain and even the thickness of your skull. How, how you need to raise the efficiency intensity for that field to reach the brain through the skull bone. And the key point is that with with the stroke, it's recommended that the severe patients compared with uh, those who have restored nicely, they have uh, damage to the uh, motor part of uh, corpus callosum and how to uh, apply this inhibition from the other hemisphere is not clear. If your corpus callosum is damaged, uh, then we can, there's this clear correlation. You need the structural preservation of uh, some structure in the corpus callosum and cortex. If this is a severe case, then there will be broken links and uh, connections between two hemispheres, even in the secondary manner. All right, let's see if we have any more questions. I can't see anything in the chat. Uh, let's see if there's anything left. About the targets, what other targets you can use uh, with stroke, we talk about motor system and everything that comes to mind. We checked everything. These are the main ones. This is the insult. I'm in, I'm in stroke area and uh, inhibition of uh, the healthy hemisphere and the RM1 rather vague area activating of the damaged hemisphere and everything that has to do with the motor system additional the motor ventricle dorsal areas and additional Somatosensoric cortex and, of course, cerebellum. Uh, we study all this and 
it's all quite interesting, but it's all at the level of uh, research. Let me, let me check the chat once again. Louisa, please uh, uh, advise me on whether I still have time or not. In terms of our schedule, we still have 16 more minutes. Um, uh, you do still have uh, some time. All right, let's uh, focus on that. You can always see the video. Afterwards, it shows uh, standard protocols. You can stay and watch them. My third point, my first point was about the TMS effects uh, with stroke patients are determined by how well we can restore functions at all. My second point was what kind of model of reorganization we want to use. And my third point, it's the impact of protocols, so whether one hertz is activating or not, whether 10 hertz or inhibiting or non-inhibiting, uh, activating or non-activating. Even with healthy uh, subjects, we show different approaches. For example, uh, one is one is with theta bursts, black respondents, gray non-respondents. And it's about all types of neuromodulation. And when we look at the activating or inhibiting uh, protocols, we expect the increase of evoked motor responses. Uh, we had 100, then everything else, everything here is above, and everything here is below. And for responders, we, uh, resp we have about 40% of them, and that is repeated from study to study. If you uh, turn on one hertz, uh, it doesn't mean that you will get inhibiting protocol. It sounds really scary how you can use it at all. And what we believe, and many other researchers believe on that, it's the idea that we need to monitor we can monitor connectivity in the brain and peculiarities of how it's organized and reorganized with every specific uh, patient, uh, one particular lesion impact the entire connectivity of the brain. And what we're doing is trying to monitor certain current states in the brain. This is an emerging topic. At the very beginning of the process, there are no good markers. Some wanted to check phase of power or the algorithm. It works a little better with phase than with power, but it's not an ideal marker. This is what the global community is working on. and. If you are working in the adjacent field, it would be great to uh, start some kind of cooperation here. This is the hottest topic, trying to uh, capture those specific states of uh, the current functional state. And it's not only about EEG, this is just an example. Uh, we do it with EMG and with anything that measures current biological activity, uh, heart and some uh, anything else, catching some biological states. How our brain is going to respond, the reactivity of the system is determined by its uh, dynamics. This is what we do as well. This is this idea of critical state, depending on the state of the system, there are different opportunities to transfer information if the probability of signal going on is 50, 50, then after certain excitement, the entire system, system is going to be excited. And if the probability 
of signal transfer is one thousandth, then everything will be inhibited. But if there's a certain uh, intermediate state, then there's an opportunity to transfer information in the system. And there are attempts to find some EEG markers. In particular, we use autocorrelations in in the magnetic or electric uh, signal, how this uh, signal correlates with its uh, self. And this is one of the parameters that we try to use to predict the individual reactivity of the system. Whether this brain, in principle, is able to respond to an impact at the current neuronal activity. As I said, this is the most active uh, study. I'm not going into details there, uh, but what really works now, and, and this phase of neurism, if we talk about this, and the desynchronization of beta, and we try to find some markers in EEG to stimulate at a certain point what's going on and get better effects. And for stroke, it's uh, really connected with uh, BCI uh, technologies. Then we imagine the movement when you capture a certain brain state. Uh, this is a better desynchronization, for example. And at this point, you apply the stimulation. And there's an idea here to move from non-invasive approaches to invasive methods for patients with severe paresis and to use individual electrodes to stimulate uh, patients at home. What do we expect uh, from TMS with the stroke? What we discussed here is to stop doing the same thing for uh, everyone. Currently, the approach is to inhibit the intact hemispheres for everyone, where and others are trying to look at the structural reserve, functional reserve of the damaged hemisphere, depending on whether it is intact or not, or then you have to think about whether it's activation or inhibition and you have placebo-controlled, you need to have placebo-controlled studies. It's useless without placebo. And I um, only, uh, I hardly ever mentioned uh, this part about TMS and EEG, TMS and EEG markers in psychiatry are quite possible, uh, are quite popular in uh, schizophrenia and other disorders, and activity-dependent stimulation is the way they try to take to avoid this variability of uh, effects that keeps us quite limited in how we can use this stimulation, because when you have 15 to 20 patients, it's one thing, when you try to assess it in a small group, you lose the effects. And what I failed to mention, even now, for scientific purposes, we can use multi-channel GMS devices when, when you have lots of coils, and using them, you can stimulate here and then here with uh, gaps of uh, milliseconds, and this is a new area of GMS. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And Louisa, uh, if uh, there's time, and, uh, and there's another video with pretty much the same stuff without mapping the brain with cortex. This is the uh, video we recorded at our lab to show how the mass looks like. Thank you, Maria, for your interesting workshop. It's up to you, actually. We can uh, take questions from the audience, and during the break, we can turn on the video for the participants in which your 
show the points and thresholds of motor response, or we can turn this video on and then you can answer questions. All right, colleagues, uh, depending on whether it's live or not. Someone raised a hand uh, from Olga Bazanova. If you are online, turn on your camera or microphone and ask your question. Uh, Maria, прежде всего, огромное вам спасибо за Thank you very much for this excellent and clear presentation. It was both informative. And all that what you're showing in your final slide, human math and activity this is also my ideology, when we need to use this uh, state when we modulate future state. If I, if I were had been your professor, I would give you an excellent mark. Excellent. When you have uh, forced modulation, it is always combined with immediate response we deal with the brain here and it's immediate response it may be a discussion I may be starting a discussion here but this immediate response often evokes the reverse effect when we, we stimulate it using by a neural stimulation and electroencephalography that would correspond to EEG patterns and we that will uh, match the success in training, uh, the successful uh, uh, seconds were turned into audio for people with test stimulation without DCI, or, um, they increased their uh, auto power during hearing, and then they were okay during biocontrol, but when we uh, during the stimulation added some material, we didn't get any uh, good results, we uh, get the negation of negation, and what do you think about that? That's a very interesting question. I would be glad to operate in this field. This entire topic is very uh, uh, hard to deal with. I quite agree with you that you can extrapolate some of these um, methods of sensoric stimulation and you use uh, closed or open loops in TMS. Uh, you catch a certain state, doesn't matter what, and we capture a certain state based on biological activity and stimulate it. And then we are not interested in what's going on after our uh, impact. Or is this, this is the, what we call the open loop. If we stimulate and then we keep assessing it, the difference, there's a difference between uh, TMS EEG or EEG TMS. Um, it's something used in psychiatry uh, with uh, strokes, uh, TMS EEG markers of connectivity. This is when we, this is TMS evoked response and which is also uh, by uh, induced oscillation. TMS is a powerful impact which stops everything that was going on there at the moment. And it's about intensity of stimulation that you're selecting. They actively working on it. And this is a, a hype uh, topic for seven to 10 years. Uh, many groups uh, work on it. And there are no significant results in terms of efficiency. Maybe this parallel interference is what we think about. And it's important not only to monitor 
the current state, but also uh, put the patient into that state. And when you monitor the movement and you imagine the movement and Uh, there are all these studies in PCI. If we change the functional state, we can change the functional state or behavioral state. And this topic was not used all the way in TMS. This is what we call simply uh, two way, two types of activity when we, we ask people to do something as we stimulate. Well, of course, there's this uh, interference, negation of negation, or one of the problems why these approaches don't always work. As part of our ideas of uh, Gabe uh, rule, and we stimulate at the moment when something happens, but it's a, a topic большое. that uh, requires uh, certain additional studies. Thank you, Maria. We have another question from uh, Helen. Can we explain the results of NICHE trail? Explain without considering the severity of uh, corticospinal tract and corpus callosum damage. Well, if I understand the question correctly, you're probably talking about the Harvey study that was conducted in 2018. So you're talking about the NISH trial. trial. Uh, yes, Elena is saying that, yes, yeah, she's asking about the NISH trial. Yeah, that is a very good question. Thank you very much for this. To give you a brief answer, I think that the researchers themselves promised uh, to perform a post hoc analysis. And I do think that we're going to see this post hoc analysis rather sooner than later. So, yeah, maybe they didn't manage to achieve the results because uh, they, they've planned it out so well. So they had a lot of physical therapy. They did a lot of training sessions with the subjects and they managed to show that uh, both placebo-controlled and uh, stimulation-controlled groups sh uh, have shown similar progress. One of the reasons is for this is probably that they didn't take into account the structural and functional state of uh, the tracts. There was another trial that uh, was published in 2017 the trial about invasive uh, post-stroke stimulations, that was the Everest trial. And during the Everest trial, they achieved good results in phase one. But then it turned out that the results were less than impressive in phase two, having done the ad hoc analysis, they have shown that they looked at evoked motor responses in all patients and only recruited patients with evoked motor responses. But once they started recruiting patients into RCT, they couldn't afford to get the evoked motor responses patients. So I think that maybe a similar thing happened in the NISH trial. We are uh, running a trial for patients uh, 
six months after stroke or six months or less after stroke. So not everybody will benefit from uh, suppressing the unaffected hemisphere. And I think that um, this slide about interhemispherical interaction, well, this uh, topic is not entirely clear. There are some researchers who do not believe that it exists at all. So we are now we are even talking not about horizontal networks between the hemispheres, but uh, we have um, changed functioning in uh, pyramidal tracts. How can we influence the medulla oblongata? So when we use a team mass, well, basically. We're just looking at the interhemispherical connections, but nobody managed to prove that the interhemispherical connections are the root of the problem. But yeah, this is Elena. Thank you very much for giving me such an exhaustive answer to my question. Thank you very much, Elena. Well, Maria, thank you very much for a fascinating workshop. Now we're going to have uh, half an hour break. And if we have any listeners who are more interested in the TMS uh, methodology in using MRI navigation or intercorporeal facilitation or inhibition, please uh, stay with us in Zoom and we will replay the video provided by Maria Nazarba. So can we please play video feed number three so that the participants have a chance to watch the video. But we are going to continue with the next workshop at uh, 1.30 Samara time and will be delivered by Stanislav Zabadaev on TDCS therapy, possibilities, methodology, and limitations of the method. И покажем основные протоколы, которые используются в исследованиях и в клинике. Это протоколы однократный ТМС, про который мы говорили, парный ТМС и ритмическая стимуляция. Собственно, легче всего показывать, конечно, на двигательной коре, поэтому для упрощения мы будем стимулировать двигательную кору и записывать вызванные моторные ответы с мышц. Для этого нам понадобится поставить, опять-таки, электроды для поверхности летней ограды. Опять-таки, отводящая короткая мышца, отводящая большой палец. И мышца, отводящая мизинец. АПБ и ЭГЕ. Используем различные электроды. Главное, чтобы у нас уровень шова на миографии был меньше 20 микровольт. Можно вас попросить о повышенной объективности мизинца.
быть, там, испытуемый или там пациент к нам тут прибежал или пришел, там, не знаю, с эрготерапией, да, пациент. Это все важно, это надо учитывать. Ну, заметим, мы сейчас будем работать с добровольцем в берушах. Я пытаюсь угадать, что я там говорила, и я, и добровольцы будут защищены в плане звука. Звук ТМС достаточно громкий, поэтому это обязательное условие и для там, доктора, медсестры, исследователя, кого угодно. Мы работаем только в берущих и наушниках, и испытуемые или пациенты у нас только в берущих и наушниках. Это принципиально, потому что можно это... Честно говоря, я этого боюсь больше, чем, например, рэпи, потому что это более реалистичная штука, если мы будем ритмическую стимуляцию делать на больших интенсивностях, как иногда надо у пациентов без берус, то можно сработать о шум в ушах. То есть тинитус, который с помощью ТМС тоже лечится. Ну вот, не хотелось бы. Здесь не очень хорошо видно, но мы тоже по МРТ отслеживаем положение катушки, то есть я тоже пытаюсь находиться на уровне двигательной коры первичной, а справа, там будет еще отдельное видео с экраном, у нас записывается электромиография, и мы видим вызванные моторные ответы. Так, ну, сначала, собственно, я, насколько понимаю, то, что мы сейчас делаем, это так называемое грубое картирование, мы его всегда проводим, то есть ключевой момент, коллеги, если вы делаете ТМС, например, вас интересует там зрительная кора или какая-то другая, все равно мы часто начинаем с двигательной коры. Вот смотрите, здесь просто то, что мы видим слева, это просто навигация, мы пытаемся удержаться на одной точке, вот по поводу положения катушки, да, мы пытаемся удержать одно и то же положение. Справа мы видим два канала, доктор Полисис Бревис и доктор Дегетиминими, и вот правая часть экрана показывает вызванные моторные ответы. И что можно увидеть сейчас? Я пытаюсь стимулировать на одной и той же, находясь в области коры, с одной и той же интенсивностью. При этом ответы у нас прыгают постоянно. То есть, безусловно, конечно, может быть физический фактор, если я двигаю катушкой, но ключевой фактор – это состояние текущее, постоянно меняется, и при этом оно меняется мышца специфично. То есть на одной мышце у нас ответ может возрастать, на другой – уменьшаться. Вот. Это такой как бы, ну, ключевой момент флуктуации. То есть мы не просто еще флуктуируем состояние, оно флуктуирует достаточно специфично. Ну вот, видно, да? Так, коллеги, мы перемотать видео не можем чуть-чуть вперед. Да, мы сейчас можем. Давайте скажите нам, куда мотать. Ну, в смысле, понятно, что вперед. Насколько сейчас режиссер будет потихоньку мотать, менять вот экран. Скажите, когда нужно становиться. Ну, вот сейчас мы будем, видимо, показывать, я просто без звука сейчас точно не угадаю. Можно включить звук? Давайте включим. Мы хотели показать, собственно, вот сейчас были ответы однократные на однократную стимуляцию, то, что, собственно, мы хотели показать еще, это ответы на парную стимуляцию, то есть различные феномены фасилитации и торможения. Здесь не будет очень хорошо видно, как выглядит триггер, но, собственно, если это однократная сингл-пал стимуляция, это один стимул, если это парная, то это два стимула, и мы на аппарате регулируем интенсивность каждого из стимулов и длительность между стимулами. Вот сейчас был, например, эффект фасилитации. И, коллеги, сейчас включили звук, поэтому слышно, какой звук стимуляции. Да? Хотя до нас не так все доходит, но все-таки слышно, что это громко. Если у вас будет пациент, например, с боковым миотрофическим клерозом, с рассеянным клерозом, с инсультом, это ситуация, когда чаще всего пороги возрастают, то, естественно, интенсивность будет больше, и, соответственно, звук будет еще громче. Поэтому вот эти всякие берущие наушники, это очень принципиально. Парную стимуляцию. 
То есть то, что мы должны увидеть сейчас, то есть то, что мы должны играть сейчас, это маленькие, это маленькие, маленькие деньги. Тут, к сожалению, не идеально видно экран, но эффекты, вот как раз SICI и другие эффекты парной стимуляции, они тоже достаточно флуктуируют между испытуемыми, и их можно использовать их при различных патологиях. При инсульте, к сожалению, это дело не вышло, мы пытались, и ну, как бы много работ, но э, они не входят ни в какие клинические маркеры, то есть мы не нашли какой-то клинической значимости для этих феноменов, но э, их можно использовать у, при, например, ну, там, при болезни Паркинсона, они используются иногда как такие попытки клинических маркеров, они отражают, есть парные феномены, которые отражают состояние глаба аэргической системы, вот как раз то, что я сейчас пытаюсь показать, SICI, Short Interval Cortical Inhibition, то есть это феномен, связанный с ГАБА, а да, ГАБА это ионотропные рецепторы, то есть это быстрые эффекты. Есть феномен, я тоже тут пытаюсь показать, Lone Interval Cortical Inhibition, когда о, есть два стимула, которые разделены интервалом 100 миллисекунд. Это большой уже интервал, да, это явно уже метаботропные какие-то вещи. И о, считается, что это габа б эргический феномен. Почему я говорю считается? Ну, потому что это в основном, конечно, исследования такие макроскопические, то есть это там добровольцы, которым давали антагонисты препарат. То есть, ну, очень-очень такой суррогатный подход, но тем не менее. Коллеги, вот сейчас, мне кажется, как раз было бы здорово, если есть какие-то вопросы, пожалуйста, задавайте, вот если там технически что-то непонятно, потому что, собственно, это только ради того, чтобы показать чисто технически, если вы будете с этим работать, вы, конечно, все будете сами, как, как вам удобно делать, но если есть какие-то технические моменты, давайте их уточним. Потому что э, э, коллеги-организаторы можно тогда вперед перемотать. Ну, то, что, ну, видно, да, у нас двигается рука непроизвольно, и в зависимости от э, того, какие мы э, выбрали э, феномены, у нас ответы либо уменьшаются, либо увеличиваются. Давайте, наверное, на самый конец, когда я буду показывать ритмическую стимуляцию, просто чтобы услышать, как это звучит. Угу. Скажите, где остановить? Я, к сожалению, не вижу бегунка, <laughs> поэтому... А. А, ну, да. Это буквально последние пять минут записи. Ага. А, вот-вот-вот, вот сейчас давайте чуть вернем. Вот сейчас мы покажем эффекты наблюдения за движением и воображения. Вот отсюда, да? Наверное. Сейчас. Спасибо. Ну, здесь, хотя экран не видно, видно, что сейчас рука достаточно хорошо двигалась. Мы попросили испытуемую воображать, как будто она вот так вот толкает какой-то тяжелый шарик большим пальцем правой руки. То есть на фоне воображения, ну тут всякие споры о кинестетическом визуальном воображении мы отложим, мы даем просто общую инструкцию, можно дальше там с этим разбираться, по-разному делают. Мы видим увеличение вызванных моторных ответов в мышце, мышцы специфично в основном, и это в принципе тоже пытаются использовать и при инсульте, потому что ну, многие пациенты, если когнитивно-сохранные, способны воображать, на этом мы, собственно, и там, и BCI, все исследования, построены и пытаются это использовать в том числе для сочетания сейчас у нас вот ассистент будет показывать испытуемый движение пальцем да мы будем смотреть как ну, по сути, зеркальная система мозга будет влиять на увеличение возбудимости здесь тоже 
когда вы наблюдаете движение, вот, например, вот это движение, да, у нас будут задействованы, там, вот это мышца первая межкостная, там, и мышцы тендера, и мы действительно увели, увидим увеличение вызванных моторных ответов именно в этих мышцах, но, например, не в этой мышце, которая не задействована. Будем наблюдать по команде, я буду, простить двигать пальцем ассистента. И теперь начали. Теперь начали. Медленно, медленно такой движение. Медленно, медленно такой движение. Еще делаем, делаем. Еще делаем, делаем. Еще. 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 Ну, может быть, заметно, что рука движется чуть больше на фоне наблюдения движения. Хорошо. И теперь, наверное, наконец, если можно, перемотать вот последние где-то пять минут. Я просто тут не вижу. Мы покажем ритмическую стимуляцию. Это, слышите, щелчки по 1 Гц частотой. Ну, собственно, это ритмическая стимуляция 1 Гц. Просто проблема с тем, что вот как бы все терапевтические протоколы 1 Гц, они достаточно долгие. Ну, и, собственно, то, о чем я не сказала, конечно. Когда пытаются исследовать ритмическую стимуляцию, часто смотрят эффект одной сессии, но для терапевтического воздействия удивительно рядом нам часто недостаточно одной сессии, как для любого воздействия, поэтому а, тот вопрос, сколько сессий нужно, там минимум 10, но минимум 10 это волшебное число, 10 оно просто в клинике всегда волшебно существует, потому что часто пациенты лежат там не больше, чем две недели, а, но с ритмической стимуляцией вот 1 Гц это протокол около 20 минут, поэтому ну, чаще всего, если говорить технически, его ставят там, на определенную подставку, саму катушку, и мы просим человека стараться не двигать головой, параллельно дальше уже там параллельно с человеком можно разговаривать и так далее, то есть ну просто потому что это ну, довольно занудный метод, надо долго находиться в одном и том же положении, естественно, ключевой на самом деле в плане вот негативного воздействия ТМС, это, конечно, никакие не припадки, даже не шум в ушах, а просто в том плане, что Катушка – это довольно тяжелая штука. Если вы не очень отслеживаете, то можете давить катушкой на голову. Человек напрягает шею. Это может быть неприятно. То есть здесь просто за этим надо следить. И самый такой частый эффект неприятный от МС – это вот, там, легкая головная боль, потому что долго оставалась голова и шея в вынужденном, ну, таком, в вынужденном положении, достаточно напряженном. За этим надо следить, особенно с пациентами, просто чтобы им было комфортно. Или там, с добровольцами, особенно если это длительные эксперименты. С МС часто будут эксперименты 2-3 часа. Поэтому, конечно, после этого можно устать и может заболеть голова чисто. А тут это вынужденного положения шеи, за этим надо, это надо отслеживать. Коллеги, спасибо большое за ваше внимание. Если есть еще вопросы, я буду рада еще ответить, или мы тогда заканчиваем. Мария, спасибо вам большое за доклад. У меня есть вопрос. Вот скажите, пожалуйста, если участники нашего вебинара хотели бы попробовать метод ТМС, ну, как-то вживую, не просто посмотрев демонстрацию, где они могут это сделать, могут ли они прийти к вам в лабораторию в качестве, например, испытуемых или в качестве... Да, 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 без... ну, да, ну хорошо, давайте я тогда порекламирую наши там лаборатории и так далее, да, ну вот в, если говорить про высшую школу экономики, ну, сейчас даже несмотря на карантин у нас опять мы пока в таком, слава богу, не совсем карантинном режиме можно прийти на эксперименты. Если в Москве, да, пожалуйста, можно присоединяться. У нас есть, кстати, в вышке есть, например, такая штука, как как она называется, это стажировки, то есть для научных, педагогических и административных работников, только не из Москвы как раз, откуда угодно из России, не из Москвы, у нас есть даже оплачиваемые стажировки, если есть желание там приехать, просто это можно там от недели до, по-моему, 6 месяцев, можно как-то, если есть желание сотрудничать, то тоже можно нам написать на, на наши почты, они все есть в интернете, можно прийти добровольцем, можно, у нас бы 
бывают еще открытые, ну, не открытых дверей, но это где-то там раз в год. Так что да, пожалуйста, в о, о, клинике, конечно, ну, а в клинику можно направлять в о, федеральном центре мозга нейротехнологии. У нас действуют программы о, ВМП о, для пациентов до года после инсульта бесплатные, соответственно, сейчас есть места, можно направлять со всей России и программу ОМС, то есть можно зайти на сайт Федерального центра мозга и нейротехнологий, посмотреть условия, там, в общем, это бесплатная помощь реабилитационная для пациентов, которая активно оказывается, в том числе доступна и ТМС, и там огромное количество других методов, тоже, пожалуйста, можете направлять пациентов, это все можно сделать, да. Можете писать, если останутся какие-то вопросы, там, не знаю, наши статьи, можете найти нас на, в Google Scholar, можно писать мне на почту с какими-то вопросами, пожалуйста. Мария, можем ли мы сейчас ответить на крайний вопрос? Задает да, Александра. Конечно. Эффективен ли переносной ТМС для стимуляции на дому для лечения мигрени, например? Сильно ли различается порог стимуляции? Спасибо за вопрос. Да, актуальный вопрос. Есть, я не сказала, есть переносные аппараты, но у меня нет опыта, честно, относительно именно этого. Я поняла, это есть, ну, есть отдельная фирма, которая как бы вот позиционирует. Я, честно говоря, небольшой не фанат именно таких аппаратов для одной цели, но, в принципе, и при, вы видели, что в рекомендациях мигрени нет. Но исследований много, и я думаю, опять-таки, там ровно такая же история, как и с инсультом, про стратификацию пациентов, потому что там есть подходы стимуляции затылочной коры, есть подходы стимуляции двигательной коры, и при этом есть и активирующие, и тормозящие. Но конкретно вот этот аппарат, если я, насколько я помню, он рассчитан на то, чтобы вот в тот момент, когда возникает аура, то есть когда пациент, человек чувствует, что вот сейчас будет очередной приступ мигрени стимулировать, но я думаю, что это возможно. Если есть большое желание, его можно применять. Не думаю, что здесь есть какие-то проблемы относительно эффективности. Ну вот, вот смотрите, крупных рандомизированных исследований не было, если говорить про evidence-based. Но это не означает, что это неэффективно. Думаю, что вполне себе это один из подходов, который можно пробовать, его нужно исследовать. О, да. Вполне, но аккуратно, потому что любая стимуляция на дому, тут в момент использования пациентом, он, конечно, даже с TDCS, он достаточно тонкий. Мария, я вижу одну поднятую руку Наталья Николаевна Перепелятникова. Она может задать вам его устно. Наталья, подключите, пожалуйста, ваш микрофон. Наталья. Давайте, пока Наталья пытается подключить микрофон, еще появился вопрос в Q&A. Какие эффекты ТМС дает при воздействии на мозг во сне? О, спасибо, очень интересный вопрос. Тут, ну, <laughs> это можно отдельную лекцию про это читать. Давайте приведу несколько примеров просто, потому что э, ТМС во сне – большая тема. Э, ну, Во-первых, если говорить про двигательную кору, то у нас сильно изменяются, у нас уменьшаются кортикоспинальные, э, вызванные моторные ответы. Э, то, где, наверное, больше всего вот ТМС во сне применяют, есть направление исследования состояния сознания по ТМС и ЭГЭ. Мы про это совсем не говорили. Э, в, это разработки итальянской группы профессора Массимини. Сейчас их, ну, в том числе, правда, в основном при вегетативном там, состоянии, уже при нарушениях сознания клинических, пробуют применять в разных ну, местах. У нас в Москве в центре неврологии этим занимаются, активно в Финляндии. В общем, много где этим занимаются в Америке. Это исследование ТМС и ЭГ маркеров в состоянии сознания. И, конечно, начинали они не с пациентов, но ну, сейчас они продолжают исследование, а с а, спящих, не спящих людей. То есть там есть маркер, который, ну, грубо говоря, отражает а, индекс сложности ЭГ ответа на ТМС, то есть ответа на пертурбацию. Он так называется Perturbation Complexity Index. И идея в том, что у человека в... Раз, ну, в во сне, но не в РЭМ, а в других фазах, у него будет ответ на ТМС, на ЭГС, ответ, он достаточно локальный, он большой, локальный, несложный. Оценивают 
сложность этого ответа математически. И похожая картинка у нас наблюдается у пациентов, например, в вегетативном состоянии, и это уже, в принципе, это один из таких успешных маркеров ТМСЭГ, когда можно, пытаются предсказать, ну, то есть развести пациентов, вегетатиков и минимальное состояние сознания, когда это клинически сложно сделать, для предсказания выхода в пациенты из, из этого состояния. Еще во время сна, ну там много работ с попытками о, синхронизировать с, тоже с солятурной активностью, воздействием на долговременную память. Достаточно много работ, но если попробуете в практическом плане для человека, который, например, будет заниматься там, лечением депрессии или инсульта, во время засыпания, если у нас пациент или испытуемый засыпает, это мы это долго, скучно, нудно и у нас испытуемый там, через час засыпает, у нас будут меняться ответы, уменьшаться вызванные моторные ответы существенно, и это надо отслеживать, это тоже одно из функциональных состояний, человека надо будить, или мы это отслеживаем по ЕГЭ, потому что ответы у нас сильно меняются, это вот из таких практических соображений. Мария, спасибо вам огромное за вашу интереснейшую лекцию, за ваш интереснейший воркшоп. Предлагаю сейчас участникам и вам сделать пятиминутный перерыв, после чего к нам присоединится Станислав Забадаев, и мы продолжим нашу серию воркшопов уже на тему транскраниальной электростимуляции. Спасибо. Спасибо. Тогда, Луиза, я отключ... могу отключиться, могу не отключаться, уже послушать, да? Да, вы можете остаться в качестве слушателей, и будет очень даже, надеюсь, нашим участникам интересно. Возможно, вы с Станиславом после того, как пройдет его воркшоп, может быть, даже вступите в дискуссию, потому что это э, такие методы, то есть у вас транскриально-магнитная стимуляция, Станислав будет да, рассказывать про транскриминг электрическую стимуляцию. Вот в целом это может тоже состояться. А, дорогие Спасибо, участники, да, если у вас есть еще вопросы, вы можете их обратиться и написать в Q&A, и тогда наши лекторы смогут вам письменно дать ответ на ваш вопрос. Перерыв 5 минут. Мы продолжим в 13.35 по самарскому времени.
I'm happy to greet all of our listeners. So we are going back to our practical seminars or our workshop. And our next speaker will be Stanislav Zabodai, who is a representative of the NKS company from Russia. And he will uh, tell us about transcranial direct current stimulation, uh, so TDCS therapy, possibilities, methodology, and limitations of the method. Stanislav, we can see you, we can hear you really, really well. So over to you, Stanislav. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, just give me a minute to share my screen. Well, I would like to thank everybody for finding the time to attend this workshop. I do hope that um, it will be interesting to listen to and that uh, you'll be able to learn something new. My name is uh, Stanislav Zabadaev. I work uh, in the MKS company in Zelenograd, Russia. I would like to tell you a little bit about transcranial electric stimulation. In my talk, I will give you an overview of this uh, method, how to perform transcranial electric stimulation. I'll tell you about the methodology that we use, then I will do a short demo of our transcranial electric uh, simulation. I'll tell you a, bit, a little bit about the devices that we make, and I do hope that I'll be able to answer your questions at the end. Our workshop will be a little bit more technical. So those of you who have never performed uh, transcranial stimulation or those of you who have uh, just embarked on uh, this uh, field of research, I think um, you'll be interested uh, to listen to my presentation. Let me tell a little bit about the um, company that I work for. So the company is called Medical Computer System. We are located in Zelenograd. Zelenograd has been known as the Silicon Valley of Russia. And so Zelenograd is really well known for the microelectronics industry. So in my company, we work uh, on manufacturing different uh, devices for research and medical use. So we manufacture EEG devices and consumables, GS devices and consumables. We manufacture things for the space station, automatic. Or autom uh, automated, automated pacemaker, pacemakers. So we sell our products in Russia and abroad. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, transcranial electric, electrical stimulation. So transcranial electrical stimulation is different from magnetic stimulation. Transcranial electrical stimulation is a non-invasive brain stimulation using weak electric currents and the weak electric currents are delivered to the brain via the skull. So what we do, we use a magnetic coil. The magnetic coil is put on the patient's head. It induces a short term magnetic field pulse this magnetic field is usually focused and it is able to penetrate deep into the brain to induce electric, um, electric current in the brain tissue. Yeah. This can produce a certain neurological effect so due to the induction of electric current and the shift of electric activity in neurons. Navigational TMS provided
an increase in the, the development of uh, TMS itself, but the calls that are used in TMS are rather large, uh, therefore it is a bit harder to aim the magnetic fields to target a certain brain location that needs uh, stimulation. There is a certain gradient which is quite extensive, so we need to understand that um, TMS can be used to stimulate not just a certain brain area, but also all of the adjacent areas. Now we get back to electric stimulation. Here we use special electrodes and you put on the current generator, which uh, keeps uh, this current on by regulating the voltage, uh, potential differ differential between uh, electrodes or two or several electrodes. And now we change, we modulate neuronal activity of the brain and we get certain effects. This is what I'm going to tell you about later in greater detail in terms of uh, ability for academic application, they're also quite uh, wide. We can treat uh, depression uh, and also clinical applications. So uh, you can uh, uh, treat uh, strokes, uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson's uh, disease and such neurological manifestations that are directly linked with uh, some changes in the function of the brain. This procedure gives us pretty good uh, results compared with uh, a reference group. And for healthy people, we also try to use uh, TES, transcranial electrical stimulation. And current uh, studies show that it is possible to use this electric stimulation to increase the volume of the short-term operational memory, some other cognitive functions compared with uh, the reference group that didn't get the stimulation. It's hard to talk about a specific uh, universal device that would be commercially available that you could use uh, as a university student to turn on some device uh, on, on your head and, and improve your memory. This is not what we are talking about at the moment. This is just the initial stage of uh, some major studies. But in terms of the clinical uh, applications, there are relatively inexpensive devices based on that effect to, to treat migraine, for instance. This is a device with two electrodes that's uh, put on your forehead, then you, you stimulate the surface with uh, electric current of impulse form and it reports uh, the mitigation of pain. Uh, there are reports about the mitigation of pain and if we look at the previous uh, slide here, on the whole, electric uh, stimulations and it's DC stimulations using direct current. That's one when we have uh, one cathode and one anode and the current doesn't change during the procedure. Lately, there have been a number of uh, uh, studies with uh, alternative currency or random noise stimulation, also with uh, AC, with the spectrum distributed uh, uh, in some kind of uh, band. It's like noise uh, stimulation. For example, if you go from zero to 300 hertz, in this band, you see no effect when we uh, stimulate from 400 and up. We, you see uh, some effects that we didn't 
see in the past. This is what is also used today in terms of simulating with alternative current. You could, you know, uh, our bands so alpha, beta, gamma, theta, delta ones, and there's a separate study devoted to AC stimulations in the alpha range uh, of 10 hertz, and how the stimulation in this band would impact certain brain functions. In most cases, they of course use uh, DC uh, stimulation. That's a historical thing. DC stimulators are uh, quite uh, affordable and available, and you, you, it can be explained in terms of neurophysiology and anything else is something e exotic. There aren't that many publications about AC stimulation compared with DC one. As for the direct current, you can easily explain this effect in the following way. Neurons, much like any other living cell in the human body, has this certain transmembrane potential from minus 70 to minus 90 millivolts. This is the so-called uh, calm potential. When there's a nodal stimulation, when you put an electrode over the certain area of the blood, which is connected to the positive pole of the electric stimulator, then the tissues under that electrode get the gradient of uh, a direct electrical field, sort of, which sort of raises this uh, potential of the resting state. It used to be minus 70, it's, it moves to minus uh, 60, minus uh, 50, something like that, and in that sense, the resting state potential goes up for an entire group of neurons, and the adjacent neurons continue firing a specific uh, neuron by action potential, and at the moment when total transmembrane potential crosses a certain border, this neuron fires. If you increase the fragment of certain groups of neurons in the area under this anode uh, or electrode connected to the positive pole. In other words, if we need to excite a certain area of the brain, we do a nodal stimulation and vice versa. If you need to inhibit a certain portion of the brain, we introduce a cathode there and do the same. If we have two electrodes, if both of our electrodes are on your head, from that point of view, one part of the brain will be excited, another one will be inhibited. When you don't need this, we only want to excite a part of the brain, you can install a cathode where uh, there is no brain. In most cases, they put it over other areas. On your neck or even on your shoulder or even over your mammillary process. And this is how we get the effect after the stimulation with direct 
transparent. As for AC stimulation, in this slide, there's a relatively fresh article in the Nature Journal about the use of uh, AC stimulation for uh, to treat uh, depression. Both electrodes are on one's head and they, they compare two options, simulation with 10 and 40 hertz. And it's an interesting article, really, and there, there's a link in this slide. In the bottom left corner, there's a screenshot of the top of the article in clinical neurophysiology and overview on transcranial stimulation with DC. And back then, there was a certain uh, decision. Uh, there, there was a summary that in some cases, uh, in some cases, DC works well, and some are doubtful. It definitely works when you need to treat uh, different types of pain, migraine. It works quite well for depression. All sorts of uh, dependencies and addictions. And this stimulation Uh, leads to generation of endorphins in human body. Thus, there's this replacement of this electric stimulation using electric stimulation instead of uh, smoking or drugs addiction. And this is how they're trying to deal with it. Now, uh, this is about how this works, and now a few words about technical details where manufacturers of both equipment and the electrodes, let me give you more details about it. What kind of electrodes can be used for TES? Usually it's stainless steel or special uh, and uh, conducting a rubber and you put it into salt solution and then put it on one's head. And lately you can use to the stimulation and registration at the same time. It can be done consecutively or simultaneously from the same electrodes. Uh, Chloride uh, silver based uh, electrodes that are currently used for EEG for recording. It's what we use, uh, trying to use this AG CL electrodes. And in terms of uh, science, uh, there's no uh, compromise. It's all about uh, silver chloride. and. Uh, silver chloride based electrodes can be used for both, but as opposed to stainless steel, uh, silver chloride is first of all a salt, and chloride is uh, qu quite active. And when we uh, add gel, uh, current conducting gel. or some kind of electrolyte, and there's this association in the solution of uh, silver chloride into its components, you get ions of uh, silver and uh, chlorine. And my slide, there are two uh, pictures on the left and right hand side, electrodes before and after transcranial uh, stimulation. The top electrode was connected to the anode and the bottom one to cathode. What happens when we stimulate uh, one's brain is DC? On the anode, 
silver oxidizes and then uh, it uh, interacts with uh, hydroxyl group ions and you get this residue uh, silver hydroxide which is unstable and that it uh, dissolves into silver oxide and hydrogen and silver oxide is uh, stable enough and it has this dark gray color that you can see at the top uh, right in the top right corner uh, and you get this gray color and the opposite there's an opposite situation with the cathode uh, free ions of uh, silver are restored recovered back to silver and uh, are left as a residue on the conductor and Looking at two pictures, you can see that uh, the anode uh, oxidized and there was recovery of silver on the cathode. There's more silver actually there. The problem is uh, when we use a GC stimulation with uh, significant currents, usually we use two milliampers, but but they also, that's in the uh, scientific articles and they use different electrodes. Usually it's the area of 35 uh, square centimeters, so fairly large uh, items and they use uh, two MA uh, current. Um, but it's quite powerful, but it's not uh, silver chloride. And what might happen, and in our case, we use these uh, uh, silver chloride uh, electrodes and I chose on my device TC stimulation and this electrode uh, lasted for no more than three minutes but your stimulation needs to run for 30 minutes. This is what happened to uh, silver chloride electrode, its impedance, it, its impedance went up, it no longer conducts current, you cannot use for stimulation anymore because there's no silver at, at the top. So uh, silver chloride is not really useful here when we register EEG, there are very uh, insignificant uh, currents of nano amperes and but uh, it oxidizes slower, but here we oxidize it on purpose. What can we do in that situation? Some manufacturers like Neuroelectric claim that their uh, silver chloride electrodes can be used for up to 10 hours. It depends on the level of your DC on the power of your DC. If you use uh, AC, then uh, our electrode uh, oxidizes uh, half a period and then for another half of the period it uh, is recovered. So it works very well for AC but not for DC. If you uh, use strong currents, the electrodes will quickly degrade. You need to use either very small currents of micro amperes of 100, uh, 200 MA yes. up to 500, and then it will be uh, below. There will be oxidation, of course, if you use the same electrode, but the entire overall lifetime of the electrode will go up. Let me give you an example. We have clients who work with uh, children and they use our standard EG electrodes, the NTC electrodes. And uh, the diameter of the chloride silver disc is only about six millimeters. Therefore, when they use 100 microampere stimulation with direct current, so they noticed that the 
electrodes have shown degradation in about or after about 20 hours of uh, stimulation. So they were quite long lasting. The rest, when it comes to the lifetime of an electrode, it comes down to the type of current used, the surface area of the electrode, whether it is uh, coated with the chlorine silver paint or whether the paint is integrated into it. But however it may be, if you need to use a direct current for stimulation, it's better to use either stainless steel electrodes or electricity conducting rubber. If you need to use alternate current stimulation, then uh, silver electrodes can be used to acquire EEG data. There is another thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to the structure. All types of electrical stimulators are quite simple. A uh, stimulator is essentially a direct current generator. So a stimulator needs to maintain a preset voltage, let's say, a generator works at a certain power load. And what is this power load? Basically, this is um, trans electric impedance. If the electrode is not connected well, then the impedance will be higher. Therefore, an electrode might become dysfunctional, generate uh, won't be able to increase to increase the charge and therefore all of the electrodes will stop functioning. If you use, uh, let's say, a regular stimulator, let's say a Chinese made stimulator, it will work for some time, but not all of them can deal with electrical overloads. So what we are talking about the DC generators, they usually have um, a maximum voltage threshold. So in order to estimate whether the electrodes have been placed correctly and whether the following uh, stimulation will be successful, you can do that with an uh, impedance meter. If let's say we're using DC stimulation, just like um, in my picture that you show on the screen, say one anode, one cathode. And if you calculate the sum of all of the impedance values for all of the electrodes, it should be less than the value that you can see on the screen. We can use Ohm's law to perform this calculation. And if let's say the maximum voltage of a generator is is 30 volts, then impedance uh, should be less than 15 kilovolts for two milliamperes. It is quite easy to reach this value if you're using small surface area electrodes, then you need uh, to pre-treat the screen with abrasive scrubs there are different market options available. Then you need to apply a conducting gel or paste. Or you can use open sponges soaked in saline. Well, this is the most common way to apply the electrodes, but I believe that uh, gel is more beneficial. It's can maintain its shape in an easier manner. It doesn't dry up so quickly. 
And especially if you're talking about long-term stimulation, let's say 30 minutes stimulation, the saline solution might dry up. Therefore, there will not be a tight contact between the electrode and the skin, which in turn will lead to a change in local current density. Let's say if uh, a cotton sponge dries at its edges, it will not be very comfortable for your patients. Transcranial electric stimulation is sometimes reported to, to cause a prickling, a prickling sensation in patients. And I've even heard that some people use a method to determine the maximum value, the maximum allowable power of the current to be used for each patient. I've heard that some researchers gradually increase the current voltage and they ask the patient to tell them when they start to feel prickling. So if a patient reports a prickling sensation, then they decrease the voltage of the current. So basically it is the trial and error methods. And that is something that uh, we've seen in a clinical setting. But if we're talking about research, of course, we need uh, to ensure reproducibility. If the research uh, specifies two milliamperes, then each subject should receive two milliamperes. So that wouldn't be acceptable. Let me apologize for this slide. Uh, it is hand-drawn. I didn't have enough time to make it. Here. There is a misconception that seems to be quite widespread. Some people believe that if you connect to galvanically decoupled current generators, then you might be able to instantaneously stimulate the brain in the same fashion that uh, you would have achieved using two separate electrodes. Well, this is um, not true at all, and it is not true because, uh, well, there is the Ohm's law, as you can see on this picture here. The researchers wanted to stimulate an area of the brain located under the F three electrodes using the 1020 system with a contralateral localization of the cathode. The second generator was to be placed under the T6 electrode before the memory process on the contralateral side. Had both of these generators run independently, uh, then we would have had one anode, one cathode, one input, one output area. But the minute we connect the second generator, then these generators become galvanically coupled through the patient's skull. So if you talk about the sensors, the sensor will show you that uh, there is a current flow and uh, it will seem fine on the surface, but what will happen in reality is the redistribution of the current. And this redistribution of the current will be completely unpredictable. For instance, the first generator will generate the currents for the electrode above it and some of the current will be directed elsewhere. So the anode cathode connection based on the voltage of the current might lead to a situation when the stimulation will either worsen as in this example that you see on the screen. In this instance, we wanted to use 60 milliamperes for stimulation, 60 milliamperes is uh, not a significant value, but we wanted to use 60 
milliampere to uh, stimulate a certain brain area, but in reality, because of the second generator, we simulated this location using 37.5 milliamperes and there was another example when we wanted to use 30 milliamperes but because of the second generator we ended up using seven milliamperes which is pretty much negligible so i believe that it would be pertinent to use just one generator which should be commutated to several electrodes so if you need to stimulate, let's say, F3 and T6, then you can connect the anodes to F3 and T6, and you place a cathode um, more remotely. That is another technical issue that I wanted to raise. In this part of my talk, I would like to demonstrate our NVX 36T device. You see the list of technical characteristics of the device on the screen. It uses one current generator that can be connected uh, to three channels. It can be used for flexible EEG acquisition. So it is a 32 channel EEG stimulation with direct current, alternate current, direct noise stimulation. And you know, a lot of researchers now can use both DC and AC stimulation which are applied at the same moment in time. Let me show you what the stimulator management software looks like. It is called uh, Tito's Expert. So using these interface you can control inter electrode impedance uh, and let me show you how it works so especially taking into account all of the constraints uh, that i had talked about let's say we wanted to stimulate fp1 let's put an anode to fp1 and a cathode to fp2 here we can also evaluate Earth impedance. This is just a schematic. We didn't use it with the real subjects. That's not something that we need for the demo, but if we want to use a direct current stimulation between FP1 and FP2, then we just uh, do the addition of 10 kilo ohms to 10 kilo ohms. Therefore, we have the impedance set at uh, 20 kilo ohms. Therefore, we cannot use full, uh, 4 milliamperes to stimulate the brain. So, this is the impedance meter mode. So, here we can take we can do EEG acquisition, and this uh, software is very simple, very user-friendly. So we launch EEG uh, acquisition, and the data is uh, sent directly online. So if you have a um, client software that is able to extract data, So basically what we're getting is raw data from EEG. Then direct current stimulation. Let's say I set this uh, option that I had mentioned previously. So direct current stimulation, one anode, one cathode. So we can connect the anodes here and the cathodes here. And we can place 
them like so on the patient. So we put on the EG cap, apply the gel and so on and so forth. Then we select the current so we can use the drop down menu or we can enter it manually. Let's say 1000 milliampere. So there is also the soft mode, so the soft start mode that is required so to give more comfort to our patients and so we do not discommode them. When we use the DC stimulation, if we were to give our patients all of the voltage at once, so then the patient will see a sharp burst of light. So, so there is a very sharp shift in potentials. So it's not something intrinsically bad, but it is a bit uncomfortable, so we can increase the voltage gradually. So I've started the stimulation. You see that the voltage is on the rise. There is a cyclogram on the bottom, which is showing us, which is showing us a, co a correlation between the current used and the inter-electrode impedance. So the software monitors the situation, measures uh, approximately 21 kilo ohms under the electrode. If let's say there is a break in the electrode connection, the overload alert will pop up on the screen, uh, which is needed to ensure the quality of the procedure. We are using long-term stimulation that uh, is absolutely mandatory. Following this, so we, when the simulation is complete, we need to evaluate the quality of the simulation. So all of the data is uploaded so, to a file that we can use so, to evaluate the quality. There is also a sham mode. That is something that is needed for clinical trials or for research. So that, so we trick the patient let's say there is no stimulation of the brain but the patient believes so that so they are receiving the stimulation if you're using the sham mode we also have a gradual uh, voltage increase so the patient will feel a prickling sensation and after that the stimulation stops as you can see the generator is off right now and then at the end you will have a certain period again when uh, we do apply direct current so that the patient believes that they have undergone a stimulation procedure. I see that I do not have a lot of time left, maybe about uh, 10 minutes or so, so let me finish um, with the software demo and then I'll be answering your questions. Okay, I think it's pretty much clear when it comes to DC stimulation, let us switch to AC stimulation. Let's say we want to replicate the same mode that I showed you in this Nature article, let's say F3, F4 contacted to, to the anode, see that connected to the ca um, cathodes, and we use uh, two milliamperes in total, so F3, F4, Anode C is a cathode, so sine 10 hertz. Let's say uh, I set time at one minute. So that is how it will be visually represented. Again, we have a gradual increase in current voltage and we'll be using AC stimulation. Here is the peak current and uh, right next to it is the recalculated effective current value. And uh, in order to evaluate the quality of the procedure, the software will measure the real current value. See, I switch off the F4 electrode, so all of the current is going through CZ10. But of course, during the procedure, we need to ensure that we have approximately the same current value in all of the electrodes. So the software 
showing you an increase in the voltage and so the voltage value remained the same at the, in accordance with the preset value. In the top right hand corner, you see the generator control window which shows you what's happening with the generator. This is the signal that the patient receives as a stimulating signal. So using this window, uh, you can uh, monitor uh, it. We also have the soft and the sham modes for the AC stimulation in the same manner we had for the DC stimulation. Also, we can select uh, different impulse shapes, uh, for instance, some square, ramp, trap, random, let me show you the random simulation, which I had mentioned uh, previously here. You can select uh, the range uh, for the random noise filtration and the rest will be the same. Let's see what it's gonna look like. So that's how it looks. And there's a signal right now, which uh, looks like noise. Uh, there's this random noise simulation. You can upload uh, a file from elsewhere. You have a substandard form of impulse. You can upload another file and play it, even if it's music. This is a, a song of one of the Russian uh, uh, music uh, bands and let's see whether this will be efficient. Let's see whether this uh, treatment uh, will be efficient. Uh, in top right hand corner, you see uh, the data for the music. It doesn't mean that you sort of upload music directly into the brain. It's all compensated by the brain capacity. This will be the analog stimulation by accidental noise, but it's just for demonstration of what this mode can do. And this is the alternative current monopolar stimulation ACM. And here we, we introduce some offset and you can set the peak current. Let me turn this off. And this is how it looks like. Peak. The peak will be at 500 micro ampere, and here the offset is one micro ampere. So there's a separate. a mode of uh, setting a profile for double line study when we need to uh, light data not just for the patient but also for the nurse that's going to perform the stimulation. And there's also the mode of sham stimulation. We, for example, there's this password, one, two, three, four, five, to save it. Then we select the name for of the profile for double line stimulation. Let's say it's depression. We save it. And then when we select a profile, It's double blind, and this is what we see. The nurse came 
and she was told to use this profile for this patient. She sees uh, SE to channel four, F4 to number six, and uh, CZ to number 10. You control the impedance and then you turn on the stimulation. And now st the stimulation is on. At the top, you get the time left until the end of uh, stimulation. The uh, nurse doesn't really know whether the real stimulation is on or not. I um, took off CZ electrode. If it was uh, not well connected, she will see that uh, alarm. So I basically ran out of time. It's five minutes left until the end of the workshop. Uh, I don't want to uh, hold on uh, too much of your time, and I will be ready to take your questions. Thank you, Stanislav, for your interesting workshop. There's time left in the schedule. If you want to show us something else, we still have a chance. There's a question from one of the users. Is this equipment certified for the use and treatment of people in the Russian Federation? What kind of electrodes do you use? What is their area and resistance? And how do you compensate this resistance? In terms of certification, as I said, this specific uh, device is, uh, use, is designed for scientific research. And in the Russian Federation, if you work in uh, an R&D institution, not a medical institution, by law, you don't have to have such a certificate. We, don't, we do not have such a medical certificate. If you want to use the device for medical purposes, for therapy, it, you are not allowed to do that. It doesn't work for medical applications. You need to look for analogs uh, with med medical certi certifications. And there are quite a few uh, devices for galvanizing. You can uh, try searching for galvanizing micro polarization, which work as something similar to DC simulation in terms of safety. I can uh, cover a couple of points on uh, safety. In the Russian Federation, there is no special standard for transcranial electric brain stimulations. Uh, there are some uh, standards for uh, situation, stimulation of the nervous system, but there uh, the current is uh, stronger than those that we use here. Here it's up to five uh, milliamperes, and but you have to understand this is uh, to stimulate the brain, and for those who are going to use it, you need to realize that these electrodes are put on the brain, not below. The most dangerous part would, here would be heart. And in terms of safety, if you place these electrodes uh, between your hands and put on maximum, most probably nothing would happen, but there are details here. According to electric, Encephalography, the leaking of uh, current in the circuits, uh, it's uh, around 50 microamperes, and here we're talking about milliamperes. For encephalography, uh, the current of above uh, 50 microamperes, it's dangerous for the patient. It's when it goes through the heart accidentally. As for regular everyday standards of electrical safety, there's so called uh, circuit breaker, and in children's rooms, 
you install such devices for five milli ampere. If a child sticks fingers uh, into the wall socket, uh, five milli ampere is uh, too much for fibrillation and the heart might stop. So you have to understand that if you use the device for transcranial electrical stimulation, it has to be used uh, exactly for that. To answer your question, there is no special certificate for that device that we don't plan to get it because it will take uh, time and money and we think that it doesn't really make sense. Here in Russia there are only a few people who can use this methodology. So in terms of magnetic stimulation there will be more but two very few specialists in terms of electric stimulation. Everyone is afraid of it and they don't know how to use it. We're analyzing the market and after that we'll be making decisions regarding whether we register it or not as medical device. Now in terms of electrodes for electrical stimulation, there will be electrodes of uh, 22 millimeters and the area here is around 3, 3.7 square centimeters in terms of uh, current density, you need to be careful about that. I recommend to, to go to Neuroelectric's uh, website. They describe very well the allowable uh, current uh, density, which ones you can use in the clinic, which ones you can use for scientific purposes. Uh, they believe that it's permissible to have a uh, current density of 2 uh, milliamperes to 35 centimeters if you use uh, large rubber electrodes, the, the density of the current is uh, very low. It's uh, 0 .00, 0 0 0 0.06 uh, milliampers for one centimeter. I haven't uh, shown it to you, but in our device, you can use 32 electrodes That's high density uh, transcranial stimulation. Instead of using one anode, one cathode, we place one electrode, one, one anode near C3 electrode and surrounded with many cathodes. In this way, we localize the stimulation area and allows us to impact with better precision the area that we need. In that sense, you need to use electrodes of a smaller uh, size. And then uh, your density of your current will be limited. In every case, you have to be careful as you make your calculations and as you get uh, feedback from the patient uh, in terms of uh, unpleasant feelings. And uh, if we talk about impedance, when we use uh, electrodes that we offer, here much depends on how you prepare your skin. In our case, it's uh, it's its diameter is twenty two millimeters, and you can get half kilo ohm per electrode, total of one to two kilo ohms. But but before that, you need to prepare the skin, remove the top layer of the epidermis. And 
we need to use special conducive uh, paste. And it's, it's okay because you sort of glue the electrode to the skin and we can be sure that it won't slide during the stimulation itself. I hope I answered all the questions. Well, we have one more question. Do you use a high definition protocol HD to DCS? Uh, there's an opportunity in the program to offer this kind of uh, protocol. Let me show you what I was talking about a few minutes ago. We have uh, uh, electron C3, channel 9. Here we have 24 channels. And the remaining eight channels are not here, but we can turn them on. And let me show you how it's done from 25th until this, until. 30 second. You, we put our anode at C3 and we surround it with uh, cathodes and Let me make some changes in uh, our adjustments to show you how it works during the stimulation. And keep the mode as supposed to be, and uh, this is HD. HDS, not DC, but alternative current. And this is how it looks like, allowing us to localize this uh, stimulation area as compared to a situation where it would be uh, in C3 and cathode uh, would be located uh, contralaterally. But how much uh, current will you? get inside and some of some of it will go a short way through the skin and some of it will penetrate the brain and the, the more confidence then something will reach the brain the more current we set any more questions i have a question to you to compare something. You have shown the method of transcranial electric situation. In the previous workshop, we were talking about magnetic stimulation, but talking about clinical applications. How would you like, compare the use of these two methods in different situations? It's hard for me to say, to give you a definitive answer, both methods have one of the same goal, both magnetic and electrical stimulation could treat similar neurological states. These are different ways to stimulate the brain. For example, if we need uh, to work with post-stroke patients, DC stimulation might help in terms of increasing the uh, plasticity. We shake everything up and it helps neurons to sort of restore. This is indirect effect. Both of these methods uh, do pretty much the same. Uh, it's just the delivery method that is different. 
in terms of commercial availability, we have to say that magnetic uh, stimulators are more expensive than the electrical ones. A regular magnetic stimulator would cost several million rubles per unit. Um, a Russian devices like that, for example, for galvanizing, uh, they are cheaper, even though they have a different purpose. They can be bought at, uh, I don't know, 10,000 rubles. They are simple, but they work. Thank you very much. I would like to remind our listeners that you can visit Stanislav's virtual booth. You can ask him questions if you have any. So the expo will be open today, starting from 6 p.m. Samara time. So do visit Stanislav's booth at the virtual expo. Thank you very much, Stanislav. And now I will make a couple of announcements for our listeners. So we will see you back here at 4.30 p.m. Samara time. We will have a very interesting panel, panel uh, discussion with uh, Karen Rommelfanger, um, Sliman Ben Smaya, Michael Lebedev, Jonathan Walpo, and Sing Chen. We will talk about so neural, uh, neural implants, we will discuss Neuralink, but not only. Then tonight, after the panel discussion, we will have the last day of our virtual poster exhibit and our virtual expo. And the Neurobar will be open tonight, starting from 8 p.m. Right now, we're going to show you the announcement for our panel discussion, and we'll see you back here at 4.30 p.m. So long.
Kazakh story. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. English channel. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We're going to launch a really cool panel discussion in about three minutes. Uh, Alexei, could you please make an announcement so that people do not disconnect? Well, in about Three minutes, we will have the so-called Elon Musk show, but it is not really. But so what we're gonna have, we're gonna have 
a panel of experts who will be discussing neural implants. Well, first of all, we will discuss Neuralink by Elon Musk, and we will discuss Elon Musk and all of the latest advancements. But before we do that, we will tell a little bit what we're going to do tomorrow. Today is not the last day of the conference. Of the conference. So tomorrow at 10 a.m. we're going to launch the Brain IO Hackathon. We are not entirely sure what's going to happen tomorrow, but it will be a hackathon, and the hackathon will be interrupted uh, by a couple of workshops. So then we will have several open lectures. De uh, delivered by very famous scientists. And Alexei, we cannot hear you because your microphone is off. Alexei's microphone is off. Sorry, the mic is off. There's no sound. Oh. Sorry, everybody. I was just told that my mic was off, so let me repeat what I've been saying. So we're going to have three renowned scientists and uh, myself. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of neurophysiology, about the discovery of BCI, and then you will have uh, three lectures by great scientists. Professor Shiba will tell about non-invasive BCI technologies for restoring functionality to paralyzed patients. Simon Bismaya will tell us uh, what can we do to restore perception to paralyzed limbs. And we'll also have a lecture by Jonathan Walpole, who will deliver a lecture about what it is that uh, BCIs will be capable of doing in the future. So we will have a hackathon, like we mentioned before. Then at 6 p.m., we will have the finals of uh, Neurotech Cup. We will have eight teams competing for the award. And after that, we will have a, an award ceremony at 8 p.m. And uh, all of the winners will receive their awards. Yeah, yes, we already mentioned the workshops so we will show you workshops uh, during daytime hours when we're going to have a break so today it's not just going to be the panel discussion, but so you will also have an opportunity to visit our virtual expo if you wish to do so. And then, of course, uh, those of you who have officially registered on our website, you could visit the Neurobar. And now it is the time to give the floor to Yannick Roy, who will be the moderator of the panic discussion of the panel discussion. Hello.
general. So um, I do have a stellar panel with me today, uh, starting with Jonathan Wolpa, Mihail Lebedev. We do have Karen uh, Rommel Fanger, and uh, we have Xing Chen, I think, who's running late a little bit, who should join us um, any minute. And we, unfortunately, we did lose our fifth member of the panel, uh, Sliman Benz Maya. Um, unfortunately, uh, he had to attend a defense of the student for a thesis online. So that's unfortunate. So we'll be the four, the four panelists and myself to discuss um, the announcement neural implants. So a little bit on myself. My name is Yannick Roy. I've been in the, the BCI field for a bit more than a decade. Um, Co-founded Neurotech X five years ago. Neurotech X is an international neurotech community with different initiatives. Um, the, the mission of the organization is to facilitate the advancement of neurotech. It's a very bold and ambitious mission. Um, we do that by addressing three different pillars, community, education, and innovation. So the thesis is that if we connect people online through physical events of different sizes, some are more scientific, some are more, some are more ends on, um, workshops, tutorials, lecture, conferences, hackathons, hack nights, uh, small gathering, neural bars, all these kinds of things. Uh, if we connect people, we provide educational resources, um, knowledge, whether it's scientific or more business, uh, more technical, once again, and then once people are connected, they have the knowledge, then they, go, they can go and have an impact on the field, whether it's by joining company, starting one, tackling a challenge that remain unsolved, um, and all these things. So we see Neurotech X as being a funnel, a platform. We do have several initiatives. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more, neurotechx.com. So with no further ado, I would like to uh, invite this, the, the, the speakers, the panelists, uh, to open their camera, their microphone. Um, we'll just go with a quick round of table of first introduction. Um, the rule of engagement today, uh, the idea is very, it's going to be free flowing. Uh, it's a discussion. It's not a structured presentation. There is no slides, no PowerPoint. Um, the idea here is to have a casual conversation, uh, go a bit deeper on some scientific uh, aspects, some of the neuroethics aspect, um, some on the more um, science fiction and where we're going with the future of the field and what it means for, for society. So it should be a fun ride. Uh, if you have any question, please mention that in the Q&A in the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring that and we'll be asking our panelists all the questions that you have. Uh, it's a unique opportunity because we have very, very smart people that have been in the field for quite a while with different perspectives. So I think that's going to be a very interesting discussion. So uh, I would like to maybe ask uh, the panelists to their name, affiliation, uh, background, the work that they, uh, they're working in the field, and maybe one exciting project that they are currently working on uh, at the moment. So, Dr. Jonathan Wolpa, do you mind starting off and kicking off this, uh, this round of presentation? Uh, you're muted at the moment. Yes, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm uh, thank thankful for the opportunity. Um, I'm John Wolpa. I'm the uh, director of the National Center for Adaptive Neurotechnologies, which is an NIH-funded uh, center um, based at the uh, Stratton VA Hospital, Veterans Administration Hospital in Albany. It also has uh, two other sites, um, Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston and Washington University in St. Louis, where major parts of uh, um, the center take place, the work of the center. So. Uh, I'm a neurologist by training a long time ago, so I'm sort of a 1980s era neurologist. Uh, I've, since the last 40 years, been doing um, basic and clinical research in animals and humans in neuroscience. Um, very much interested uh, initially in um, plasticity, uh, specifically the base of learning and memory. And uh, for that reason, and a little unexpectedly at the time, I started studying uh, plasticity in the spinal cord, uh, and that's developed very well. It worked out very well. Uh, somewhat later, uh, I, my interest in BCI was piqued by an inquiry from actually IBM Corporation, um, and I put it together with some old EEG studies I'd done, and that developed, and uh, they really it developed as separate fields for quite a while. Um, and then the BCI field, obviously, as people know, exploded starting in the 1990s, uh, and it's developed from there. Um, I've been very struck by the fact that my two interests have come together pretty much inextricably now, and I, I, they're really basically the same interest. So um, I'm really excited about the prospects of the field. I think you have a fair perspective on it uh, as it's developed over the years, and I'm happy to be here. 
Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Volpa. Uh, Karen, do you want to go next? Sure. Thanks for, for having me here. Um, I was thrilled to be invited to this. And of course, I can't say no to Yanni because we have a old, old friendship where we work together a lot on neurotech and ethics. So I'm, I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, I'm a neurotech ethicist. I'm trained in neuroscience and in ethics. And I work at value conflicts related to emerging tech. I direct the neuroethics program at Emory University at the Center for Ethics, where I also hold faculty appointments in the Department of Neurology and Psychiatry in the School of Medicine. Um, I specialize in cross-cultural perspectives on the brain and the mind. And much of my work is with an organization called the International Brain Initiative, which is a consortium of seven large scale national level brain research projects. And with them, I co-chair the neuroethics working group that helps to implement neuroethics strategy and innovation into those projects. I um, also am a neurotech ethics consultant and strategist, and I work with neuro innovators to understand their ethics roadblocks and work with them to co-create tools to overcome them. And I do this with transnational government organizations like the OECD, local governments like uh, organizations like the NIH. And these days I devise ways to facilitate cross sectoral collaborations with the private sector in neuroethics and innovation. Awesome, thank you very much for being in the panel. Definitely that angle, That's especially. Cool. Last, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, during the panel. So I'll end over to uh, Mikhail Lebedev or Misha. Uh, hello, my name is Mikhail Lebedev, and I am currently a scientific director at the Center of um, Bioelectrical Interfaces at the High School of Economics, Moscow, Russia. So um, I have a mega grant from the government of Russian Federation for facilitating the development of brain machine interfaces in Russia. So this is going very well. Before that, I, um, I started my scientific career uh, in motor control in humans. Then I shifted to monkey neurophysiology, then to invasive brain machine interfaces in monkeys. So, and uh, hopefully uh, I will also restart this work in, in Russia, like invasive animal research in monkeys. So, and, uh, um, and, and also, since we are talking about Neuralink now, I, I know some people uh, who work at Neuralink and uh, I worked with them before. Perfect. So as you can see, we do have a lot of experience on the panel. Um, but before we dive into the meat of the panel discussion, let's start with an easy question because we're obviously talking about Neuralink and Elon Musk. Uh, he tends to, pre to project us in the future, sometime in a far future that uh, might be coming soon. Um, so quick question for the panel. Um, working in a futuristic field, do you watch or read or consume science fiction? And if so, do you have any recommendation for the sci-fi out there? Uh, could be brain, obviously, if it's brain related, even the better. Uh, but any good recommendation for science fiction fan out there? Well, do you wanna, or Mihail? Uh, so uh, I used to do this when I was a kid, uh, so I, I read some science fiction, so I, I, I know what it is about, but right now I, I do not read <laughs> because I simply do not have time and uh, th this may be a little bit boring compared to the work we do. Yes, yes, I agree. I read science fiction a good deal as a kid, but right now for me science is much more fun than science fiction. So uh, I, I've seen some of the, um, the, the recent movie with uh, Matthew McGonaghy, which was I mainly liked for the adventures part of it, uh, though I gather the science is, is fairly um, realistic and they had good advisors. But basically, real science for me is much more exciting than science fiction at this point. I think those answers are kind of cheating, but OK, those are good. Actually, those are really good, good answers. Um, I also feel like I, that I don't have time really to, to read a lot of things I'd like to read for fun. 
Um, but I read a lot of fantasy when I was younger. And actually we, um, I used to watch things like Black Mirror, um, but then it just, it made me think too much before I went to bed and so I couldn't sleep. So I had to stop. But what we did was actually do an analysis for our neuroethics program. And some of our students did a neuroethics analysis of the, all these Black Mirror episodes. And we published that in a little book. So let me know if you're interested in that. And you can also find it on www.theneuroethicsblog.com. Yeah, I should also say in, in response to Karen's comment that I mean, the little I've seen and heard sort of indirectly or even directly about science fiction, it's really very frustrating because it's either very unrealistic or very naive or just plain wrong or, or just basically dull. Um, so it, it's kind of frustrating to read it um, and look at, you know, contrast it with the reality. And the reality is basically a lot more exciting, a lot more innovative, um, at least in the field, in a field that I don't know much about, I might be able to enjoy it. But in this field, I definitely don't enjoy it. <laughs> You're being too, I, I, too... I watched the movie about Avatar, though. This one I watched. Yeah. Yes, me too. <laughs> So you're being too critical of this, uh, the science fiction. So sci-fi authors uh, should reach out to, uh, to you guys to make sure that they are a bit more grounded well, in reality and yeah. science. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. So um, let's start with a bit of a recap, a fast track. So uh, Mihail, you, you've been writing a lot of reviews and kind of like the last years in the evolution of the field. Uh, do you mind starting with kind of like a bit of a fast track, nothing super structured, but just for you, what is the like the last, not necessarily 100 years, but 50 years, let's say something like that. What's the evolution that led us to neural implants that we have today that we're starting to talk about uh, implanting in people and automated surgery um, for consumer, let's say, not just the medical that we're starting to talk about that. So do you mind just giving us the two, the yeah, three minutes yeah. fast track history? Yeah, sure, sure. I can even try to share my screen. One second, I will see if I can do this. Ah, okay. Okay. So I will skip through this. Uh, I'll skip through this in Elon Musk thing. So, so uh, pr probably describing the whole history would be um, would be longer than uh, uh, two minutes. But but I would like to attract your attention to something that you may not uh, know well about. That in the late sixties and in, in the seventies in in the Soviet Union there was work on brain machine interfaces and. Uh, Victor Gurfinkel um, published a book on bioelectrical control. Where, uh, if, if you read this book, it is unfortunately in Russian, but it describes bioelectrical systems that are um, controlled by uh, AMG activity uh, or heart muscle activity, or maybe by electrical activity of the brain. So, uh, like, if you look inside the book, then you see this, uh, the first Soviet um, myelectrical prosthesis of the hand, and you can see that it is being uh, uh, tested in a very important uh, um, role. So, probably at Neurobar, uh, we can talk about this more. Uh, then um, so I'll just mention some some systems that they describe. So for example, they describe this um, bioelectrical control of a, um, of the ventilator for for the lungs. So here, electro EMG activity is um, registered from intercostal muscles, and then uh, this is the signal to control this. Um, Ventilator. Also, they thought about um, uh, the control of uh, the delivery of the anesthetic um, and it's, it, it, um, like pharmacological agents that uh, control the level of um, anesthesia. So here they record the uh, activity of the brain, and uh, uh, this gives you an objective measure of um, like the depth of anesthesia. They also thought about uh, these um, uh, 
uh, controlling the movement of the electrodes uh, uh, when you want to record from the brain. And uh, so, so many, many ideas uh, were there. So, um, yes, I will, I will stop sharing. So, but, but also, of course, um, there were um, some experiments in the 60s on uh, bioelectrical feedback, neurofeedback. Um, Camille and Sherman, they did the G recordings and uh, uh, they had uh, trained the epileptic patients to suppress the epileptic activity. Then uh, in 1963, uh, Gray Walter had a very good demonstration where um, he connected the motor cortex of his patients to a slide project and they moved the slides. He didn't call it a brain-machine interface, but it was basically brain-machine interface. Then um, uh, in um, non-invasive um, interfaces, we had developments uh, uh, f uh, from, um, I think Jack Vidal was the first to introduce this idea in, um, of a brain-computer interface, and his interface was mostly based on um, uh, visual evoked potentials. Then uh, on the invasive front, uh, there um, the, the were demonstrations by Miguel Nicolelis, um, Andy Schwartz, uh, then John Donahue. They competed a lot, and uh, because of this competition, very quickly some demonstrations were made uh, in uh, Rhesus macaques. They recorded ensembles of uh, cortical cells. And the, like in, among these demonstrations, demonstrations of a monkey controlling a robotic arm that can reach and grasp, then interface for locomotion, and um, also a sensorized interface where a monkey reaches with a virtual hand and it receives, um, receives artificial tactile sensations that are formed by electrical stim stimulation of the um, somatosensory cortex. So this is my part, and I'm sure uh, Jonathan and Karen can, can, can add more, more to this. Yes, that was, that was a, a fairly a pretty comprehensive review. I mean, there weren't many things that, uh, that you left out in that, in that short a time. There are a couple of things. The first thing it made me think about when you were talking, actually, when you mentioned Victor Gerfinkel, I remembered seeing him, uh, he spoke at Ed Everett's lab when I was there in the 1970s. So I'm sorry, I hadn't realized that he died recently. Um, but- uh, yeah, Just recently, yeah, just recently. Yeah, yeah I remember he was obviously quite old. And <laughs> um, yeah, but that, I remember seeing him then. But there are a couple of things. Uh, it also, you also reminded me of the experiments that I read about actually as a kid in Russia where they were putting, there were two heads on one dog Mm -hmm. um, I, I always wondered about that, and I never looked, obviously it was just in the news, but it was pretty striking at the time. Um, but, and talking about one thing that, that you didn't mention in terms of the single neuron recording, it was really begun by Eb Fetz in the 1960s, the late 60s. He far, um, you know, preceded the other people you mentioned who were, who did significant stuff, but, but he really started it. And he's really still in the field and has contributed till very recently. The idea that you could uh, control something with a, with a single neuron and motor cortex. Um, so that's, that's important, I think. So anyway, but you did, you did it was a pretty comprehensive job. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Th thanks for the review. So you, you mentioned the, uh, the monkeys, for example, where uh, it's been demonstrated they, they've had uh, implants before reach and grasp kind of like BCI paradigms kind of thing. Um, what we've seen with the Neuralink demo um, with the, the pig, the images that you have behind you, I don't know if uh, it's related or unrelated. The, yes. <laughs> the pig. <laughs> Maybe these are the early drawing of the, the experiment. I don't know. Um, but uh, do you, first, what, what, is difference, what is different from what we've seen with the pigs and what we've seen with monkeys from an experiment standpoint, not necessarily the tech? And the second question will be about more of the tech of what's new. But in terms of the experiment, was this, was this something new or not? So um, oh. let me, I, I, I will share my screen once again. One second. You definitely came prepared to the, to, to the panel. 
<laughs> so yeah, I have some. Oh, well, second. No, it wouldn't. Like uh, I have been making this uh, joke. Uh, one sec. Yeah, I have been making this joke um, about Elon Musk that he repeats after me. For example, he published this paper. But if you compare the wording of this paper with the wording from my paper, the, this is pretty similar. So this is a joke. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so uh, like Elon's Musk demonstration is pretty impressive. They they use these electrodes where they have a, a bunch of recording spots. So electrodes are pretty good. The way uh, to uh, put them in the brain is great. Actually, uh, Tim Hansen, uh, whom I work with, um, invented this sewing machine for the brain. So they put this little micro wires inside the brain. So with a robot, and uh, they have the right electronics, and it works really well. So like, if you look at the um, recording quality, it is typical. Uh, so I would call this un a mixture of units and multi-units, and uh, what else? Um, so yeah. So since since we're here, I will show you um, this video that we did uh, maybe uh, like seven years ago. So you, you can see that here is a monkey. Uh, we are recording close to. 600 neurons and um, uh, very good spikes, lots of spikes. And uh, the monkey uh, can, can control the movements of this virtual arm. So, so, so in terms of uh, what I demonstrated, this is very similar to what we had before and the other groups had before. Uh, but what is impressive is that they have this um, uh, in, in full, uh, fully implanted uh, um, device, so so like no wires are sticking uh, from from the head, uh, so no like monkey cap or, or in in their case the pig cap. Uh, cap. So so and uh, the um, everything is small and good. Uh, so so, um, so I, I would um, say this is a very remarkable. Uh, methodological development. So, uh, not so much um, in terms of uh, neurophysiology, but uh, as methodology, this is a great step forward. Awesome. John, uh, you, you're muted if you're. Sorry. Uh, microphone. Uh, oh, you're, you're, still, you're still muted, John. The, the yeah, engineering yeah. is very impressive. Um, that, there's no question about that. And it's exciting. The, the science is very conventional. There's nothing new. Um, the kinds of things they're showing have been done for decades. Um, so, and as uh, Mikhail was showing, have gone well beyond what they show there in the demonstration. So um, it's in reading uh, for this panel, I read some more about them and it pretty, I had not, had, I'd had an impression, but I hadn't known much before, and it pretty much confirmed the impression that they're they're really good engineers. They have a lot of um, there's obviously a lot of money, a lot of power behind this, and the engineering is very exciting. The device they're building is will be very useful for probably for scientists to use, and maybe eventually for clinicians. Um, but in terms of the the actual science, the the kinds of things they're seeing it that they're projecting, the more uh, futuristic things that Elon Musk is talking about, those are gonna require a lot of science. And the major problems with that are not technology, they're science at this point. And, but, but the device they're, they're, they're making could be very useful to scientists to, to, to gain this knowledge, to gain this understanding. Um, so if I were, you know, um, involved in directly in, in those kinds of things, I'd be very excited about getting one of these implants. And um, you know, in the future, I'll be happy about collaborating with people using them. And, uh, but, the, but the science and, and the, the concept of how the nervous system works that comes across in the presentations is at best conventional. And 
really in, in many ways very simplistic and, and limited. But the engineering is is really stellar and uh, will produce something good, I think, if they keep at it. Can I say something about this? Um, you know, I, I don't have anything to add about the the technical versus the the science because I think that's very clear and uh, that you know technically it's very fascinating. The science what well, isn't up to up to where it needs to be, and it's really relatively unimpressive in that way. But what people are really drawn to, there, there's a part of there's some people, maybe a lot of people here who are drawn to the technology. But most of the people I think are entering into this conversation because of this cult of personality around Elon Musk. You know, he he's a he's just he ends up being. Although I think the scientists that he brings on stage and to, to speak are very reasonable and practical. <clears throat> I think he, Elon Musk tends to, and actually Elon Musk has a lot of qualified statements. I don't know if somebody has been coaching him because he says, you know, in the future, we'll be able to do this. We're not able to do this right now. He says that a lot actually to his credit. And he also says, um, somebody coached him about mind control fears because he also says this is gonna be an elective surgery if anybody wants it eventually, an elective option. Um, but really, he, he simultaneously plays into that theater. So his vision ends up getting pushed for this, um, you know, this, this, this fear around AI. And um, he, I, I think what's really great about him and I wanna impress upon this is that we, we do need people with a grand vision. And a lot of times scientists, um, you know, we're, we're so used to 99% of our results not working in the, in the lab that you kind of get to be a pessimist and, and that's kind of how the scientific method even works. So it's good to have people who, who I think Max Hodak, uh, his lead scientist said, you know, push on the imagined constraints that scientists have. That, that's great. But, and especially if that's towards a good, like I think he's, I think Elon Musk is suggesting. And I think a lot of the scientists who are working with him are probably driven by this too, some kind of public good alleviating suffering, helping restore movement in people who are paralyzed. And I think one of the Q and A's, somebody said, do you think he's gonna, do you think they'll fulfill that promise? I don't know, but I think that is definitely their first um, step into this. But his grander vision of what's driving him to fund all of this is really one um, not around benefiting humanity and reducing suffering in, in that way. I think it more betrays kind of an individual fear about the fragility of power that comes with being someone in a position like Elon Musk. So I, I think that's something to keep in mind with a lot of this framing. There's kind of a, a needs to be in some ways to understand and really appreciate technology. You have to separate, uh, find ways to, to parse out where some of this is part of a kind of a grand theatrical act and where part of the science is and where it's practically trying to go and not undermine some of the good that's happening out of the science because of the theater and, and showmanship that Elon Musk is putting out there. And he's not really a good showman, actually, in some ways, he's a terrible speaker. I, I, I don't know if somebody needs to coach him on that, mm -hmm. too. But I guess when you have a lot of money, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I sort of agree. I mean, I agree, I guess, with a lot of what Karen was saying that, but, you know, I, I'd never heard him speak before. And, you know, I found him impressive and that he seemed likable and he seemed very tentative and very appropriate and clearly not a good speaker, but he seemed like a thoughtful, engaged, sophisticated person who, and um, it, that I was more impressed than I, than I thought I would be. Um, I don't really see him as, as, you know, having some personal fear about this or loss of power. Um, the, the grand vision is, I mean, it's nice to see and and the grand vision part of it, he's not going to, he may provide the technology that enables others to begin to understand what may get to the grand vision. Um, and a lot of the things he's saying about AI and the competition with AI doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. Um, what he's doing is, you know, when he talks about where he sees the future going, he's not so much competing with AI as he's turning people into AI, or, you know, at least making some sort of cyborg out of people, which is, they're not going to be the same afterwards. They may be better, but they're not going to be the same. And, and that's where I think the most interesting neuroethical issues come into this. Um, they're, they're not really solvable. I don't see them solvable at this point, but they're, they're important. And um, 
but you know, it's very impressive and it's very impressive engineering. The science is not very exciting. I mean, it's not, it's very conventional and, and simplistic, but the engineering is really neat. Yeah, I, I appreciate your response to that. And, you know, what I do is I study a lot of people's underlying assumptions and unspoken assumptions. So I kind of dig into that a, a lot and that to the analysis. And um, one of the things that, and, and Elon Musk's um, discussion about AI and uh, love of the idea of enhancement is really not uncommon. Um, it, it's pretty much a, a shared belief amongst a lot of a lot of certain sector of people. Um, but and, and you know he like you said, uh, Jonathan, he's very um, practical in that he talks about, and I think uh, Yeni mentioned this. This, this tertiary layer that he proposes, that there's this tertiary layer that the, the technology is gonna produce and it's going to provide some kind of symbiosis with, with Neuralink. But he also rightly mentions that, you know, we already kind of have that, you know, we, we, we do that with our phones, we do that with our computers, so why, why worry about this? But on the other hand, you know, he says that and then the conflicting message that comes across is that a very practical one and then he talks about this existential threat. This is a term that's overused a lot right now. Um, and it's this threat about AI that can be solved with a scientific answer. And, you know, but, but really worrying about new technology and how it's going to change life. And it's, it's often from, if you study history and culture is really one of the most defining features of being human. We always worry about the, the next technology. Not to say that there aren't some worries that need to be there, because that's why I have a job. But you know, with Gutenberg's printing press, oh my gosh, people were so worried about how lazy the public were gonna become with this memory prosthetic and they wouldn't have good memories anymore when actually it really democratized knowledge and information. And, and allowed the public, a broader public to be educated and allowed for a lot of knowledge sharing across geographic boundaries. Um, but now we're worried that AI is gonna lead to the extinction of humans and some unrecoverable global catastrophe due to some super entity that makes humans not at the top of the food chain. Um, and that is the stuff of science fiction that probably makes a lot of us not wanna read it <laughs> anymore. But, you know, we don't need to turn to, if you really want to look for a, a dramatic existential threat, you don't need to turn further than climate change or global warming or even the global pandemic that we're in. But this term existential is, is called upon and abused to generate reaction and gravity. And that is something clever that I think that a lot of speakers do, and maybe unintentionally if I'm trying to be generous, but I think Elon Musk uses it well with part of his performance, that, um, you know, this, this, existential term and threat is used kind of as a shibboleth and it signals some kind of educated discernment of, of with some philosophical thought that leads to some sort of authority of being able to make an issue have more gravity or dread and summon a kind of fearful reactivity. And in that has become a really dominant thing around this neurotechnology and, and many other of the narratives that are in the public eye. And so I, I think that speakers like Musk or others, anybody who's talking to the public has to think carefully about when they're thinking about the full impact and trying to sell their technology, how, how these words are all playing together and tapping into the imaginations. Yeah, I, mean, I, I certainly agree with the overuse of existential threats. That, I mean, it's basically a simplistic sort of nonspecific kind of, you know, wake up call kind of. But I mean, this is different. The thing about, you know, you mentioned technology that we've always had, which is which is correct. But all the technologies that we've developed up to the moment work with the nervous system as it's evolved and and their interactions with the nervous system go through the normal input output pathways. Now, drugs are aside, that's, an, that's another issue, but we really have now two kinds of, of scientific advances which are new. I'm not saying they're bad or good or they're threatening or they're non-threatening, they're new. One are the genetic advances that we can actually go in and play with the genes and we can change things. And that, that's a huge area, but equally the fact that the nervous system is not 
it's not dictated by genetics. It's con continually adjusting based on, really based on its inputs and outputs. And as it has evolved, it has very evolved inputs and outputs, Neur input, afferent nerves, efferent nerves, et cetera, hormones. That's it. That's what it, it works with. That's the, uh, that's the interaction that it has with the outside world and with, it, with the body. Now, this is something new. We're going into it and working in its midst and, and basically imitating it, interfacing it with it very intimately in ways that it wasn't designed to deal with, in ways that are going to change it, in ways that we can't really predict at this point. Now, the eye, it's, it's reassuring that we're very crude at this point. We don't really have inter, really good interfaces, either technically or, or scientifically, so we can't do a whole lot. But that'll get better. But that kind of interaction, what that's going to do, I don't know if it's a threat or a blessing. It's probably both. But it's going to change people in ways that, that haven't happened before. And it's going to do things that raise huge issues that, I mean, I certainly don't have an answer to. I don't even have a real grasp of what they are and, and how we go about responding to them. And these are, I think, are the, the core neuroethical threats neuroethical issues, not so much threats, but neuroethical concerns that we need to have. We need to have, there are new things. This is something new under the sun. Um, and uh, it needs to be recognized and addressed um, that way. And the fact that it's coming slowly is good because we'll have some time to do that. Um, but this, this is something new. It's not just, you know, an iPhone. Because iPhones, you use, you know, your normal senses and your muscles are how you interface with an iPhone. So to be clear, don't get me wrong. I have a, I have a job in this space because there are new ethics questions that are <laughs> come up with neuroscience. And I've seen firsthand working on deep brain stimulation. I've seen firsthand what that can do. Um, so it's not that I don't think that there's dramatic impact and that these are impressive, unprecedented technologies. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that there are near-term concerns, intermediate concerns, and far-term concerns that even are phantom concerns. And there are plenty of near-term reasonable concerns to worry about before jumping to the existential dread of us becoming one with AI. That, that, that's, a, that's more of a fantastical question, but you're right. We, you know why we can't address that now? Because we're not even close to that. Because real, what we do in neuroethics is I actually use my scientific background and philosophical training to use evidence-based uh, evidence science to inform the types of philosophical questions I'm asking. So, you know, I'm thinking more about, and we can talk about this later, you know, but I'm thinking more about privacy and agency. I am thinking to some extent about the, the what you're talking about. I'm thinking about, questions. I'm thinking about societal issues with thinking about how these change norms. But that's but those are the easy that's a little things. bit no those yeah you know but they're not they're those aren't answered they're either important. and they're important. I don't think it's the job I don't think it's the job Jonathan of philosophy to add to for neuroethics to to only address questions that seem no no like uh, you're uh, looking at you're the head of a pin you're dismissing the the futuristic questions they're not so futuristic there are things we can do now that we probably that we are doing now with deep brain stimulation for example which may get into some of these things. We could create problems that we don't know about. You know, when you Absolutely. stimulate- Yeah, no, I'm not dismissing that, Jonathan. There are, we could be changing the brain in ways that we don't know about. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah. basically, it's a basic tenant of therapy that, you know, when you have a therapy, there's the effect you know about and the effect you don't know about. Yeah, and no, Jonathan, I, I appreciate what you're saying. We could be doing harmful things right now. Absolutely. And that's what I, I think we're on the same page, Jonathan. I, I, I hold those in a different space than the existential threat of an AI overlord. But no, maybe we have, differ I'm on that. About AI. AI to me is kind of, as you say, a shibboleth. And I'm, I'm not even sure what it means or how it relates. It's a kind of a, a catch term that people like at this point. That's not my concern. And it is an existential threat. So it's the very specific things in the therapies that we're engaging in now. And for me... You're right. They're questions that that um, are very important that may not be that may be more easily addressed, and things like privacy, etc., are are important. I'm not I'm not saying they aren't, but these issues are there too, and uh, 
and from my point of view, really as a scientist, they're very interesting questions. Um, these issues being me. these issues being ones around uh, agency and autonomy and identity. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, basically. Are we changing? Are we going to change what people do, what people want, what people are? By um, by way in ways that we can't foresee by stimulating in various areas or by recording from certain areas and providing feedback on that basis, we'll be doing things that, I mean, at this point, it, what we do is pretty trivial, it seems. But yeah. in principle, we could do things that we could do bad things. I mean, I have faith in the system that it's very robust, that it will be able to handle what we do, but that isn't certain. And we're certainly gonna be doing things that we can't necessarily predict ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to be watching for these things. I, I don't think this is gonna to happen tomorrow and I don't think something terrible is gonna to happen tomorrow, but it's something that, that needs to be watched for. I, I, I definitely agree. I think that the, this, was, uh, this was a very, very interesting uh, point of view in the conversation. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. Going back to, uh, so we do have uh, Xing who just, uh, joined joined us. I think that there was a time zone uh, misunderstanding. That's the live international uh, mistake that can happen. Uh, out of that, unfortunately, we didn't have Zing for the first uh, the first part. Um, I just want to well, I'll let Zing maybe introduce herself quickly, and then I want to continue not exactly on that, but Elon Musk, uh, kind of as, as you mentioned, seems to have been coached or using some some wordings sometimes yes it seems a bit more uh coached and sometimes it's a bit more raw uh when uh, for example on uh, joe uh, on the uh, on, uh, on the podcast uh, joe rogan he's been on the podcast talking about telepathic communication in like five years ten years i think at most neuroscientists uh, would disagree with that claim, but I want to go and there is the Elon Musk thesis about making the brain digital. So there is the AI aspect, but I want to just shift towards from AI to making the brain digital and just having your thoughts um, once uh, Zeng introduced herself about the this idea of digitalizing the brain. So all this mind uploading. So I want to ask yourself, you're the, um, and Zeng, maybe you can take the first stab at it, do you, do, you, do you think that the brain is a finite model that we can digitalize and understand and that we can at some point man, manipulate memories, for example? So can we uh, store, upload, change memories, or is there something else in the brain that we just, with science and tech, we just can't uh, understand and grasp? So anything with, mi with uh, uh, mind uploading and these kinds of things, we just can't digitalize the brain. So obviously, it's, we all agree that's a very complex model. I'm not saying that we're any... Any, uh, any place near of mapping, understanding this system, but can we with the best, all the money in the world, all the best tech, all the best science, can we uh, digitalize the brain or not really? So Xing, floor is yours if you want to introduce and take a first stab at uh, the question. So hi everyone, uh, sorry that I was late. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm Xing and I work at the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, which is, um, one of the institutes in Amsterdam, part of the Kanave. And my specialty is in visual prostheses. So the last, um, the last six years, I've been a postdoc so working together with Peter Rusima, and we've developed a brain implant that we test in animals. Uh, and our overarching goal is to create a device that will allow blind people to regain a rudimentary form of vision in the future. So um, we work together with a team of people on different aspects, including uh, the hardest part, that's the implants, and also the AI and the rest of the system. And so that's my introduction. Um, to go into, to take a stab at what Yannick was talking about, um, let's skip the preamble about how difficult it would be to, to simulate the brain. I think that to some degree, um, there have been um, there has been some success. Uh, there's been a lot of attempts to try and digitize parts of the brain. Uh, so people really try to tackle the problem uh, in smaller pieces. So for example, creating models of uh, just individual columns, individual projects, for example, or trying to simulate all the processes that take place within a neuron or a small group of neurons. Um, I think that to some degree, 
if you have access to experimentally driven data and you can ground um, your theories and your models in actual data, then um, we can actually come up with meaningful theories and hypotheses and test them. However, it all needs to be designed very rigorously. And the main thing is that we need to identify where we're making these assumptions, um, check whether they're based in truth, um, see if we can predict uh, what's going to happen in a scientific manner, and then see if we can back that up with data. Uh, so that's just uh, to begin with. In theory, if we were able to rally all the computational resources that were required to model the brain, um, I think that it could be possible. However, <laughs> there's so many assumptions going into that. There's, um, whose brain are you going to model? You know, all our brains are different. At what level are you going to model them? And what's the eventual goal of modeling a particular brain? Um, is it to, to answer neuroscientific questions? Is it so that we can reduce the use of animals in research? So it's a very broad topic. I think it's an interesting goal to have, but the main question is, why do we want to achieve this in the first place? Mihail, do you want to? So, um, so I, I found it interesting that Elon Musk used the pigs for the demonstration. They probably did it um, to avoid animal rights uh, activists. Um, uh, however, somewhere I read uh, um, complaints from animal rights activists that um, said that you are invading this pig's privacy, so it didn't give um, consent for this implant. So, so, so even for the pigs, they complained. But I also um, looked um, what pigs have in terms of the brain. And uh, it was very interesting. It appears that uh, pretty much the whole brain of the pig represents the snout. They do have a prefrontal cortex, so they they yeah, they think. Um, and uh, in terms of motor cortex, remember they showed this uh, uh, video of, of a pig walking on a treadmill. Uh, Assuming that they recorded uh, from the motor cortex, uh, it's a little bit hard to record from there because it is located uh, very medially in the pig brain, so you have to go like deep, deep in the brain. So, but the pigs are um, interesting. Uh, like, if you think like, what can you do from from these pigs? Like, make super pigs or uh, something uh, like. Uh, upload the pig's uh, brain content uh, to, uh, to a computer or, or what. So like the first thing um, that comes to mind, uh, to my mind at least, uh, is to use somehow the remarkable snout and the ability to smell and to explore the space uh, with, with the snout. The other thing is that they are great locomotion uh, animals and uh, um, they are perfectly uh, fitted for the spinal cord implant, spinal cord uh, stimulating implant. And right now there is work ongoing where they stimulate um, spinal cord and restore locomotion ability. And there was a demo from Cortin group where they had this um, walking monkey, but maybe a pig would be even a better object. Um, so, so, so I'm basically trying to think realistically because we can talk about this mind upload or memory upload or like we will implant the brain and cure all possible diseases. But uh, now the question is realistic, like where we go from there and what, uh, what uh, can be done. So like Talking specifically about pigs, uh, there are many interesting um, demonstrations that could be done. For example, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, they would again repeat after Cortin, but um, the, like a, an interface that takes brain activity and stimulates the spinal cord and uh, somehow controls locomotion. So this would be an interesting so it's really, it's interesting, your question really brings up a couple of things that first that, you know, you talk about digitizing the brain that, I mean, it's really a, it's an old saying in, in neuroscience that 
every every generation or really every age thinks about the brain in terms of their highest technology. So the Greeks talk about the brain as writing on a wax tablet. In the um, you know in the 17th century, they talked about the brain and Descartes talked about it in terms of hydraulics. In the 18th century, they talked about it in Newtonian sense in terms of oscillations. And we talk about it in terms of computers. And our doing, it, our doing that is not necessarily any better or any closer to the reality than what was done previously. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, very much that uh, that can, uh, that, that's what we may be very much distorted by that. The other, our thinking, the other thing to realize is that neuroscience, among, unique among scientists, has a tremendous disadvantage and has had it from the beginning that we think because we think we know what's going on inside because we have awareness of what we think is going on inside. So we think we know there are things like memories and there are things like actions and there are things like emotions and there are things like reasons. We think this and that's all, all very effective in real life, but it basically has very little to do with what's going on inside probably and it's very misleading to try to address the brain and to try to understand the brain using these concepts. I mean, memories as we conceive of them simply don't exist probably. There aren't things written down in the brain. The brain produces behaviors. That's what it does. It doesn't produce, it doesn't write things down that you could then look at and record and, and transfer to somebody else's brain, et cetera. So, I mean, the very issues that the kinds of words we apply we have to be, we're very much distorted by the fact that we think what's, we know what's going on in there or we have some understanding of it and we basically have very little. We have to address this the same way we address other kinds of scientific problems. We have to really act like if we were highly intelligent robots coming down to earth and watching these people, watching people walk around and having no idea that they were conscious or what they thought or what they thought about themselves and just looking at their behavior and trying to figure out what's going on inside. We would come up with something very different from our current understanding of memories and emotions and things like that. We would have a very different understanding and it would be really closer to the reality. So. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and, and I think that that really well, uh, you know, outlined kind of how we've, I, I love the, I, that statement about, and I've heard it in both before, just we always have our highest technology is, is something tied back to the brain. And I was thinking about what Dr. Chen was saying about, you know, a, a very important question, actually, a fundamental one that I often ask innovators is why are you doing this? <laughs> what is your true motivation and goal? And sometimes people can't even articulate that, which is often surprising. I mean, another surprising thing is most scientists can't define research, which is because I teach research, uh, research ethics. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the cultural meaning assigned to, to scientific finding is, is really important. And I think that what Jonathan was getting at that too, you know, let's, you know, we're talking about, Musk is talking about mind uploading, kind of, you know, avoiding this, this, uh, this meat sack of a body and, you know, moving on into something at a higher level that is just uh, infinite and immortal. Um, but if we look at the flip side and think about death, we really don't even know what the moment of death people don't. And, and actually that would differ culturally, but, but the practical ways that we define that someone is dead aren't even consistent. So we have this brain death criteria that's supposed to be sort of universal. It's not really, it's not universally implemented across the US where I am. It's not um, actually adopted across the world. And, and some have even called it a legal fiction where we, we designated this, this death because it's also lent to a lot of helpful things like um, being able to have better organs that are in better shape to donate. But when we say someone is dead in, in the US and we say that they're brain dead, we, assuming there's some kind of consistency, which there's not as much as we'd like, it's just that we've, we've decided that whatever activity that is is low enough so that it's not meaningful anymore. There's no meaningful connections with the world or with other people. That is not a scientific thing as much as it, that's a, a societal value value statement. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And the same is going to be true. This is like what Jonathan was saying about memories and how we conceive of memories. 
Um, another important point that I hope people take away from this is that, and again, it's related to what Dr. Chin said, um, why are you doing this? And even what question are you trying to solve? So when people say, oh, we're gonna understand the brain, we're gonna understand the nature of being human. I mean, I, I agree that there are great insights from neuroscience. This is why I'm in, I'm in neuroscience that relate to aspects of being human that are more powerful in some ways than anything else. Um, but the scientific method is, is not a religion. It's, it's but one method that we use to understand the world. And it's a tool that has certain parameters and abilities. And, and it's not one, it, you know, it derives from scientia, which means being knowledge based on demonstrable and reproducible data, right? And also a tenet of the scientific method is that a hypothesis is testable and falsifiable, right? So now start thinking about entering questions about the nature of the mind, which actually, when we talk about brain uploading, people interchangeably and sloppily use mind uploading. I mean, this is something that maybe as we enter into, you know, even the same with along Jonathan's lines of memory, consciousness, I think we'll agree. Consciousness is a totally loaded term. If you ask someone who studies consciousness what they're doing, they've kind of tried to operationalize and break down consciousness. But I don't think any good researcher in that space would tell you they fully understand and can recreate consciousness and understand what that is. Same with thoughts, right? No scientist will honestly be able to tell you that they understand what exactly a thought is in the brain. This is also what Jonathan was alluding to with memories. And I think we need to be realistic about what science can offer so that we don't get disappointed by, by science as well and can really fully understand its, its impact. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Karen's saying that science is a method that has rules. And for example, she brought up consciousness. Consciousness is at this point is not a scientific problem. It's just not a scientific problem because it doesn't have a measure. It doesn't have, it can't be measured. We have words like arousal. We have words like attention. We have words like perception. We can define those words. We can measure those words. Consciousness, we can't measure. It's not a scientific issue. It's like saying, well, what is, we're going to determine what beauty is, or we're going to determine what truth is, or we're going to determine what, uh, you know, uh, good is and evil is, and we're going to use the scientific method. It's something that is not, we don't have, we can't measure it. There's not something to measure. That, and there is nothing that demands we have the word consciousness. You're not allowed in science to just develop a term and say, well, I'm studying this. You have to have a reason for the term. It ha you have to have a, a phenomenon that the term applies to that you can measure. And we don't have that. And so like the, the, all the attention now, scientifically, the consciousness gets makes no sense to me whatsoever. I think it's basically a backwater. Uh, and to the extent that it's gonna do anything good, it'll be, they'll be looking at things like, not a backwater, it's a dead end. Um, things like arousal or things like perception or attention, those things, which I think Karen was alluding to what people break out and say they're studying consciousness. They're not studying consciousness. They're studying those things. And it, it really, scientifically, it goes back to when they talked about, you know, in the 19th century, the luminiferous ether, which was supposedly the substance in which light traveled. And everyone knew it existed. But then with the Michelson-Morley experiment, it became clear that it didn't appear to exist. And that led to the theory of relativity. That was part of the background to it. Um, this thing that everyone assumed existed just went away because it wasn't measurable. There wasn't anything there to detect. Um, and I think it's similar. It's frustrating from our point of view to think that, that we can't necessarily address this, but that's the reality of science. It is a method, as Karen was saying, and it has limitations and it has rules that you have to follow. Very, very speaking, interesting. Speaking, speaking about the transition to death, um, there was a paper, I think, two years ago published in Nature where they revived the dead pig's brain, by the way, speaking of pigs. So uh, I think they probably just put some chemicals and oxygenated it and uh, so it was not mm, decomposing so rapidly. But there, there was a lot of press about this, like, oh, you revived the pig's uh, brain. So, so I, I think they, they even had to rewrite their protocol uh, so just to make sure that all ethical issues were addressed. So this, uh, speaking about consciousness, um, I am also 
kind of a little bit skeptical of all these theories of consciousness. Uh, some of them are more reasonable, some are pretty crazy. Um, Roger Penrose got a Nobel Prize um, uh, a few days ago, but his theory of consciousness is more crazy than realistic. But uh, speaking of realistic uh, theories like um, integrated information theory, you can actually measure this. And in, in this part, um, brain-computer interfaces could help um, understand the consciousness or at least advanced a little bit in these studies. Because first of all, you can enter different areas of the brain that are presumed to do something with the consciousness and then you read information from there and then evaluate it and quantify it. Also, you could stimulate different parts of the brain and uh, then see um, what uh, effect it has on consciousness. Uh, moreover, uh, uh, if you have this brain-computer interface that presumably interferes with your consciousness, you also have your own subjective feelings uh, or, or what you feel, your qualia, etc. So it gives you a unique opportunity to experiment with your own consciousness. So you can like, if I look at some animal or human subject and uh, try to guess what's going on in his consciousness, uh, it is hard. But if I am doing this on myself and just uh, see what happens, uh, then, uh, then uh, th this may also help. Very, very Can good. I just say, be because yep. I yeah. was involved with the, um, with the um, early kind of consultations on um, Nanad Sestan's work and the restoration of activity in pig brains, uh, I want to say that that was an example of actually the, the researchers were very attuned to the ethical issues and were very concerned. And they had already developed a protocol before we even got there, uh, before they even called upon us to, to be very careful and thoughtful about what they were doing. Um, I think one of the lingering, and, and we worked actually carefully with the National Institutes of Health team to try to steer the public, public conversation on that in a healthy way, <laughs> one that didn't go off the rails. And it's like, oh my gosh. Um, I think relatively, I think NIH thought it was mostly a success. There were only a few really um, totally out there, high, high profile pieces. But that was, that was something, you know, where there was a nice, I think there were a lot of lessons learned there from um, the researchers and, and uh, the communications team and ethicists kind of talking together about what is the message we wanna make sure it comes out really clearly and what do we know people already assume about this to be true? And we had to address a lot of that. So I just want to, I feel like I had to say something about that because I was involved in it. Awesome. Um, I see that time is flying by. I do have a lot of questions. Uh, you're, you've been generous with your answers and uh, making my job as a as moderator very easy. I don't actually have to go through my questions. You're just um, giving us so, so, so much insight. Um, but I also want to include the, the audience uh, who's uh, here with us live on Zoom today. Um, Karen, you talked about the social impact and the, the, the aspect of like the culture. Um, I, I would be interested in knowing the opinion of the, the crowd here. And we do have a poll. So if the organizer can, uh, can send the poll, the question is basically, if you could improve your memory 10 times or tenfold with a brain implant, it's free. It's safe. It's been done a thousand times. It's totally, free. it's totally safe. It's free. It just works. Um, would you have the brain implant? Would you basically the question is, would you enhance yourself, your memory with a brain implant? Yes or no. And obviously there are so many more layers to that question, but let's keep it as simple as that for now. Well, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I'd have to ask what they mean by improve. I mean, I really have no, no idea exactly. Do you remember things that, and, is this something that you can then, that you can enumerate? You know, you can remember uh, 50 numbers or 70 numbers instead of the normal seven in a row. Um, Jonathan, if you got the brain implant, you would know the answer to that question yes, already. probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> right, I need to but talk to you on, right? The best framework is that you control, your, you control your memory. You just have 10 times more of 
what you want to control and how you want to control it. It could be overwhelming. It could basically be incapacitating. No. You know, it's, it's often remarkable. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mikhail. Uh, very briefly. There is some history to this question. Actually, in medieval times, it was considered non-ethical to try to write something down. Just you had, uh, this was considered cheating. So if you wanted to uh, remember something, you had to memorize. Now, nobody has to memorize anything because you just take your cell phone and get any information you need. So with the implants, I think this just gives you a tool to um, connect to some other device that keeps memory. So and the big question is, uh, why do I need to connect directly from the brain if I can use just my normal uh, ways to communicate? So like if um, scientists or us or Elon Musk uh, manages to improve these communications, then this, this would make some difference. Awesome. So we'll, we'll wait I for a few more answers. answers. Oh. Yep, thanks. No, I, I don't want to delay the poll questions. I'm interested to see what's next. So we'll, uh, we'll leave a few more seconds for, uh, for the people to, and then the organizer can just uh, give us the answers. I will go, okay. So yes, 66%, no 33%. So we have uh, more people that are okay with implanting and technology and where we, and where we're going with uh, with that, which is good, I guess, for Neuralink and what they are trying to achieve. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for participating to the poll. I will go to some of the questions from the, the audience, the Q&A. Uh, first one who wants, I'm not, some of the questions are general, so I don't necessarily want to address or pinpoint. The first one in the panelists that want to take a stab, feel free to just unmute and jump at it. Um, so first question from Olga is, could you tell more uh, about stimulation devices uh, like, uh, like Neuralink? So uh, can you tell us more about stimulation such devices like Neuralink? Is there an understanding on how to stimulate and where, how to choose neurons, protocols, et cetera? So in terms of stimulation devices, yeah, J John, you were muted. Yeah, it, um, it depends on what you want to do. And the answer basically is mostly no to, to is there an understanding? <laughs> But um, the, uh, it depends on what you want to do. It all, you know, this is a tool. And the re both the recording and the stimulating parts of it, you, you have to define, you have to say what exactly you want to do. You know, you want to restore something, you want to enhance something, you want to change something. Um, and, then, and then that determines where you have to go and what you have to do. At this point, we don't necessarily know. And uh, certainly in terms of, interfacing with individual neurons, we really know very little, but certainly, but definitely assuming we did know more, it very much depends on what you want to do. Um, and it's going to be a different answer for, for each, each one of your goals, where you have to go, what you have to do, it's uh, what you expect, what successes, et cetera. Um, this again is a tool and it has a lot of possible uses and we need, it will, the uses will become a lot more exciting and sophisticated as we get better scientific understanding. Xing, I would be interested in knowing your yeah, individual cortex, you know exactly kind of like what the goal is. Um, so do you wanna take a stab at it? Well, a stimulation of the visual cortex has been around since the 60s. It's been carried out in both experimental animals and in humans. So both blind and sighted human subjects who could report the perceptions that they experienced uh, when their visual cortex is stimulated. And um, just beginning with some fundamentals, when you inject a small amount of current into the brain, people have um, found that you excite a small volume of tissue in the vicinity of the electrodes. And that stimulates any neural processes that happen to be running through that volume of tissue. So cells that have the axons or the cell bodies located close to the tip of the electrode will become more active. And in the visual cortex in particular, um, normally the neurons, for example, in the primary visual cortex are responsible for processing information in a particular region of visual space. And if you stimulate the neurons artificially with current, 
it's almost as though you're hijacking neurons. So what happens is that these neurons that normally um, interpret information from a location in the visual field become active and people see a dot of light in that same location. And um, right now this technology is still very coarse. When we inject current into the brain, we're, we're basically zapping a whole bunch of different cells non-specifically. We don't select particular types of cells. Um, this might be possible in the future, but generally um, people find that if you inject slightly less current, you excite slightly fewer cells. So in that way, with smaller electrodes and small amounts of current, you can um, sort of get slightly more specific activation of cells. And who knows, people are working on techniques to stimulate neurons using optogenetics. Or, or yeah, other more futuristic techniques. And it might be possible one day to stimulate uh, in a more specific manner, which is why I think that um, the future of BCIs is going to occur in many different stages. The most rudimentary types of BCIs will allow us to create coarse percepts or to interact with the brain in a very coarse manner. And uh, assuming that technology continues to develop we will get more and more sophisticated iterations, but there's a lot of challenges ahead. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. That's very, that's really, uh, um, I, know, I know a little bit about the visual studies, um, much less than, than you do, obviously, but um, I just was struck by hearing a story about one of the original uh, stimul cortical stimulation implants that just had you know, on a rough four by four array. So there were 16 channels and um, 16 stimuli. And the idea was that people could get a uh, crude perception, light versus dark. They might be able to distinguish a doorway. Um, and then it turned out that this person, um, they, they asked her how this was going. Could she do such and such? And she said, well, I'm learning how to shoot baskets. You know, and what, what she had figured out how to do is to move her head back and forth and scan across the field to get much more out of these 16 channels than they basically gave. And she was able to shoot baskets. Uh, so what we're going to be able to do with these things are, it's going to be very much and maybe even more, more determined by the brain than the basic technology that, that what we give, we have to give something that'll work maybe even just in a very simple way and then let this very sophisticated system do what it can do with it. And, and, the, and I think similar things have happened with the auditory prostheses that the system given even this little assistance, this little access can do very, very fancy things. Yeah, with, with stimulation, um, cochlear implant was a great success with uh, hundreds of thousands of people getting this implant. And this success was um, partly because you um, stimulated the most peripheral part of, uh, of the system, uh, auditory nerve, basically. If you try to stimulate the uh, brain stem nuclei, then, uh, then it is more complicated, um, simply because when you are, um, insert your electrode in a certain brain structure, and then um, stimulate and this is a very crude way to deliver um, uh, information uh, because this is a very fine structure with all the incoming um, fibers etc so th this is like sticking a nail in the brain and trying to uh, do something but uh, also when you stimulate you stimulate mostly fibers so let's say you stimulate the visual cortex or motor cortex so what happens, you stimulate fibers that go to the other areas, and uh, then these areas try to make sense of these inputs that they, they receive. So this is a little bit different from a traditional description, like you stimulate precisely an area in this target zone, and then this zone does what it normally mm, does. Uh, but uh, what actually happens is that, uh, this area generates some inputs to a um, large amount of other areas, and then they try to interpret this. So we have the uh, stimulation, let's say, for uh, to achieve tactile sense, it, it is even worse, uh, like technically, 
because you stimulate some sensory cortex, then it goes to the spinal cord, and then ev eventually you get uh, muscle contraction, something move in the periphery, and the subject may uh, simply feel the stimulation, uh, like the, the response, instead of your goal of stimulating the primary sensory cortex. But in, in any way, with the progress in the way is we stimulate, so I, I think um, th there will be more and more achievements, and uh, sensory um, interfaces um, will be very successful. So, so may maybe uh, in the um, initially even more successful than these uh, interfaces that uh, try to decode thoughts from our brain activity. I would uh, I would definitely agree with uh, with that. In terms, just going back to. Uh, John, John, Jonathan's point on um, the number of channels, for example, you talked about four by four. Um, one of the Neuralink's biggest claim is the number of channels. So Elon Musk have repeatedly said that they, they do have like thousands and they, they've shown different numbers depending on the, since 2019. But let's say uh, they, they mentioned a thousand channels, which is a hundred times bigger than and then Elon Musk is data of saying the next big thing, the competition or the other things, and then talking about the Utah array. Um, so what, just to give people a, a sense of the current state of the art number of channels and why, why it matters, higher number of channel counts. So what's the current state of the art number of channels and what does it mean to have, for example, hundred more uh, time channels? Yeah, it, it matters during the first um, week of the recordings and then it doesn't matter at all because uh, most of the electrodes get encapsulated and then uh, mm -hmm. they run in, into the problems so that every, everybody in this field has so that recording quality deteriorates. And uh, like you mentioned, YouTube probe and uh, there are studies showing that it gets um, partially, completely... Uh, in, uh, encapsulated and even pushed out of the brains. So when you read these reports about human studies, notice that they very rarely report uh, good neurons recorded. So typically, um, like uh, it is um, thresholding of some kind of activity, multi units. Uh, I don't know what it is. So. so um, to, uh, the bottom line is that the idea of many channels is good uh, theoretically. So if you can record millions of neurons, yeah, great, you, you can use this information. But practically, there is a huge uh, problem of biocompatibility, which hasn't been solved yet. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, uh, that's very, very true that the meme plants that have been done you go on months after years and you get relative very few neurons that you're recording for a long time. At the same time, in all fairness, the fact that they're using very, the very thin wire, very thin implants they're using may work better. Um, I'm really hopeful that people will use the cell biology more aggressively to develop methods that are different from putting in these same materials and making them thinner. But in any case, it remains to be seen how, what the, um, how well these, their very thin implants will work. But ter thinking in terms of the channels, it really depends on what you want to do. What's your goal here? And also, there is a view that, you know, people sort of assume that looking at, or many people assume that the neurons are kind of the, the basic level and, and everything else is derived from that. That's not necessarily the case. You know, there are many, the, actually, there are many more glial cells than neurons in many areas of the, of the central nervous system, and, and they participate in function as well. You know, the vessels participate. There are other structures that participate. Synaptic activity um, is important, even perhaps when it isn't generating action potentials. Um, there are, you know, it isn't clear that this is the best way to look or you know, it may be important, but whether, how much you need, whether you want to look at the level of individual neurons or you want to look at the level of the fields that reflect the activity of, the, of a bunch of neurons um, remains to be seen. And it all relates, of course, to what your objective is, what you're trying to do with it. The, uh, these are practical questions. They don't necessarily, they're not, they're not given out by the basic science. They're, 
You know, you take the basic science and then you try to address practical issues. Uh, and that's where the answers will come. Um, but there are multiple technical issues as well. I mean, as Mikhail was saying that, you know, neurons don't last, but the fields do. And people are finding that, um, that if you record local field potentials, those can be more lasting. And that's why recording from the cortical surface or ECOG, electrocorticography, um, is potentially very, I mean, I'm very high on that, and at least in the immediate and medium term, that it's going to be more stable and it can be quite sophisticated and have quite high topographical as well as, as temporal resolution. Um, these are all very practical issues, but just saying, oh, we have 100,000 channels, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better than 100 times better than 1,000 channels. It may be, but it depends on what you're doing, what the what you're trying to do with it, and what these signals are that you're actually recording. Yeah, just following up, following up on that, I can give a concrete example in the field of visual cortical prosthesis, where people have, um, for example, implanted uh, up to a few hundred electrodes in visual cortex, and um, the patients report being able, for example, to differentiate a cup from a bowl on the table or to be able to see the sidewalk uh, versus the road or the roof of your neighbor's house. And um, there have also been a bunch of simulation studies uh, carried out with different numbers of pixels. So basically different numbers of electrodes going from just a few dozen to hundreds or even thousands. And um, generally people seem to find that for object recognition you would ideally have uh, at least dozens to hundreds and then for much finer um, tasks that demand much finer visual accuracy, like reading, um, you probably need more electrodes. And then again, there's a lot of different factors involved because um, it's not only the number of electrodes, it's also the distribution of the electrodes, whether they interface with the appropriate um, areas of the brain and the density of the interfacing. Um, and all these factors interact. So channel count, uh, definitely people think that that would yield high resolution, but then of course, like Jonathan said, the question is what's the minimum resolution that's necessary for a patient to really achieve um, increase in quality of life. We Touched on a very important point uh, that was one of the question of the uh, the public about biocompatibility. So, how complicated is that problem? Is that an ongoing fight that we will never end, that we will never win, or at some point in the near future we will master the biocompatibility? So, we've mastered in different area, quote unquote, for example, like metal screws, things like that. We can put in a, in, in the body, uh, and it were pretty successful in handling um, the biocompatibility. What about the brain? How complicated is that problem? Where, do, where are we and uh, is there in the new future where we feel like we'll uh, solve that problem? Well, it's, it's pretty complicated, <laughs> but I mean, we, we are, we've advanced, but basically we haven't advanced that much. We're just getting, you know, I mean, the Romans were putting mental implants, not in the brain, but they had metal implants that lasted. Um, but, uh, and essentially we're still putting really beds of nails into the brain. They're finer and finer and they're better and better machined and there are more and more of them, but that's basically what we're doing. Um, and even what Elon Musk is doing is, is kind of the same thing. And there, there have to be better cell biological methods to interface much more intimately and much more seamlessly with the brain. Um, those need to be developed and that's cell biology but there's no reason why it can't be developed. Uh, the brain is a very unique environment biologically um, and, and obviously very delicate, et cetera. Um, but there's no reason why these problems can't be solved. They're scientific problems like other scientific problems that we've solved. It just needs to be done. There's a lot of work to be done in those areas. And at this point, to some extent, you can view making fancier and fancier metal arrays and finer and finer machines as kind of like as basically it's 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 a side path that isn't necessarily the best path forward. We may get some initial benefits, but the ultimate improvements have to come really with more basic scientific enterprise efforts to really understand the the biology and to basically meet the brain much more 
much more on its own terms, the brain tissue. But things like, I mean, like neural dust that, um, that I know Jose Camina is involved with developing those kinds of um, efforts uh, are very interesting. Uh, and this is a scientific issue. It's a very difficult one, but it can be solved. I think that in many ways, um, Neuralink, given that it's such a young company, it's hit the nail on the head um, in some of its early hires in terms of the scientists, for example, coming out of UCSF, um, because there has been a lot of recent development in the field of neuroscience to create more biocompatible probes. Um, and so just the flexibility and, and the sheer thinness of the probe, um, it, there has been um, some, some results that have been published that look at the amount of gliosis, for example, around these very thin probes or the amount of damage to the neurons. So um, after implanting the probes in rodents for, let's say, uh, half a year or so, you can do histology on the brain and uh, do staining and check to see the density of cells that are um, in the tissue surrounding the probe. The more intact cells, the better. Or you can look at markers of um, the, the immune system response uh, and check the amount of gliosis and tissue reaction in the vicinity of the probe. And I think that there's a lot of promise there. There's definitely um, some studies that show very little tissue reaction even after uh, many months. However, it's still early days. I haven't seen any histological results from uh, Neuralink ex experiments, whether in rodents or in pigs. And I think uh, the critical test is in a few years after implantation, um, are they going to see uh, very minimal tissue reactions or, or are they still going to get a lot of problems? And it's a matter of time. These are tests that we can't uh, just perform with accelerated aging tests. We have to actually do them in animals. Interesting. It's currently uh, the time limit we had for the panel. However, we still have a few questions. Uh, so I would ask the panelists, are you still available if we extend for another five, 10 minutes uh, to then wrap up last poll and then want to be respectful of your time, but we still have obviously this subject gather a lot of interest. So are you okay if we extend it a little bit or we have a hard well, deadline? Let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah, you have uh, some, some time. Awesome. Thanks. So the organizer, the panelist, everybody is okay with for uh, with a few more minutes. Awesome. Um, so the uh, Mihail, you mentioned about the, the animals. You talk about the pigs, uh, monkeys. I want to explore just uh, uh, very quickly. One of the question was uh, all uh, are the rats suitable for BCI experiment? So I would. So that was one question from the audience. Uh, Ruslan Kelly. Moline, Moline, yeah. Um, however, I want to extend a bit of the question to just animal in general. Is there, uh, what kind of animals are, are we using for BCI brain-wise? And also you talk about ethics. For example, you mentioned the pigs, like think uh, with the frontal uh, cortex and things like that. And then I want to have maybe Karen's perspective on the animals. Are they all the same category when we think about animal experiments or is there something that people need to consider or people are sensible, sensible about? Yeah, rats are very good for these experiments. They are very smart. And the other thing um, that they are useful in is that they are like robots. I, I will explain what I mean. If you insert an electrode in the red brain, then it stimulate and then connect it to some reward of some, some kind, then five minutes and your rat understands um, like how to get this reward. If you try to do this in monkey and then you stimulate a monkey in some area, uh, then the monkey just thinks and says, hmm, this is like weird. Uh, what do you mean by this? And then uh, you need actually more more time in the smarter monkey to teach uh, to understand some simple stimulus. So, so like rats in a certain way are better, uh, particularly with this brain-to-brain -brain interfaces. I'm actually su uh, surprised that this is not mm, developing rapidly because you could connect uh, 
several rats uh, with a brain-to-brain -brain interface and then uh, uh, obtain some interesting results even in uh, like social behavior of rats or something like this. So, but uh, to make it short, uh, any, um, any um, animal or human is good for a particular task. So let's say if you want to study some decision making, some higher order cognitive function, use um, better, better animals. Uh, and uh, of course, when these um, invasive implants become uh, safe in humans, then, then we will learn much more about um, how a human thinks, basically. Yeah, so I mean, there are the multiple issues that come up with animals. Um, there are the basic ethical issues about the principle is you're supposed to use the the lowest animal that's that, that is compatible with your particular experiment, um, and the fewest number of them. Um, also, there are issues of expense and care and and everything else that come up. But then also the scientific issues. So my understanding of pigs is that they're used because um, their brain, they're very smart and their brains are not that different from human brains and that you can avoid a lot of the difficulties associated with, with primate research, with monkey research, which is very expensive and involving and, and um, primates are to some extent uh, more difficult to work with. They're, I mean, they're, they have the sort of normal uh, kind of nasty primate dis dis disposition that, that we all have. And, and as Mikhail was saying, they can be very uh, recalcitrant in terms of studies, um, just the way we probably would be in the, in their, in the same setting. Um, so uh, there are reasons for using one animal as opposed to another. Um, some animals are particularly, rats are obviously considered lower animals from, from pigs or monkeys. Um, there are certain advantages in, in spinal cord research. Uh, the, the anatomy is different in the spinal cord. The corticospinal tract is, is differently located. It's, it's easier to preserve. It's easier to destroy if you want to look at it uh, to, to study its function. Um, there are various issues for choosing an animal, but, but it's complicated. In terms of the, the different animals and maybe in the visual cortex, it was mapped a lot using cats. Are we still using cat in research for that kind of experiments or not really? I don't know of any groups that still does it today to answer you very quickly. Awesome. Karen, anything in terms of the, the ethics when considering animal research? Uh, obviously, it's a sensible uh, topic. Some people are not really in favor. Um, yeah, what's your take on, yeah. uh, on the subject? Well, I mean, to say it's a sensitive topic is an understatement. You know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, uh, controversial. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, as a scientist, we're put in very, who work with non-human animals, we're put in a very weird position. So I've worked with almost, I mean, so many uh, anim, non-human animal models from, you know, actually from cells in a dish that were derived from other animals to, to non-human primates, to humans. And, you know, really the challenge is that if you're going to, if you go into science because you want to alleviate it, suffering, then, you know, you don't expect to then recreate that, that model of suffering and then try to cure it. You know, it, it's a very bizarre position to be put in. So this is, the, this, it's important to understand that every scientist who works with non-human animals many will come across this tension within their own values, just whether they believe in unhuman animal research or not. It's just that is a strange proposition to put somebody in. Um, the other thing is that the other ethical challenge that's out there is that certainly you wanna find the, the right animal that's going to give you scientific, useful scientific information. But when you're talking about the human brain, you know, there, there are arguments out there who say, you know, it's actually, unethical to use non-human animals because they won't actually give you useful information that really can map onto the complexity of the human brain. That's one argument out, out there. And, and I know at, at NIH, for instance, we've been working on thinking about not the elimination of non-human animal research. I want to be clear about that. But one of the things we've been working on is how can we um, devise better proxies 
of the human brain that are actually going to give us this useful information. And the work by Nanat Sesson, for example, is a little bit towards that. You know, we what, the thing we mightily struggle with with humans is getting good human tissue that's still active. You know, the way that we acquire it now really has severe impact on how the science can be done. And there's a lot of reasons, technical, medical, and ethical, for why we we take that technology as we do. The other challenge that we've we've identified with using doing brain research with non-human animals is that we are always concerned as researchers about um, and, and with that are ethically minded about the suffering of the living beings that we use, right? And so we have a lot of things in place too. We use anesthesia. We actually, you know, people have developed models of, of mouse uh, face grimaces to understand their level of suffering so that they can then know whether to administer anesthesia because they don't always speak or tell or yelp when something happens. Um, but with the, the type of interventions that we can do with the human brain, is there a type of suffering that we might not be able to detect? And I think that's the, the worry. If something were suffering, would we know it and would we be able to address that? And one of the solutions that are, we're putting forward now is to try to develop different kinds of technical tools alongside those experiments to better understand, have measures and proxies for, for suffering. Yeah, I... Um, I usually say that basically I think uh, anyone who's completely comfortable with animal research shouldn't be doing it. Um, I mean, we're all, I think, concerned about it. And, you know, we don't feel completely comfortable with it and, and we think about it a lot. Um, and it's been certainly interesting and, and gratifying for me to see the developments over the last 40 years in terms of the care that goes into overseeing animal research. I mean, I can see now there were things done in the in the 70s that would never fly, never in 80s and even 90s that would never fly now. Things have gotten a lot more, um, a lot more overseen, a lot more um, carefully thought out. Uh, the kinds of things that the Karen's talking about, thinking about how you measure suffering, et cetera, those are all very much in the forefront, and there are standards being developed. Obviously, they're not ideal. Obviously, they're not perfect, but they're a lot better than what used to be, and this has really paralleled the improvement in, um, in human research. Uh, there are things that were done um, 30, 40, certainly 50 years ago in, in the US that would, are astonishing. When papers written that are, that are really astonishing um, in terms of how we think about things now. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, but it is a continuing concern um, in terms of minimizing um, et cetera, and, and trying to avoid suffering. But on the other hand, it's important to realize that it is essential. This idea that no, that, that, that sure, certainly it doesn't perfectly parallel what happens in humans. The, uh, even the, the monkey brain doesn't perfectly parallel the human brain, but it's very useful and, and very, we learn a lot. You know, um, you know, for many years I carried around, uh, in my wallet, a picture of, of uh, children in, in iron lungs. This was in the 50s and 60s. Because when I was in medical school, there were still some of those old devices lying around from polio every summer. You know, that doesn't happen anymore. And that's because of animal research. Um, so, uh, you know, and that is still essential. We, as in terms of the brain, we understand really very little about how the brain functions. Sure, we can do some things in computer models. We do some in our lab, but it's minimal. It's, it's limited, it, it's ancillary. The, there's no real substitute at this point or in the foreseeable future for doing actual studies in humans as well as in animals. So we need to try to reduce animal research as much as possible, but if we're gonna advance things, um, if we're going to alleviate suffering and, and disease and the results of trauma, we animal research is essential and will be for the foreseeable future. There was um, recently an entire issue of PNAS uh, devoted to primate research, and then they um, just explain uh, item by item where this research is needed, and it is very convincing. Um, also, brain-computer interfaces will enter animals, 
soon, I think, because animals will need them as well, because they also suffer from problems, like dogs um, may have spinal cord injuries, so they, they will need cure. So, so I think th th this is coming as well. Is that time for me to add something quickly? Yep, go. Um, yeah, like, like Jonathan pointed out, I think we need to look at the bigger picture and um, what are all the reasons for um, wanting to do these experiments and what we can potentially stand to achieve in terms of alleviating um, disease and suffering. And a very high profile example that I read about in the news recently was that the, um, the monoclonal antibody drug that President Trump received um, after he was diagnosed with COVID was actually tested on one golden hamsters and second um, uh, monkeys. And so I think it's good for people to realize where these drugs come from, where the vaccines come from. And um, if you think that it's possible to just stop all research and, and not make any progress, well then, you know, you'll just have COVID rampaging on throughout the world. It, it also was tested in human fetal cells too, right? So, I mean, we're, we're, and as well as animals. So it also speaks for that kind of research too. Awesome. That we, we could talk, we could talk about this and we could go deeper and I've had some requests as well talking about, uh, so Brendan just mentioned in the, in the chat about dogs. Uh, some people have asked about birds uh, because we know that crows, ravens are pretty smart. So can, can, can we do a, or their experiment with, with that? So we can definitely go in uh, and spend a lot of time. And we, we haven't even touched uh, a lot of the, 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 the tech side of things, the question, the power, the connector, uh, all, these, uh, all these things, um, the perception of the public as well. The, so we could talk about it. The good thing is that it's an ongoing discussion that we will continue talking about that for the years to come. So we don't have to solve everything today. Um, we can keep for a bit more for tomorrow. Um, so I want to thank very much all the, the, the speakers for the, the panels for this amazing panel. I personally had a blast. Um, I want to leave the audience with one more poll. So if we can bring the, the question, um, obviously one thing that went viral with Elon Musk is that idea of mind-to-mind -mind communication or telepathy, uh, where we won't have to talk or type. Uh, Facebook announced something like that as well with their BCI program, 100 words a minute. So let's just uh, go with a simple question. Do you think we will ever achieve mind-to-mind -mind communication, at least with the same richness or level of details that we do with language right now? Um, yes or no or no way. <laughs> so. Obviously, there is no right or wrong answer here. It's purely subjective. I don't know that anybody can really uh, have a hard yes or a hard no, but interested in having your opinion and to know if you're, um, if Neuralink should target you as a future consumer of their devices for, for telepathic communication. And once again, while the polls and the answers are coming in, I want to thank uh, very much. Uh, we had an amazing discussion. You guys made my life really, really easy of just uh, answering and going on all the questions and providing a lot of insights. So I'm very, very grateful for this, uh, this opportunity. Um, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to have another one uh, on, in, in the future, including other uh, Facebook, Open Water. There are so many more companies that are uh, making the headlines and others that should be making the headlines as well that are not necessarily making headlines. Um, so it would be interesting to talk about these as well. So the poll 55, 45. So it's a bit more in the middle than the, than the last one. So definitely interesting. Um, we'll see when we ask that question again in three years from now, if uh, we start seeing a trend in one way or another. Um, but for today, that's it for me. What I would recommend people to do next in the, um, the, the conference is the, exhi the exhibitions. So if you haven't seen the, the virtual island just yet, I definitely encourage you to go visit it. Uh, there are booths, there are exhibitions with different companies, there are posters. Um, so please go walk by on the island. It's, it's awesome. It's the new 
conferencing COVID style where uh, we go and we have virtual interaction with uh, with conference. We uh, the, the organizers did an amazing job in creating this island with different booths. Um, so please go navigate and track with people. You can have one on one whereby chats a little bit like like Zoom right now, but on a whereby platform. So you can just enter the call. We'll have the, 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 the person from the booth attending as you would do uh, walking by a booth at a, at a usual conference. So I'll end over back to uh, to the organizer, unless anyone from the panel has a last word, remark, things to mention on my side. Um, I'm that's that's a wrap for me. I just wanted to say thank you, and I look forward to an in-person um, drink at the Neuro Bar next time. Yes, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun, John. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll end over to uh, Alexei and a uh, quick reminder of the neural bar in about two hours from now, there will be a neural bar. So if you're interested in joining us, there will be more of the conversation of what we just discussed this morning in, uh, in about two hours from now at the neural bar. So I'll let the organizer take over from here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you, all panelists. And I'll uh, let we give Yannick a couple, couple minutes of rest and wait you in nine o'clock, uh, eight o'clock in Samara time. И сейчас мы с вами снова. And now we are going on our virtual tour of Samara Euro Week, and we are going to be visiting the exhibition, and then. We'll uh, give uh, posters a try. I'll be your guide tonight. We're going to launch a, uh, we're going to share the, our screen. And I will help you uh, walk around the exhibition. What about the discussion before? This was amazing, I, and we were promoting it, and we were right to promote it. Uh, I think next week when I get back, next week I'll have some time, uh, for free time, I'm going to, to uh, transcribe this uh, discussion and publish it um, in a written form and there will be a recording on YouTube and everyone will be able to watch. I was watching it as, as if it was a movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we log on to the website. You can enter bcisamara.com. Look, it's all working very smoothly. I hope you can all see the website on the screen. This is an entry point. You press on the yellow bar, enter the virtual expo. So here we are. Look at this. Looks wonderful. Posters. There is a health desk. Neurobar. It's also here. Neurobar. Presence. Started yet, but we can wander around the expo. But for the sake of time, let me just show you how you can reach the poster exhibition, how you can move from poster to poster. You can press on the hexagons, you can move between the posters. Oh, look at this! looks like Samara. Well, so let's just uh, go from company to company so we don't waste the time wandering around. So this is our first booth. Medical computer systems. What you can do here is uh, you can watch a video, you can send them an email but you can just click on the talk to us now so we can talk 
let's try to do that. Hello, Stanislav. We are the host of BCI Samara, so we came to your booth. Oh, it's wonderful that you dropped in. Well, you know, I presented at a workshop about three hours ago, so those people who watch the workshop they already know about so the company i work for i work for the medical computer systems the company is located in zelenograd we manufacture high-tech medical devices for medical research we manufacture devices for eg consumables for eg different types of sensors and systems we have uh, medical solutions for EEG, ECG, and so on and so forth. You can find all of the information in our virtual booth. You can watch our videos um, visiting the booth. So there is a link to our website, so you can watch even more videos on our website. And uh, if you have any questions, so there is an email address. Our website has a phone number, so I can talk to everybody who's interested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for telling us this. And we are going to continue walking around. And our next company is Vibrant. So we can look at their PowerPoint slides so we, that have the information about the company itself. So let's see if we can talk to somebody here. Oh, hi again. We visited you before, but we just couldn't resist visiting you one more time. Thank you very much. We're always happy to see you and all of the other Delegates here will be more than happy to talk to everyone. So we are here representing Vibrant. And this is a, a device that uses BCI. And we use BCA to acquire EEG data and to process it. We have uh, developed a technology for after stroke rehabilitation or rehabilitation after spinal trauma. Our data interface simulates neuroplasticity, speeds up rehabilitation. Unfortunately, our research has been most bold because of the pandemic, but we hope that so we'll continue it very soon because we see a pronounced effect. So we'll be very happy to see doctors here or anybody who's interested and we're open for any types of co cooperation. Thank you for visiting us, Alexei. All right, let's go on. I'm just visiting everybody. So, oh, so you have a system. Yes, I do have a system. I don't want anybody to be left out. So our next booth is Brain Products. So let's click on the Talk to Us button. So we're knocking. Anybody home? Oh. No, look, somebody is here. Hello. Uh, we are organizers of con conference, and please uh, have you uh, two minutes for talk about your company, and your products. Yes, of course. Welcome. So, just uh, no particular question. You're just interested. Uh, 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 talk about your company. What what you what are you doing? Yeah, so uh, Brain Products is a, uh, so we build uh, mainly EEG amplifiers uh, 
for the research market. So, um, yeah, different uh, amplifiers for uh, mm -hmm. um, different scenarios uh, from lab-based uh, uh, stationary setups uh, to mobile um, recording um, scenarios. Uh, yeah, and therefore we have a, a wide range of amplifiers with uh, many channels uh, and also for MR environment, for example. Um, all kinds of different electrodes, uh, ranging from active gel-based uh, to dry electrodes and sponge-based systems. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, wait, uh, visitors. Yeah, there are we not are, so many visitors. Uh, now we now we we're streaming in uh, YouTube channel of the conference and you are in uh, in stream now oh <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the warning <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very good thank you all right please visit uh, yes. i'm still here yes, for yes 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 an hour, so i'll be happy to get some visitors mm -hmm. thank you что ж идем идем дальше вас просили предупреждать, что okay. Let's uh, continue walking. Well, it is a good idea actually to warn people that so we are streaming them live. Okay, let's see. No, no. Вас где дома? Let's see who's here. Seems that nobody's here. Nobody's at home. We will try and visit them again. Let's go on. Who is the next? Uh, Cognitivica. So they go talk to us in Russian. Cognitivica. Inspiring technologies for the freedom of movement. Let's see if there is if somebody is here, well, maybe we can look at their PowerPoint slides. Let's do that. Okay, let's look at the slides. Inspiring technology for the freedom of movement and neuro. So we see all of the information about the company here on the screen. They work at neuroscience, neurodiagnostics. There are a lot of products that I've developed. I think this is EEG-based visualization and signal amplifiers. Well, yeah, but uh, yeah, there is an email icon there, so the company can be contacted. And, and the next company is a company that I know really well, Neurotrend. So, Neurotrend. Let's see. Alexander, are you here? Well, the camera is on. That's promising, but nobody's here. Maybe we then launch a video. Yeah, good idea. Neurotrend. I launch a video. I have to log out. Although it could have been a stimulating conversation with the armchair. But let's look at the video communication system. Свободу выбора, перемещения, свободу общения. Но жизнь в любую секунду может лишить нас этой свободы. Ну, тут на самом деле я могу сам рассказать, чем занимается компания. О чем это? Well, you know, I can answer. Tell you about what the company does. They've developed a neuro chat. So basically, BMI interface can be used to type up words with the power of thought. So neuro chat is 
something that was used to record a transcontinental chat between Russia and USA. So patients who actually cannot talk use the neuro chat to talk to each other. So they saw a display with the screen and they shifted their gaze, let's say, to A. Then uh, the letter A would activate and so they could chat to each other. Well, it does take uh, some time, but it's possible. Neuroelectrics. Я так понимаю, что это тоже компания, которая работает с EEG. That's also a company that more develops EEG technologies, so for clinical trials, for something else, dry electrodes, wet electrodes, gel-based electrodes, and so on. Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, we are organizers of the conference, and now you are in a, in a, into in a stream. We are streaming our dialogue, and if you have uh, two minutes, can you uh, talk us about your company? Okay, perfect. So welcome to your electrics booth, virtual booth. I'm happy. Uh, you managed to, to visit us. Uh, we are somewhere in the corner, so it's not easy to get. But, uh, actually, yeah, close to the posters. Uh, so we are happy to be in Samara, this time in the virtual way. Uh, so Neuroelectric is developing uh, devices uh, and doing research in the intersection of neuroscience and uh, medical engineering. So we are developing devices for BCI, for EEG, uh, recording, uh, basically wearable wireless devices uh, with uh, dry electrodes, solid gel electrodes, new type of, of sensors that you can use with 80, 20 and 32 channels. And we are also developing uh, uh, here following the, um, the lecture that we could hear today, uh, brain stimulation devices uh, with um, transcranial uh, electrical stimulation. We not only develop the devices, but we also provide the modeling uh, services. So actually, uh, we can provide devices with 8, 20, and 32 channels with high resolution uh, uh, brain stimulation and EEG recording. So you can mm -hmm. simultaneously stimulate the brain and record the EEG. Uh, we provide devices that are compatible with uh, fMRI, with MRI, with uh, NIRS, uh, SPECT, PET, so we can combine the stimulation with uh, another neuroimaging technique. Uh, and um, we provide uh, specialized software to, to uh, design, set up the protocol for the stimulation. And we have also the devices right now that can be used at home. So if we are in the virtual scenario during COVID pandemic, uh, we can provide devices that can record EEG and then can uh, provide the brain stimulation at home. So you can uh, control the stimulation. You can get the feedback from, from the subject, from the patient mm -hmm. through uh, the um, virtual connection uh, with all safety aspects that should be applied uh, with the stimulation at home. So happy to... Uh, see you in our book. It's 8A, I think. Uh -huh. So you can, uh, I will be happy and uh, I'm inviting everyone to visit yes. us. Uh, 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 do you provide a software for EEG? We provide a software for EEG, so it's actually included with our devices and uh, then not only record EEG, but can uh, online analyze EEG, so provide you uh, some, some information regarding power spectrum, regarding brain mapping. Uh, regarding uh, time frequency analysis. So this everything is included with our software. And the same for the stimulation. So you can plan and actually see uh, with the modeling uh, how will be the distribution of electric field based on the specific location of the electrodes. So when you stimulate the brain, you will know where the current will go and uh, how you, uh, how, 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 um, is it the exactitude of targeting uh, the specific regions of the brain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Замечательно. Вот наши зарубежные коллеги более дисциплинированы. Inspiring look.
Hub elect. Innovative medical system. Let's see what it is that they do. Therapy and diagnostic systems. Doctors, the patient, physician based diagnostics, using movements for diagnostics. Well, maybe there is somebody right there. Now, so let's ask them what is their coolest development? Hello. Well, we were like in the there is nobody we can talk to. Hey, hi. We can hear you, but we can't see you, unfortunately. Right, at least we can hear you. Although it's very quiet. Could you please tell us a little bit about what it is that your company does? We develop a diagnostic. We developed a diagnostic system and special software. Well, actually. There are several systems that we offer for clinical use or physical therapy for diagnostics. What it is that you're diagnosing? You said rehabilitation. What exact rehabilitation do you do? Well, we offer rehabilitation after neurological disorders, loss of locomotive functions or diminished locomotive functions where are you located well how things can be used in sports medicine and cognitive rehabilitation and you're from St. Petersburg if I'm right yes thank you very much bye bye company neuroassistive technology Neuroassistive technologies, mm, that rings a bell. Let's try and talk to them. Hello, is there anybody out there? Hi. It says that the others will arrive shortly. That is not happening, so let's maybe play a video. Yeah, why not? Let's play a video. Ну, примерно понятно, да? Вдох, он такой кончумерский инструмент ЭГ. Восьмиканальный храп немножко, то есть это немного для, для серьезных цели, но для каких-то вещей полезная штука. Mm -hmm. Прекрасно. Ну, давайте пойдем дальше. Дальше. Детек. Ага, это мы знаем, тут кто у нас тут. Right, we know these guys. Gtech. Anybody else? Christoph or Somebody else? Mm -hmm. Yes, here. Let's take a look at their video. Making their 
Angolin uh, 24 channel device. The average human brain contains about 86 billion nerve cells called neurons. Neurons communicate with each other by sending chemical and electrical signals. These neurons communicate in unique ways. Uncovering how the human brain sends signals to our body has been for long one of the biggest mysteries in science. Researchers from the Johannes Kepler University in Linz teamed up with me, Anouk Wiprecht, and neurotechnology company GTEC to create an eccentric international collaboration in where art, fashion, science and technology gets combined. Using the pangolin as inspiration, we were able to create ultra-small EEG sensors that look like pangolin scales. Using 1024 EEG sensors on the head, with 24 bits from 1024 locations, covering the full brain, and 64 actuators combined in one pangolin dress. We can now see the brain in a never-before-seen resolution. The pangolin system is fitted onto our model to extract commands through the use of EEG in order to control the actuators of the dress while unlocking hidden information from her brain. The dress in turn reacts to the input signals from the brain and visualizes this data through motion and light corresponding to each of the 1024 data points. This input-output situation and feedback loop gives us more information this was uh, a futuristic video which looks really nice was excellent uh, picture quality and resolution And there was this first dress. Would, would Christoph be able to put it on himself? No one answered. Let's move on to another booth. Okay. Let's get back a little bit. I think you skipped a couple of uh, booths. You went straight to the neuro bar. There's uh, almost an hour until we can go to the neuro bar. Uh, let's uh, go from one booth to another. Infomed. Let's see if there's anyone around. Knock, knock. Alexander. Okay, Alexander, you are around, and we are in Samara at a BCI conference, and you are online. Where are you located, actually, physically? I hope you can hear us too. Good evening. Where are you physically? Located, I'm in Moscow right now. Tell us a few words about your company, please. We supply equipment for neuroscience and for the clinicists. We have this um, magnet-based uh, simulator. We uh, supply it to such companies as QTech and others. We also I can hear you fine. We also are involved in navigation, robotized uh, simulations together with uh, navigation. This is what could be interesting to BCI Samara uh, participants. We're simply walking around our booths and try to 
show people where it makes sense to visit and talk to you. Thank you for uh, telling us about your company, and you might expect some visitors. Now we are moving on. Uh, here I am at the new bar again. Let's try to visit Impulse Neary, guys. Let's try talking to them. Here's uh, our, our attempt to you know, get to them. Company is 14D. They are a Skonkova resident. If uh, the guys are not the best. Uh, then you can visit them in Skolkova, our 16A. Neuromore is the name of the company. Let's try to uh, get in touch with them. Is anyone around? Anybody? Hello. Hello. How are you? Yes. We are, we are here to you, but not see you. Okay, uh, we are organizers of the conference and we are going in the exhibition uh, and going to your booth. Uh, please, you are in internet now, you are in stream in our YouTube channel. And uh, if you have uh, two minutes, please tell about your company and your products. Hello? Uh -huh. Is there any sound? Is there any sound? Is there any sound? Hello? Hello? I don't hear you. Hello, hello, hello. Может, на другой стенд сходим пока? Давай сходим на другой стенд. А, можно пока посмотреть их презентацию. Компания Neuromore bringing data to life. Это производство софта. Софта. Hey, I guess this company is uh, making software for interactive applications, biodata, machine intelligence. It looks like it's more of an entertainment project, creative uh, 
stuff that they do. Wearable sensing, 18D. Let's try to visit them. Anybody home? Anybody home? Hello? 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 We are hear you, but no see you. Oh, me on. Hi. Good evening. Oh. Hi. The idea of doing a conference from home. <laughs> we are from Samara. We are from organizers, and we are now in stream in our YouTube channel. And if you have two minutes, you uh, can. Um, Tell us and our visitors to, uh, about your company and your products. Can you? Sure, absolutely. Just a second, let me pull up uh, some slides. I'll be happy to tell you about what we do. Uh huh. Um, just one second. Uh -huh. So, uh, thank you for stopping by, first of all. Um, I'm going to share the screen so I can uh, describe to you what our technology does. That's okay? Yes. You can describe without slides. Uh, your presentation is on the virtual book. Great. Huh? So what we do, uh, our company develops uh, dry electrodes of for EEG, uh -huh. and this uh, is a very good interface for brain-computer interfaces because it's drawn while at the same time providing uh, very high-quality EEG signals. Uh -huh. So I'm not going to describe to your team what the EEG and FNIR are. I think most of your audience already knows about these modalities. But what's really nice about EEG and FNIR is that they complement each other very nicely. Uh -huh. uh, so we're able to do uh, high uh, high density, um, uh, um, uh, high spatial resolution uh, from the FNIR and high temporal resolution from the EEG. Um, of course, uh, EEG typically is challenging for PCI because you have to abrade the skin, you have to put some gel. So people don't like to use it day after day. Also, you have to be wired. So it's not a very uh, practical solution for development. So what our technology does is it, uh, we take we got rid of the gel, we got rid of the um, need for braiding the skin. We developed a dry sensor that can go through there that has very high signal quality. Uh, this is what our sensor looks like. So you can see uh, we have uh, uh, some springs, we have uh, an active sensor. Everything is inside a Faraday cage. That allows us to get really good signal quality. We put them into headsets that are very um, easy to put on and comfortable to move for a long time. This is what the uh, signal quality looks like. Um, uh -huh. And I'm just going to skip it. This is, uh, even if somebody is walking in red, you can see the strikes, but you can see the EEG is very nice and clean. So you can literally walk out with this headset and not have to worry about it. So that's that's what we offer. Uh, it's, a, it's a dry electrode EEG system. It works through hair. It has very uh, easy to put on, very uh, comfortable to wear, uh, very fast to set up, and you can use uh, outdoors in the real world. We have a number of these products. Um, we have some with the 24 channel. We have some with seven channel. Uh, we have some that are for sleep that are integrated with the virtual reality and we also have one that integrates FNIR with EEG so you can do both EEG and FNIR at the same time. And we of course uh, integrate all of this into a full uh, wearable sensor suite and do more than just 
AI, we can monitor the entire body, we can uh, monitor EGSR, temperature, ECG, respiration, EMG, and we also can monitor IMUs in acceleration to track the body's movement in 3D and all time. And all of this gets synchronized uh, through our software called Captive that uh, can synchronize all these data streams and provide uh, ready to go reports. But for the BCI community, really, what we offer is a dry electrode EEG system that is really easy to use, really high signal quality, and interfaces with a lot of the research tools that uh, develop the BCI applications. Thank you very much. It's very interesting and waiting visitors. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Neurotechnology LLC. Ну, тяжело сидеть вот так вот целый день и ждать, пока к тебе ну, придут. Вот, да? Смотри, зарубежные коллеги сидят все. И не целый день, а именно в заявленное время. С 18 до 20. Окей. Давай посмотрим хотя бы презентацию. So let's look at the slides. Neuro. Tracker for those who are caring for the loved ones. This company is a resident in Skolkovo. You're a tracker. No, it measures, in fact, not the nervous system, but всякие пульсы, КД, температуру кожи, а нейро здесь... Вот нейро система, such things as skin temperature, pulse rate, and it's just processed by a neural network. Oh, yeah. Those of you who are interested can visit the booth. Oh, look at what we have here. Some are a state university. Let's see if anyone's there. Hi, Samara, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Hi, hello. Oh, it, it's uh, great to see that Samara is here. There are some people here. Can you please tell us a bit about your company? You have visited the booth of Samara Medical University. Well, we are actually physically located in Samara Medical University. And what do you do in the Samara Medical University? Well, I am a host of the BCI Samara 2020 conference. So we are located in the main building, in the administration building. Is the director there as well? No. So you have visited our booth. Uh, what we are exhibiting here is uh, a machine for active rehabilitation. It can be used to treat cerebral palsy, cranial and brain trauma. ADHD, autism, and other things. So let me tell you what this uh, simulator does is it helps people to go through physical therapy. And the simulator is a computer, a VR, helmet, 
Could the optical tracker system, the optical tracker system, ensures that the exercises are done correctly? A large choice of games stimulates interest in rehabilitation. People have a full freedom of movement because the helmet is Wi-Fi. It's not connected to any external devices. Have you looked at our booth videos? No, we decided to go and talk to you first. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. If you watch our videos, so you you can see how the system works. Well, there are certain limitations when it comes to this simulator. It is meant for patients from 12 years of age because we are helmets come with an age restriction so what can it help our patients achieve well we increase the amplitude of movement uh, it can decrease it can help decrease spasticity and so on that's uh, about what we do briefly thank you very much that will be part of the conference videos and thank you very much for talking to us it was great seeing you here bye mm, let's watch a video That was wonderful. Let's keep walking through the virtual expo. Our next booth is also from Samara, 53A. So, Revy VR gloves. Let's talk to wall. Our fellow people from Samara. Hi. Hi, Pavel. Your mic is off. Good evening. Good evening. Well, you're from Samara Medical University. We are the hosts of the conference today. So you are being live streamed to our YouTube channel. So, if you have a minute or so, could you please tell us why you're here, what it is that you're exhibiting? Well, you visited the booth of uh, Samara Medical University and particularly the Institute of Innovative Development that is part of the university. We're exhibiting VR, uh, Revy VR gloves. So we've developed a glove that can be used with the virtual reality. We have developed special sensors for the gloves, and I cannot go into detail here because we are about to patent this development, but we developed special sensors to measure the flexion that happens during fine movements of the hands and so we believe that our measurements will be more precise than all of the existing 
technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And everything that you said will remain forever on YouTube. Let's go to the next booth. So here we have a passive rehabilitation simulator, also from Samara. Oh, is this the Somebody is here. Hi, hi, Elena. We're very happy to talk to you. Let me tell you straight away. We're also physically located at Samara Medical University. We're at the host of the BCI Summer 2020 conference. So we're visiting all of the booths. So we'll give everybody the opportunity to tell us a little bit about what it is that they do right now. We're live streaming you to our YouTube channel. So could you please tell us a little bit about what it is that you do? Just give me a second, let me plug in my headphones. I hope that the connection will improve. I represent the Reviver Simulator. This is the development of our innovative development institute. It is a proprietary development, a full cycle. So the simulator was created to, to re rehabilitate stroke patients. And we are using 3D reality. So we use this simulator for rehabilitation after stroke, spinal, or brain injury. And our simulator can be used 48 hours after the trauma, which is great. Because we all know that the sooner rehabilitation is started with these neurological conditions, the higher is the chance so that we can rehabilitate our patient. So there's, there's a mobile stand, a processor, a compressor, a video monitor, and a VR helmet. So we are using 3D virtual reality for rehabilitation. We do, we connect uh, we immerse the patient in VR, we give them a special sentence. And because there is a compressor there, a person thinks that they're walking, they see an image of themselves in virtual reality, they see their body, their feet. We have several programs, about six scenarios. So a person can walk through the city, through the stadium, take a walk around the lake, walk in the falling snow. So we managed to achieve synchronization of each step with the sense of pressure that a person feels because they're wearing pneumatic shoes. So a person gets a full sensation of walking. 
And uh, we also have uh, sounds in our VR, which is also great. So we have all tactile video and audio immersion. Also, we use different scenarios, but in each scenario, there is a companion. So a person can follow a companion, it can be a female, a male companion. So we uh, also benefit from the use of mirror neurons. Another thing that is great for this simulator is that it's portable, it takes up really just two square meters, so we can, it can be used even by people who are bedridden. Thank you very much. We've seen similar work when they used a vibration bracelet. Do you have uh, similar development plans? I don't know. I can't really hear you so well. What did you say? You said that a vibro vibrating bracelet is used for neurofeedback. Yeah, it vibrates depending on the type of uh, surface that the person is walking on in virtual reality, such so like grass or sidewalk. So. So the bracelet is worn on the wrist, yes, and it transmits vibration to the wrist, yes. Well, in our simulator, a person can change the speed of their movement. It can be fast, it can be slow. And of course, uh, the speed with which the air in the sandals inflates or deflates, it also changes. And of course, we also give auditory stimuli so people can hear whether they're walking on grass or whether they're walking on salt. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very nice meeting. Let's continue. Let's try maybe and revisit some booths. Oh, oh no, let's yeah, revisit some booths which we had visited before because we didn't get a chance uh, to talk to people there. Oh, look, there are two people here in Neurotrends. Fantastic. We can't hear you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Well, we are the organizers, so I'll be saying tomorrow 2020. We are going around virtual booths and we're asking the exhibitors to tell us about what it is that they're exhibiting. And uh, you're being live streamed on YouTube. You just give me a second. Give me a second so that, so that Michael can connect. <laughs> Михаил, we can't hear you. Я с удовольствием вам расскажу более подробно про по нейрочату. I can tell you more about the Neurochat, but not so much about neurotrend. Well, maybe, yeah, do tell us about the neurochat. Uh, 
The neurotrend, trend, and then you can come back to me to learn more about neurotrend. Just give me a moment. Один момент. Just give me a moment. По-моему, Михаил завис. Что-то зависло, да. Давайте, может, про нейрочат поговорим. Ну, давайте про нейрочат, да. Давайте поговорим. Let me tell you a little bit about the neurochat. So NeuroChat is a Russian company. We are located in Skolkovo. We develop hardware and software for NeuroChat. And the NeuroChat is used uh, to spell messages or to, to choose images by directing a gaze. And your chat is based on uh, BCI. Initially, we developed the NeuroChat for people who are severely limited in the range of motion, for, for people who cannot communicate with those around them, but when we, oh, sorry, NeuroChat is a device that a patient can wear on their head, and um, there is also software that is installed on the computer. So the device just records EEG data and the software analyzes the results of data acquisition. So the device records changes in EEG when a person reacts to a stimulus. For instance, when a certain letter is highlighted or when an image is highlighted, you'll know that the EEG changes can be analyzed by software and then the software determines what it is that the person wants to choose. Therefore, our patients can communicate with the computer without using words or movements. It also helps us to rehabilitate patients Because to work with NeuroChat, you need to be able to focus your attention and you have to have uh, voluntary uh, brain activities. And when a person works for NeuroChat, they sort of train all the higher cognitive functions. We have a commercial party where in the market right now and currently we are actively promoting such an area as cognitive rehabilitation and cognitive training. Because Training attention and attention concentration is something that's required by both healthy and uh, health individuals and those who have some uh, disorders. Now we are at the neuro trend chat, and if you go to the neuro chat booth, uh, there will be our presentation. Our booths are actually together. You can look left or right. We are there together. And there is a presentation about the neuro chat. And in that presentation, we offer 
cooperation to different businesses in terms of cognitive neural training since the life expectancy goes up and the intensity of our life and lifestyle changes, cognitive longevity becomes an important topic. And this neuro chat is a unique cognitive simulator because it helps us uh, record real parameters of EEG and biological uh, feedback. It's not just people trying to remember something. That's how many people are using? How people are using video chats? How many sets have you sold? Originally, we got this presidential grant, and for, with that, we produced around several hundred headsets. With around 300 users, private individuals, and and more than 80 legal entities who also got Eurochats, mostly rehabilitation centers, hospitals, elderly homes, or such uh, other similar social organizations for, for people with disabilities. Is has Nick Mikhail disappeared? Let me check the neuro chat uh, window if he's still there. Uh, Mikhail uh, seems to have uh, left the discussion. Thank you very much. Anyway. Two seconds, we will show you. Let me tell you a few words about NeuroChat. We ran some clinical trials. And in the presentation that you can see, there's brief data on changing the criteria of memory and attention with uh, our patients. And we definitely show that the NeuroChat uh, sessions impact positively such uh, features as uh, attention concentration you uh, improve your attention deficit efficiency of your activities and Mikhail is going to show us some of the boxes and we got this another option it's well it will soon be available commercially when you can use uh, hard gel electrodes in this uh, country. We're using regular gel and we'll be able to use hard gel uh, electrodes. Mikhail, show it has eight electrodes in the uh, occipital area of our head. And then you send the signal over to computer via Wi-Fi. This is the first such device that can be used not just in hospitals, but at home. And it is it requires no special technical or material uh, conditions. This is our hard gel option, which is also available. What else? What else can you say about Neurotrends? What I can say about Neurotrends? Neurotrend is a company that develops uh, 
neuromarketing solutions, neurophysiological research that require uh, neurophysiological measurements. We developed a set of equipment, it's a software hardware set called Neurobrometer, which allows us to record uh, EEG of the patient, uh, skin reflex and other things. And such comprehensive uh, measurement of all physiological parameters allows us to assess emotional well-being of uh, responders and whether they remember the material well or not and some of the other indicators. The is equipment is uh, made in Russia. It is also important to say uh, lots of people uh, run such neurophysiological studies but mostly such laboratories use uh, equipment of different manufacturers and there are problems with compatibility of such uh, equipment uh, and uh, matching them. But we went the hard way and now we have a, an impressive result. So all our equipment is well synchronized time-wise and this allows us to get better accuracy when we assess the parameters and criteria that we need in neuromarketing research. Thank you very much indeed. We need to go to our poster session. Thank you for telling us all this and thank you for being in touch. Thank you for visiting. Сейчас попробуем найти павильон 14D, в который мы не попали. Сейчас мы его найдем. Ирабар еще рано. Да, еще полчаса. Давайте наверное, еще раз сходим. Let me try 14D once again and see if there's anyone around. Hello. Здравствуйте, здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. Наконец-то мы до вас достучались. Да. да. Мы организаторы конференции, ведущие конференции. Сейчас мы обходим дозором выставку и э, стримимся в YouTube и даем возможность э, представителям компании рассказать о своей компании. Если у вас есть две минутки, пожалуйста, расскажите о том, что вы здесь представляете, что вы показываете. Отлично. Меня нормально слышно? Отлично. Отлично. Так, хорошо. Меня зовут Алексей Хализов. Я работаю продукт менеджером в компании Impulse Nery. Последние два года мы занимаемся созданием продуктов на базе нейроинтерфейсов. И у нас четыре основных направления работы. Основной фокус сейчас у нас на образовательной тематике. И мы делаем образовательные VR-игры с нейроуправлением, mm -hmm. которые поставляем в школы. Соответственно, ученики используют это оборудование, чтобы повторять и закреплять пройденный материал. Это помогает им увлекаться в учебный процесс. Учителям это помогает привести всех детей к одному знаменателю, и попутно еще дети развивают свои когнитивные функции, так как собственно, взаимодействие с виртуальной реальностью происходит с помощью нейроинтерфейса. Соответственно, второе направление – это развлекательное. Мы начинали, и мы сейчас продолжаем делать именно VR-игры с нейроуправлением для парков развлечений, VR-аттракционов. Но суть в том, что мы дополняем там, классические устройства ввода, такие там, как мышка, клавиатура или контроллер, да, и приносим какую-то новизну. Третье направление – это промышленность и, например, интеграция нейроинтерфейсов в решение промышленных компаний – Например, одна из задач это э, э, в концепт-карах управление мультимедийным экраном и переключение, например, музыкальных треков с помощью нейроинтерфейса. И четвертое направление, которое пока, мы, э, пока у нас, скажем так, в зачаточной стадии, это направление, связанное с медициной и здоровьем. И мы э, сейчас ведем исследования на тему использования наших разработок, наших технологий. 
uh, research in terms of how we diagnose Alzheimer and rehabilitation of our patients. Thank you very much indeed, and have a nice day. Bye. There's one more both. Uh, they want us to talk to them. Let's try to visit them. Knock, knock. There's no connection. All right. The postman always knocks twice, and now we have about half an hour for posters. Maybe there will be someone there. Let's start with the very beginning. This is the very first one. These are the guys from Alexander Kaplan's team in the Moscow State University. They're using and two P3 complexes and 200 P300 elements to efficiently use them in PCI applications and the study relationships between these components visual ERPs using nine volunteers who played uh, two music uh, uh, pieces. Uh, they show that both N2 and P3 are part of the uh, associations with visual attention, inhibition execution of motion. This is the expected result. It's a small piece of the puzzle. In a big number of data that we need to get. And then we have actually people who are present at their stands. Let's try talking to them. Hello. Is anyone around? So let's move on. We are the hosts of this conference. We have finally reached to the poster area. And now on YouTube, we're streaming these conversations with our authors. What is it that you do and what have you achieved? Our first poster is on how we can study consciousness using BCI systems. So how can we do that? <laughs> it seems like we can. There are several different theories of consciousness. I only consider those that are connected with neurobiology and neuron activation. It's based on the fact that there are some processes connected with neuronal activities. I took five most important ones. Information integration theory, that's one of them. Uh, global folk space theory, coherent theory, and so on. 
and each according to each one of them, it turns out that PCI systems could be used because using them, we can measure neuron activity using EEG or other implants, or auditory and visual ones. We can see the uh, amplitude differential. That's one topic of my poster. And then another is even more fundamental one than consciousness. It's my second. I have two posters so that you don't uh, visit the other. the other one. It's about our perception of time when we listen to auditory signals. And we had a number of uh, hypotheses. We had 10 seconds gaps and the subject would listen to signal one, 10 seconds, and then the next one, and would compare which one was longer. And it turned out that the factor that impacts the situation was the factor of whether the melody was known or not. And we found out as the result of our study that the second tune seems longer to us. Uh, and the moment of assessment was right before the second melody and the second tune. And for well-known tunes, there were there was no such effect. Our factor of knowing about the tune somehow impacts our perception of time, and perhaps these uh, results can be used in other studies because it's connected with memory, and memory is our important cognitive resource, uh, including for the BCI systems. Thank you very much. I will write you to you about the second one because it was particularly interesting for me and. Uh, Great, now we have uh, to visit something else. Let's go and visit the High School of Economics. Doesn't seem like anybody's here. <laughs> oh, well, let's wait. It. Another poster by the High School of Academics. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can talk to someone. Hi. Is there anybody out there? Nobody's here. Well, that's that's a pity. Let's go on. Samara. Oh, no. Maria, we're going to try and so get to also the high school of economics and also nobody's here. I don't know, but maybe. But they have a meeting and they can't be posted. Oh, look. Hi. Dorgan is here. You're the only one from the High School of Economics. I know what happened to all your friends and colleagues. You are being live streamed right now. Can you please tell us about your area of research? Sure. It'll be a pleasure. I was developing a PCI, and my mentor and I decided 
So develop a PCI to solve the reverse task. What it means is that we are moving from EEG sources to cortical activity using different modalities. And once uh, we transfer to cortical activity modality, maybe we will have a higher accuracy of decoding. We'll be able to see what it is that we're decoding, right arm, left hand, right leg. And it turned out that our method was more effective. This modality allows us to achieve higher accuracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was nice talking to you. Samara. Samara. Hey, Samara. Well, I think somebody should be here in Samara. Natalia. Natalia. Nope. here. Let's uh, go somewhere else. The Baltic Federal University, Kaliningrad. Do you hear us? Oh, oh, oh. The phone. Do you hear us? Okay, nobody's here. Let's look what it is that they are presenting here. Red cam based age visualization of schizophrenia classification with CNN. So they're using convoluted neural networks. Now decoding smells. With EEG. Anybody here? Hello? Nobody's here. Oh, well. What to do? Samara again. Hey, Samara. Senia, you here? Hello? Hello, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Very exciting. We cannot see you, but we do hear you. Senior, we are the hosts of the BCI Samara conference. We are looking around, looking at different posters. Could you please tell us about your area of research? I'll talk to you in Russian if you don't mind. But we are live streaming you on YouTube. All right, thank you. Well, I'm working on controlling neuroplasticity using BCI, immersive VR, and we are trying to apply this technology to re rehabilitate stroke patients. Well, I'm looking at BCI and immersive VR efficiency as a possible modality to restore upper limb motion in patients who suffered an ischemic stroke. We had 16 patients with acute ischemic stroke. The age of our patients was from 64 to 74 years of age. We split the patients into four groups. One group of patients had virtual reality simulation, 10 sessions, 40 minutes per each session. In our research, BCI, was used as a way to desynchronize the motor centers responsible for the motion of the left hand 
we use uh, TMS and we use this signal to do the initial setup of the computer system using the idiom motor motion paradigm or motor imagery. And then we show the movement of a paralyzed limb on computer screen or in VR goggles, but only if uh, the signal was received from contralateral hemisphere. And as you know, the contralateral hemisphere contributes up to 80% uh, to the pyramidal pathway. What is novel about our research is that we use a personalized approach to restore a diminished function of the upper limb, and we use motor imagery simulation paradigm, but not with global EEG, but rather it's registration. Well, another thing that I can tell you about the results of our research is that at the end of the rehabilitation period, we assessed the patient's uh, success using different indices. So did you manage to do it or not? Yes, so we did. The mobility index showed an improving patient mobility in the primary group of patients. So this methodology can be used as an objective method to control neuroplasticity and to increase after stroke rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. We have five minutes left. We only have a few posters left, so let's go here. Nobody's here, and nobody's in Nizhny Novgorod. What about impulse poster? Hi. Hi. We are here to ask you about your research posters. You know, all of my researchers have left, so it's only me here. Well, we were testing a hypothesis. How neural control influences cognitive functions in healthy adults. So we developed a VR game that was a sure game to test the hypothesis. And for these, we had three groups of uh, people. One was playing a VR game using PCI. One group was uh, playing using active VR. One was using passive VR. VR. So we administered collective tests to all of the groups. When we were trying to analyze the differences and the changes in all of the subjects, it was only a preliminary study because the sample size was rather small. We only had 15 subjects. And now we want to scale up this study. We want to have a bigger sample size to test different, different hypotheses. We would like to look at some more functions. Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, visit one more exhibitor.
Mm, guys, this is your last chance to get your minute in the spotlight. No, nobody is there. Unfortunately. No, fortunately, Alexis students are not there. Well, we have to go. We have to leave the poster session. And I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow we start at 10 a.m. And we have different workshops. So we have uh, the hackathon that starts at 10 a.m. We will watch the competition and we will have workshops. And tomorrow evening we will have open lectures and the Neurotech Cup final. And at 8 p.m. we have the award ceremony. Now I would like to invite everybody to join our Neurobar, which will open in five minutes. We just posted the link to the Neurobar in the Zoom chat. So you can click on the link to go to the Neurobar. I think it'll be very interesting. I think it'll be a fun experience for everybody. So, so go on. Talk to everybody, have a drink. I don't know if Yannick will be there. Yannick will be there. If he's going to join the Eurobar. Well, we don't really know. But people will be there at the Eurobar. So Yannick was one of the organizers. And like he said, Last time, BYO, whatever you like, your point, lots of coffee. But I would like to thank everybody for a very fun day. We had interesting discussions today. We had wonderful workshops. We're going to have wonderful workshops tomorrow as well. We are somewhere in the middle of the week. So today was day three out of five. And I do think that even when the week is over, you know, like, it will probably not finish by the end of the week. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that people will continue to talk to each other. They will continue to watch all of the conference videos. They will continue writing articles and preparing research. Alexei promised us to write an article about each one of the events. Today we had a fantastic panel discussion. So we are going to see you guys tomorrow. And welcome to the Nurabari. You can use a Zoom link. You can go to our virtual expo to join the Nurabari. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.